hi everyone hope you're all doing good hi lumen um it's i'm standing apparently again i don't know why i started standing but i mean it's good for me right i guess hope you're well yeah i, I am i hope you're well too i'm should be a little bit higher i think There we go. A little bit higher. <laughs> uh, but yeah, we're playing more Ace Attorney today. Uh, which, oh, which I'm not capturing currently. <laughs> there we are. Getting the hang of it of the standing desk. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, every now and then I, I like standing up. I don't do it too often yet, but getting into the swing of things is nice. You know, being able to move around a bit. Um, it's just nice. I actually went uh, to the pharmacy uh, earlier, um, which meant I had to bike there as well. So getting some exercise in, you know, it's always good. Something wild to tell me. Okay, what is it? Okay, so I think we had new location has been added. Prosecutor's office. Oh right, we went to we want to talk to Van Zeeks, right? Um, about him being attacked, I believe. Mario Kart nearly showed up in your games library yesterday. Nearly, as in. And it pretended to arrive and then didn't or <laughs> Robin, hello. Thank you so much for the raid. How is everyone doing? You could feel its presence, okay. Let me give you a little shout out there. How was Risk of Rain? And congrats Spoon on being first. Welcome, welcome. I hope uh, it all went well and that everyone is well as well. I am standing as you can maybe tell. I don't know. I don't know if you can tell. Probably. My chair is over there. Um, here. <laughs> Apparently I can't point that stuff without actually looking at it. At least not easily. That's good, but it's also too damn cold. True. I actually went to um, to the pharmacy. I was saying that earlier. It's really cold. <laughs> cold. I have to put on my gloves and everything. Um, and even then, it was still like coat on and everything. My my face was freezing at the end uh, when I go back home. But at least I did it. You know, it's done. I don't have to worry about it. Um, but yeah, we're trying to figure out a case. Okay. It's, um, apparently someone has died, let me see, at the Great Exhibition in London. Um, so this guy was testing some kind of matter transportation device and it blew up. Which generally is not something you want, I don't think. Um, so the person testing it is, well, dead. Um, and we're gonna have to figure out if it was an accident or straight up murder. Plus there's some other stuff going on as well, but, you know. I am just curious the fact about the fact that they have some kind of med transportation device because that's crazy. Considering this is supposed to be the 1800s. <laughs> I don't think they had med transportation in the 1800s, nor do they now. So that's even more impressive. Mm. So this is the legendary reaper's office. Yes, it appears so. Ugh, sends a chill down my spine, doesn't it? What an amazingly deathly atmosphere. 
Oh, is that... What? Is that Van Zeeks? That hooded figure was so still I hadn't noticed his or her presence. I wonder who it is. What are you doing here? Ah. Oh no, wait, it's not Van Zeeks. That's Van Zeeks. Then who is the hooded figure? He's as unwelcoming, unwelcoming as I thought he'd be. Actually, maybe even more so. Oh, I um, uh, I'm glad to see you're well. I am. So, who's the person over by the wall doing being punished for something or other? No punishment is taking place here. Oh. That's my apprentice, and he's sitting there of his own free will. I mean, I did- I wouldn't have assumed it was a punishment, like... What, what kind of punishment is sitting there? At, the, like, a table? With, like, a candle? Why did Naruhodo go for punishment, first of all? Timeout corner, I guess, but it's not even a corner lumen. And it, it can't be like a naughty chair as well, because there's no chair. Even worse? What, what could be even worse than the timeout corner? The... Timeout table? <laughs> timeout floor sitting, oh no. I mean, technically, they're not sitting on the floor, they're sitting on a cushion. Technically. It's bad for your legs. Um, I think doing it every now and then can be good. Because the blood circulation, yeah, yeah, it does. But as long as you don't do it too long, right? And they get up, their legs are numb. Well, I mean, that's fine right they chose to do this i didn't know you had an apprentice must be the same person who was pictured in the newspaper or the mask guy or girl it's hard to tell He's, oh no, okay, guy. He's very able in combat. A requisite skill for anyone under my tutelage. Are you referring to the attack on the Reaper that was reported in the papers? The Reaper? I'd be interested to know the Reaper's true identity myself. Assuming, that is, such a fabled fiend generally inhabits our great courtrooms. Okay. But I thought you were the Reaper, Fanzeeks. Because everyone tells you that. What uh, tells... Calls you that. What, what, why did I say tells? I guess they tell him he's the Reaper as well, but... Um, oh, nice. Oh, look. It's a scale model of the Great Exhibition Showground. Why does he have that? It's amazing. I wonder why it's here. Perhaps he made it to take his mind off the sadness of being too busy to attend in person. What? <laughs> if you're too busy to attend a place in person, how would you have time to build this? Or perhaps he's too embarrassed to queue up for a ticket. Surely it's obvious that I'm using it as an, as an investigative aid. Ah. Nipponese have no business painting others as overly reserved. Uh, I really didn't think he'd overhear that. Well, I mean, you were kind of loud about it. Is that him? The portrait really dominates the room, doesn't it? Oh my god. 
It's a very majestic outfit and pose, but sadly, whoever painted it didn't do a very good job of capturing Lord Van Zeek's facial features. Or maybe it's his ancestor. Yes, you're right. I mean, it's not far off, but the artist has exaggerated his subject's handsomeness, I think. Ah, that reminds me. I heard Emperor Napoleon of France ordered artists to make him look more attractive when they painted him. How vain. That's really not an attractive quality in a person, is it? That portrait does not depict me. Surely that's immediately obvious. Uh, oh, then who is it? No. Well, I guess we're not getting told who it is. No? It looks like a punishment to me. Why does it look like a punishment to you, Ryosuke? I've never seen someone sitting like that before. He hasn't moved a muscle since we arrived. You think perhaps he's dead? I think he's meditating. Or something. If he was dead, Runo, he wouldn't be sitting up, would he? Well, anyway, dead or alive, he's not overly approachable, is he? I don't think he's going to talk to us. He's not dead. Well, that's not what he said, though. Can I look at the swords? No. Oh my god, why? I'm actually impressed that he still has so many chalices, considering how many he's thrown in court. Look at that fine collection of hallowed chalices and bottles neatly lined up here. My hallowed bottles are filled with the essence of the finest grapes from the finest vineyards I visit. Okay, I mean that's very cool, but if they're really that good, why would you eat them constantly and break them and waste the wine? Van Zeeks. And I personally oversee these chalices being made by the finest crystal craftsmen in the world. And yet you throw them around in court like they were worthless. Exactly, Iris. Yes, because the Im this imbecile is so unimaginably and repeatedly wide of the mark sometimes. Oh. Before you open your mouth next time, you should consider the poor artisans whose work you defile. Well, that's not our fault. <laughs> like, if your reaction is so dramatic, it's not our fault. Oh, it's my fault? Silly me. How could I ever have thought otherwise? Oh, indeed. Oh, chessboard? Oh. The desk instead. I, I thought the desk chessboard was more interesting, but sure, desk. Lord Van Zeeks' desk. Look, it's so stylish. And that's a marble chess set behind it. Okay, not beside it, rather. There we go. Chess? That's the western version of our Japanese shogi game, isn't it? You know, I'm actually quite good at shogi problems. Oh, really? You'd probably like chess problems in that case. I'd love to challenge Lord Van Zeeks sometimes. To a bout of shogi problems. If you only really want to challenge yourself, you can always do that on your own at home. Her hair reminds you of Roll from Mega Man Battle Network. I can see that. I can see that. Is it the color mainly? Okay. Let's talk about his attack then. Lord Strongheart said that the assault last night was some sort of revenge attack. True. Carried out by a henchman of Odi Asman's critical criminal organization. The investigation meant their arrests were imminent. Presumably some hope to kill me before that happened. Odi Asman. He's always masqueraded as one of London's most powerful financiers, a global investor. But his enormous wealth came to him by underhand means, via his criminal activities. And he used that money to buy himself a verdict of not guilty when he found himself in court, didn't he? Being prosecuted by you, Mr. Reaper. But the man got his comeuppance in the end. Yesterday, in fact, in extraordinary circumstances, it was a most unusual cause of death. 
I know about that. It was super high voltage instantaneous kinesis gone wrong. Mr. Asman died when the demonstration on the public experimentation stage ended up in an enormous, enormous explosion. Correct. And you think I have some kind of divine ability to cause an accident like that to happen, do you? Well, no. That does seem li a little far-fetched. If this man really is the fabled reaper, then he has to be innocent of this particular death, at least. It's strange how this worked out, isn't it, Runo? I mean, what with you taking on the professor's defense for the trial tomorrow? What? You're going to be defending him? Oh, yes, that's right. Though I barely know the man's name yet, to be honest. Albert. Albert Hairbrain. That's right. Do you know him by any chance? Of course. He's a contemporary of mine. We were at university together. You're... What? Contemporary? I'd understood that Professor Hairbrain was from Germany, though. Uh, brains from a respectable British family. After graduating from the University of London, he moved to Germany to carry out research, that's all. So you were students together. I was in the Faculty of Law, of course, and he in Science. Our paths rarely crossed. But curiously, we got along, though I've not met him since my university days. I certainly didn't expect our next encounter to take this form. And with you, of all people, representing him. Uh, only if I make it out of this office alive. I've actually been charged with murder, it seems. Yes, I know. Because the prosecution will be handled by me. By you? But, but you made it sound as if you and the professor had been friends. We are friends, it's true. Then why would you do this? If the Reaper is the prosecutor, there's nothing anyone can do to save him. He's doomed. That's just not true, because we've already had two cases where that wasn't true. Three, in fact, I think. What's Lord Van Sieg's thinking? What do you mean by what you said before? If you'd like to know the Reaper's true identity, does that mean... I'm the crown prosecutor and a mortal like any other. I'm no demigod. But they've all died, haven't they? The people you've prosecuted, I mean. Whether or not the trial ended in a conviction or an acquittal... Those I prosecute are the vilest wretches of our society. People who, without question, deserve to be found guilty. The world is a better place without them. But... That's not true of Mr. Natsume, for example. He wasn't a vile wretch at all. Nor is he dead, so... Nor was Ginny. In fact, she's ever so hardworking now. Also, Ginny is not dead. I can't deny that since I encountered you, things have taken a turn. But the point is, is this. If any of those vile wretches that escaped justice subsequently died in mysterious circumstances, it was at the hand of their own kind. It's not my work. But Strongheart said the same. He believes you're not involved in any way. But you were attacked by those ruffians because they believe it's true. Well, the fact is, since people started to call me the Reaper of the Bailey, the number of serious crimes in the capital has dropped substantially. Oh. It would appear that even the most hardened criminals can be made fearful for their lives. Do you mean to say... I mean to say that if my pseudonym serves a useful purpose, I adopt it gladly and with honor. But it's putting you in danger. You could be killed. If that is my fate, let God decide. Lord Van Seeks. Well, I mean, fair. 
Where to now? <laughs> you go to prison? I guess we go to the professor, right? To the defendant. Look at him sitting in the corner reading a tiny book. The smallest book. That posture can't be good for you. The warden said cell 11. That's this one. Oh, there's someone curled up in a ball in the back corner. Look. What's his name again? Professor Albert Harebrain, wasn't it? Um, excuse me? Professor Harebrain? No. There he is. Who are you? I'm Vinosuke Norihodo, your defense lawyer. A lawyer? Uh, was it something I said? A, a lawyer, you say? Would, they, would you be here uh, about the experiment? Uh, are you going to defend my hypothesis? Your hypothesis? Sorry, I don't... Yesterday's demonstration. And that demonstration was... Uh, that magnificent demonstration was... It was an out-and-out -out success, by anyone's calculations. But, but, but despite that, no one listens, no lawyer believes in the science. When it's explained, they all leave at high velocity. Uh, it was a success? It's probably not a good time to mention that your zeal made my concentration leave for a while too. What do you mean a success? Um, you mentioned the demonstration yesterday. The papers have called it a spectacular failure. After all, a man died in the explosion, didn't he? Oh. Yes, you could interpret the results that way if you really wanted to. Well, I, I suppose in the strict sense, the experiment should maintain the, the, well, I can't talk. The experiment was a failure, but at the same time, it was a great success. You've lost me. I saw it with my own eyes, right there in front of me. Mr. Asmund was spontaneously disassembled. Until then, everything was going exactly as my calculations had predicted. At that point, he should have been beamed to the Crystal Tower by instantaneous kinesis. However, the machine exploded and Mr. Asmund is in, in fact perished. Yes, I can't deny that part of the experiment was a failure. So what you're really saying is the large explosion that killed Mr. Asmund was an accident, correct? But the bigwigs had you arrested on suspicion of murder. I was responsible for a man's death. That is the immutable truth here. And for that, I wish to be punished. At once. But... but... Murder? Never in a million years. It, it was a simple accident. Simply an accident. I see. Rudy and I were talking this morning, you know. He said the situation would change completely depending on whether it was treated as an accident or murder. How exactly? Well, if it really was an accident, then the professor's machine would be kept in protective custody. On what grounds? Uh, yes, it's newly established here in Britain. The Special Dispensation for Scientific Equipment Act. That one passed me by. And if the case is treated as murder, then they'll, s they'll say my machine was the murder weapon. And they'll be able to pour over it as much as they like. If they examine it in detail, they'll find out how it's made and then they'll be able to copy my idea. My precious hypothesis will be stolen machine must be protected from that at all costs. That's why it's imperative this whole incident is shown to be to have been an accident in tomorrow's trial. I see now. Okay. I mean also because you don't want to go away for murder I believe. Okay. I imagine. So in short there was a terrible accident at the great exhibition showground yesterday. Yes. Rather, no, the devil's in the details. Strictly speaking, there was a terrible explosion. Sounds the same to me. 
You were demonstrating super high voltage instantaneous kinesis, weren't you? How fascinating. Humans, like all matter, are made up of particles that are held together by electrical bonds. So it must be possible, using a sufficiently high voltage, to break those bonds and beam the particles through space. That's, that's it, in a nutshell. That's my idea, you see? That's my amazing hypothesis. Well, okay, well, have you tested the type of machine on, like, an object at first, right? Because obviously, if you're going to be testing, like, instantaneous transportation, surely you would, your first thought wouldn't be human experimentation, right? The first thought would be, can I do it on, like, a teacup? <laughs> and then maybe try something bigger, then try something alive that isn't a human per se, maybe, like an animal of some kind, even though that would be kind of cruel as well. You know, that type, of, you wouldn't start human. <laughs> he starts by the end. Yeah, he's like, I want to transport humans, so I built this machine and I have someone test it, and then we'll see if it works or not. Oh, he exploded? Well, back to the drawing board. <laughs> okay, cool. That's an imaginably high, high level science. Oh, but dare to imagine it. Dare to dream of such incredible technology. Just think, one moment I could be here in this cell and the next I could be at the Great Exhibition again. Well, yes, that would be incredible. And the next, in the mere blink of an eye, I could be at the Great Par Parisian Theater, theater I say. Possibilities are endless. The whole of our vast planet would be within reach. There's a number hiding in wardrobes on rocky seas for 50 days. Yeah, that would be nice, wouldn't it? Hmm, I don't really see it like that. I don't really see it like that. What do you mean, Iris? Well, if you could travel anywhere in the world instantly, the planet wouldn't really seem vast anymore, would it? I think it would feel like it had shrunk. I would. That's, that's exactly right. What, what are you? What are the implications? What does it mean? Oops. That's got Professor Bunny Brain really worried by the look of it. Lately, this is yet another case of just because you can doesn't mean you should, I suppose. The point is, my calculations are flawless. The science works. But without a practical demonstration, it means nothing. And that's always the fly in the ointment. Because... Oh God. <laughs> because practical demonstrations cost a lot of money. Money that young scientists like you don't have. But that's exactly it, yes. Ernie's always complaining about it. He says the government should invest more in science. Well, anyway, I bumped into him at the right time. I met the well-known investor, Mr. Asman. The victim who died in yesterday's terrible accident, you mean. Okay. How did you met him? Meet him? Full name of the man who died in yesterday, yesterday's accident. <laughs> Why can I not talk today? In yesterday's accident was Mr. Odi Asman, wasn't it? What exactly was your relationship with the man? He first visited me in my laboratory in Germany a year ago now. He said he wanted to invest in my immaculate hypothesis. I thanked my lucky stars. I see. So you hadn't really known each other until then. Money for scientific research. I'm so envious. As far as I was concerned, the man was an angel. Oh, really? An archangel, even. He was prepared to fund a practical demonstration of my hypothesis for presentation at the Great Exhibition. And if that went well, I could expect additional financial support for my research from the British government. Mr. Asman provided me with money and an exceptional engineer. He produced a machine to run precise, ex precise specifications. But then your dreams were blown to dust in one enormous explosion. Wait, so he had someone else build the machine? 
to his specifications, but what if he built something else in there, right? Because we know that Asmund was a criminal. What if he faked his death in this? That the explosion was meant to trigger, but he was still transported. What if he's still alive? Would that be a thing? Would that be a thing? I don't know. Like if he's a criminal trying to escape the law, it's definitely possible. But otherwise I'm not sure. Maybe that's too far-fetched. I would never ever have thought of taking the man's life. Well, he seems genuine enough. I don't think he's lying. Okay, well... Um, I guess we have information now. Is that enough information? What to do? I'm so excited about the prospect of Naruhodo's anything consultancy opening for business again. That's not what it's called. It's called Naruhodo's legal consultancy. I've done a lot of studying in these past six months, reading law texts and judicial pre precedent precedents. I'm sure I'm a better lawyer now. I can't wait to start practicing again. Nothing's changed in here at all, though, has it? It's as though time had stood still here in here since Susie went back to Japan. I wanted to keep it ready for Mrs. Addo in case she was able to return to Britain at any point. So I've just left everything the way it was. Oh, I see. Right. And there was me thinking it's because of the way you are, Reno. You know, never bothering to tidy up, I mean. Iris? This isn't a time or the place to bring up my tidiness, or lack of it. It's kind of rude. Okay, I don't know what else. Oh, I guess I can... I can go here and present you with the newspaper. Number 26, about the article in this paper. Ah, yes, it seems there was a reporter nearby when that little skirmish took place. I had no idea I'd been photographed. It was careless of me. It looks as though it was taken after the people who attacked you had run away, though. Rest assured, the police have already apprehended every last one of them. But there's someone else fighting alongside you, it seems. And I think it's the same man who's sitting over there as we speak, isn't it? Why does he have bats just there? I didn't notice those before. He really is going for that vampire aesthetic, isn't he? As I mentioned already, he's my apprentice. Perhaps you could tell us a little more about him? He's in my tutelage to become a prosecutor. So you could say he's my apprentice, I suppose. Okay. Ah, like you are to Hurley then, Runa. I don't remember taking, taking an apprenticeship with a great detective. He's currently compiling a report about last night's attack. It doesn't seem to be moving, though. <laughs> Looks like he's wearing some kind of mask. On Lord Strongheart's orders. Nobody knows the man's face, or indeed his identity. But why would you agree to take on such a clearly suspicious individual? Lord Strongheart's orders again. He's not one for meaningless follies. There will be a good reason for his actions. I hope you're right. Oh. Hello. Ah. The task is complete. Good. In that case, you can collate all the all the briefs. OK. 
Okay. No, nice to meet you. Well, at least it's back down. <laughs> well then. Good conversation, good talk. That was really strange though. I've never met a man before. I didn't even know he existed and yet... Somehow it didn't feel like our first encounter. Hmm. Sus. Don't bother trying to converse with him. He says nothing to anybody from outside this office. Old Strongheart has strictly forbidden it. Oh, I see. Why are you so interested in my apprentice anyway? N oh, no, I mean... I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. The way he stood there so casually, yet with that flawless posture. It, it couldn't be. What's he thinking? Ah, yes, there's something I've been meaning to ask you. Oh, what's that? That Nipponese man, is he faring well? Sorry? The one arrested twice in succession six months ago, with the stoop and the moustache. And the jitters? Ah, Mr. Natsume, you mean. I'm not sure he'd be very pleased to find out you identified him from that list, right now. He's fine, thank you. In fact, I received a letter from him by International Post only the other day. I see. Well, I think we can end our discussion there, don't you? There's little time left before tomorrow's trial. I advise you to spend it investigating the case. Yes, thank you for the advice and for the conversation. I can't believe he's asking after Sasaki-san, after a Nipponese. I'm not sure whether to feel happy about that or worried. No, I think he actually cares. He just doesn't really show it. I never imagined that Mr. Reaper would be friends with the mad scientist, did you? That's a turn up for the books. A mad scientist? Oh, you mean Professor Harebrain? It might be worth quizzing the professor about his relationship with Lord Transix, I think. Right, so I should have done that first before talking to the professor. I understand Lord Van Zeex is a friend of yours from your university days. Yes, that's right. He was studying law while I was studying science. What was he like back then? Hmm, uh, good question. Unassuming, gentlemanly, and all right, nice fella, really? Sorry, I think you misheard me. I'm talking about the cold-hearted, merciless prosecutor Baroque von Zeex. What was he like when he was at university? Talk about a leading question, Bruno. As I said, an unassuming and extremely pleasant gentleman. After all, he is the little darling of the Van Zeex family, with all its great aristocratic origins. I didn't realize he had such quite such noble blood. Little darling? It was a bit of a shock when I came back to Britain and learned what he'd become. The Reaper of the Baby, no less. Yes, that's right. I did hear, though, that there was a very big event in his life that completely changed him after graduation. Really? What sort of event? Ah, I'm, I'm sorry. But I don't know anymore. I wasn't in the country at the time. I was in Germany already. Oh, yes, of course. Have you heard all about the Reaper? I really don't have to, the heart to tell him that Lord Van Zeex will be the prosecutor in court tomorrow. So, Professor, just, let me just make absolutely sure I've understood you properly. The huge explosion that occurred yesterday, that was an accident, you're saying. You had no intent to harm the victim, who was in fact the sole investor in your work, is that correct? As correct as, as two squared is four, I swear it. Yes, it's true that the man perished in a machine of my invention. 
Though I know that I'm far from blameless in all this. But still, I would never use my discoveries, my inventions to take a person's life. Not in a centillion years. I'm a man of science, it's all I know. You have to believe me, please. Do you believe me? Do you believe in my hypothesis? Science is the pursuit of truth, you know. I've always believed that all my life. I'm afraid I don't know much about science or your theories, but I do believe you, and I will fight to prove your innocence with all my might. I'm a man of the law, that's all I know. You have to believe me, please. When I went to live in Germany after I graduated, I learned something very important. Nationality, class, lineage, none of that matters. As long as you try your hardest, you can achieve anything. Thank you for that, Professor. It's not entirely true, but sure. Mostly true. And thank you in advance for defending me tomorrow in court. All right, Bruno. It's time. Time to visit the Great Exhibition. Sorry. Well, that's where the incident happened, isn't it? Yeah, I suppose that's true. Time to investigate at last. Nice. Time to go. I think it's about time I sit down again as well. My feet are tired. <laughs> I did bike as well, so I think that affects things. There we are. Much better. Oh, the showgrounds are a little too big for my liking. We've been walking around in dense crowds for two hours now, and I've felt myself swooning three times. Swooning? There are a lot of people aren't there. I've almost been tr trodden on three times too. Be careful, won't you, Iris? Don't I go with my hand? We finally made it through the throngs, though, by the look of it. Here we are, underneath the public experimentation stage where the explosion happened yesterday. Oh, there's a giant hole in the crystal tower clock. Is that a clock? I don't know if it's a clock, but at least in the... Oh, the place. <laughs> What's that? I can hear voices from up, from up on the stage. It sounds like an argument. Oh. Oh my god, it's Gina. She's back. Right. I've had it with you this time. I'm warning you. I'll arrest you in a minute. Oh yeah? Go on, then Spectre. Give it a shot. You ain't got no evidence and you know it. Wait, I know those voices. Got a cheeky ma little mouth on you, young lady, but a knight in the cells will teach you some manners. Just try it, I dare ya. If you want a bag of chips rammed down your throat. Yoohoo! Ragsy! What are you doing up there? Ah! Ah, it's you. Here, you're here. Uh, your ladyship. How are you, your ladyship? Well, I do hope you're well, your ladyship. Does that make her three times a lady? I'm not well at all. I'm, it's far too busy everywhere. I wanted to ride in a balloon, but there was a three-hour queue. Unbelievable. I'll go have a word for you at once, your ladyship. You'll be flying as high as a kite in no time once I pull some strings for you. Tobias Gregson, an inspector at Scotland Yard. Until recently he was suspended from duty, but it would appear he's back in action now. He's actually quite well known, appearing as he does in the Adventures of Sherlock Holmes. 
And for that reason, he can't say a word wrong to the story's author, Iris. But there are limits, surely. Or there should be. Watch it, sunshine. Sorry? What gives, then? Don't tell me you're on this case. Uh, yes, I'm acting for the defense. So we're here to investigate. Hmm, dear me. That's the situation, is it? Is it really that troubling? A, a measly five bob? Is that all you got? You're a lawyer, Angel. You could stand to carry a bit more copper around in your pockets, Mr. Naruto. What? Hey, that's my last bit of spending money, that is. You can have it back, but I'll have to charge you for all the bother. Three bob. <laughs> oh my god. This is Gina Lestrade, a pickpocket or diver, born and bred in the east end of London. In the case that led to my own suspension six months ago, this is the young girl I was defending in court. What's your problem, eh, Odo? Diver, pickpocket, what's with all the name calling? You want a bag of chips rammed down your throat and all, do ya? I thought you were proud to be a diver, Gina. You were just arguing with Inspector Gregson about it, weren't you? I assumed you'd been up to your usual tricks here at the showground. Now you know way to talk to a lady, Otto. Almost a year, long time, people can change. I'm an apprentice now, learned to be a Scotland Yard detective. Don't so have to call me what everyone else does. It's Inspector Lestrade now. Nice. In Inspector? The badge is homemade, surely. The inspector part isn't entirely accurate, no one calls it that. For what it's worth anyway, investigating is off the card for all of us. What's that supposed to mean? Right, well, I'll be back up top. You hold the fort down here, alright? Right, sir. Oh my god, I love that. That Gina became a detective. This... This raises a lot of questions. It was eight months ago now that I first encountered Gina in connection with the case I was working on. At the time, she was living in the East End with a group of other orphans. Pokekick, hello, welcome. She helped all of them survive by pickpocketing, but then she got embroiled in a murder. I hope you're well. I had a lot of time to think in prison. I really I realized I couldn't go on like I was. The diving weren't working out. Oh, I'm so pleased to hear it, Ginny. Well done. So, you went from being a pickpocket to a detective? Doing fine, that's good. You got it. Good in it. Inspector Lestrade sounds like something out of, out of a book, eh? Talk about a sea change. And then there's Iris's old man to think about. Iris's father, you mean? Yeah, I promised her, didn't I? I said I'd get all the police forces around the world to pull out all stops looking for him. Just a small promise then. <laughs> Nothing serious. Jaeger, thank you for the hydrate. Welcome. I hope you're doing well too. Oh, Ginny, you're so sweet. So anyway, that's how, I, how come I had to go t at the test for Scotland Yard. Only trouble is, I don't read so well, do I? It's a small problem, nothing serious. I mean, yeah, you can learn to read, right? You can improve. And that's when Ernie approached Gregsy and asked for help. So the inspector said he'd take full responsibility for Ginny and made her a sort of apprentice. That was very magnanimous of Inspector Gregson, and brave. Well, you know Hurley. He enjoys finding ways to make people do what he wants. A great detective likes digging for dirt, in other words. So, the long and short of it is, if you've got questions about the case, you can ask Inspector Lestrade. Right then, Inspector. Actually, there's still a big mystery surrounding Gina, isn't there? 
Oh, what, Bruno, what? Well, six months ago, Gina was the defendant in a trial prosecuted by the Reaper. A trial in which she was found not guilty, and yet here she is still. Come on, you're not still on about that, are you? Are you? The Legend of the Reaper, or whatever it's called? Or you don't half worry, Otto. If I didn't half worry, there probably wouldn't be a whole lot of you left. It's like I told you before, in it. The Reaper's kind of like I'm up him upstairs, so he knows what I'm like on the inside. That I ain't really done nothing wrong. Nothing wrong might be stretching the point. What about Mr. Natsume in Japan? He's perfectly fine, isn't he? Well, that's true. Perhaps the Reaper is more discerning than I thought. Exactly. So I ain't worried. I'm totally fine. Yeah. As long as you're not some big shot criminal that got away with murder, apparently it's fine. Tell us about the incident. Cor was out of this world it was. The brainy looking a brainy bloke pulled a bunch of levers on this machine and suddenly it started billowing smoke. Then it just went pop. I ain't seen a better experiment here yet. Sorry? You mean you saw it, Ginny? With your own eyes? Yeah, of course. The boss is in charge here, Andy. Of keeping everything running smooth, I mean. The boss being Inspector Gregson, I suppose. It's going to take some getting used to. So all I have to say is that I'm on duty, and I can do whatever you, I want to. Get this, I was up in one of them flying balloons when it happened, watching it from above. No, you're so lucky, Ginny. Maybe I should join Scotland Yard too. Yeah, do it. You know how to put the boss in his place already, right, Iris? You'd have no trouble at all. Then it settles. Where do I start? No, no, you can't join Scotland Yard, Iris. We'll see. Anyway, what I don't understand is this. If this machine exploded so spectacularly, how can Professor Bunny Brain still be claiming that his experiment was a success? Oh, right. Well, it was a success, in a way. It was? What can it have been? Surely after the whole machine blew up, no one could call the experiment a success. It's like I said, it did sort of work. I mean, yeah, there was a load of smoke in that whopping great bang. But where do you think they found the victim's body, eh? In the crystal tower over there? Okay. Interesting. So it was a success. So they did, they did transport him, just maybe he shot a bit far <laughs> and then died. Um, what? In the tower? I mean, if he crashed through the tower like that, right? Because he was supposed to uh, land on top of this circle, basically. So maybe their aim was off. <laughs> you can see for yourself, can't you? Up there above the scaffold. Oh, where all the glass is broken, you mean? Yeah, the cage what the victim got in to start with. Really did get beamed through the air or whatever and landed all the way over there. So, you see, it did kind of work, didn't it? What? I, I don't believe it. I mean, I don't get the ins and outs of it, but anything's po possible, right? With science? You're okay with stuffing food in your face? No, nice. I hope food was good. Our peoples? I'm doing good. I, um... I did, uh... Well... I went to the pharmacy, which is nice. Because now I have... My medication again, and I don't have to worry about it too much. It was cold though. <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I'm doing good. I'm doing quite good. Oh, I tell you what, you can have this. It's the plan of the experiment that they drew up at the yard. 
are, are you sure? Yeah, go on. I had three bulb of you before, so fair is fair. Yeah, I didn't actually give that to you, did I? The sketch of the experiment has been entered into the court record. Okay, let me look at this then. Chips was numb. Ooh. You got your eye drops from the pharmacy, so on the way back. Looks like chips. Fair. Very nice. So they had this big laser thing, electric gun thing. So he was in the cage, as far as I'm aware, in this thing. And then was supposed to be disassembled and then beamed by this gun to the crystal tower. Like up here, basically. That was the idea. So that's the relative position, okay. I don't know how that's gonna help me, but I'm sure it will be useful at some point. Something Inspector Gregson said before seemed a little strange. For what it's worth, anyway. Investigate himself the cards for all of us. Yeah, naughty old Gregsy ran off after that without explaining himself. Alright, that. And the boss said no one's allowed to investigate that weird machine what blew up yesterday. Well, that's not fair. We're rep representing the defendants. In that case, could you at least tell us what you've learned from your investigations? Nah, you're not getting it. We ain't allowed to investigate neither. Why? What did the boss call him again? The forensic investigation team, I think? Anyway, apart from them lot, no one's allowed to lay a finger on the scene. Bit funny, in it? So even Scotland Yard's own detectives can't investigate. Yes, I've never heard something like that before. I thought I could have a gander on the quiet though, but the boss caught me at it. You probably heard him give me an earful about it before from down here, didn't ya? It's not bleeding fair. I think you were giving him as much of an earful back as I remember it. Yeah, well, sometimes I think it's all them chips would make him so stubborn. You say something to them, to him, Otto, Otto, go on, see if you can get through them. He's up on the platform above us, is he? Where the machine exploded, that is. Oh, where the machine that exploded is, is what he said. We can try, can't we, Bruno? Gregsy will listen to us. Maybe. Do ch chips also make you, like, violent? <laughs> or, like, loud? Jaeger. Wait, how do I... Can I just move... Here? How do we... This platform must have been set up for the experiment, I suppose. It's very high up. About 30 feet above the ground, apparently. That's what the policeman I just spoke to said. I don't really understand feet very well. We don't use them in Japan. Oh, yes, sorry. It's about 9 meters. But soon you'll have been in London and here, Runo. It's time to get you got used to our measurements. Yes, well, this thing is so tall, the spectators at the front would just have seen a wall and nothing else. Chips do not make you quiet as they are filling and numb. Fair. Fair. They are very filling. They probably thought they'd secured the best spot to watch from, only to be disappointed. There's a saying in Japan, the darkest spot is right under the lighthouse. I feel like it probably applies here. Those stairs obviously lead to the stage above. We should go up there and investigate the exact spot where the experiment was being conducted. Ah, there we go. It's still, considering there was a giant explosion, it still looks decent. 
I was expecting the, stru the structure to have collapsed or something, but now it looks pretty decent. So that's it, is it? The machine that blew up. Oh, it must have been a magnificent explosion. And I've seen my fair share. You've seen things like this before, you mean? Of course. Hurley's always doing experiments that end in a bang. In fact, in his own words, explosions are the very essence of chemistry. Ah, that might explain the smell of burning that frequently comes waft wafting up the stairs. One time he made something that exploded with such force it took the roof off the building. I wish you'd been there to see it, Runo. It's hard to get too excited about that, given that I now live in the roof. Well, anyway, that's enough about that. It's time to investigate. It's not chemistry if it doesn't explode. Fair. Fair. I'm pretty sure it still is. Um, depending on what you're doing. Chemistry doesn't necessarily have to explode. But, I mean, it does make it more fun, doesn't it? Now ah, look, Inspector Gregson is over there. He seems to be deep in thought about something, whilst eyeing up the machine carefully. Really? He just looks confused to me. If it doesn't explode, you're doing it wrong. Fair. It ripped itself apart magnificently, didn't it? Magnificently and mercilessly. So someone stands in the middle of the machine to be disassembled and then beamed through the air. Yes, beamed. Not blasted. That's the point. Yes, that part's crucial, really. Is something is something like that even possible though, Iris? Oh Reno, I'm just a child. How should I know? <laughs> you know what? Fair, you are ten years old. I concur. A child when it suits you, you mean? From what I can tell, I think if you were to pull this... Stop! Don't touch that! Don't touch that! <laughs> that was practically instantaneous kinesis the way you flew over just now, Gregsy. Please, your ladyship, I, I didn't mean to startle you, but I can't let you touch anything up here. So sorry, you can have some of my latest special blend to make up for it. Oh nice. Special blend. Ah, wonderful. This stuff really is wonderful. Oh, he's so, so happy about it. Probably geology or something lame. If it's not chemistry, well... Hmm, I don't know about that. It's just like old times, this is. We're representing Professor Herbrain in court tomorrow, Inspector. So we should be allowed to examine examine the scene. Ah, listen, sunshine, even I'm not allowed to touch anything over here. Is that blasted special dispensation for scientific ex equipment act to blame? It's driving me potty. Oh, yes, that special dispensation. The professor mentioned that too. More red tape's all we need. I don't know what the government thinks it's playing at sometimes. But we're allowed to just look, aren't we? Oh. Uh, surely that's alright, isn't it, Gregsy? Of course, your ladyship, anything you say, your ladyship, but please don't get your dainty hands dirty, will you? Don't worry. We wouldn't dream of touching anything, would we, Bruno? She really knows how to get what she wants. Nice. Yeah, we're not touching, just, just looking. No touch. Considering how badly damaged everything is, Professor Hairbrain was lucky to escape unscathed, I'd say. We should have a good look around the machine while we can, I think. Touch anything and I'll make, you, make sure I kill you before I get strung up myself, you hear? 
I, I won't touch a thing, I promise. So please spare, spare thought for your digestion. Anyway, do you really think this machine could actually disassemble people like the professor claims? He asks, looking totally incredulous. Give it a rest, sunshine. If we were allowed to examine all this bleeding scrap metal, maybe we could answer that question. But we can't, can we? Because of the annoying rules, you mean? Exactly. The annoying, obstructive flaming rules. Oh, look at the base of the machine there. Oh yes, there's a tool of some kind poking through the wire mesh. It's a screwdriver, I think. Oh, isn't it a lovely one? The handle is in the shape of the capital letter A. It is? Oh, yes, you're right. What's the matter with you? Don't touch anything, I said. Touch anything and I'll make sure I kill you before I get strung up myself, I said. Yes, yes, I understand. Sorry. I only touched it a teeny weeny bit. But Gregsy, I'm very curious about this screwdriver. Really very, very curious. Of course, your ladyship. You're so clever, your ladyship. Fancy spotting something like this. But I'm afraid I can't let you have it. But Runo found it first. I assure you, I'll investigate it thoroughly. Okay, he's gone off with it. Hmm, that was very mean. I'm afraid. Inspector Gregson is going to make a very clumsy and embarrassing mistake in next month's installment now. Poor Gregsy. <laughs> That's evil. Wait. Oh, we can go up? Oh. That amazing horn-shaped device is pointing towards the crystal tower. I suppose once people are dis disassembled by the machine, they're shot out of that thing to wherever, wherever they're going. I don't think it was supposed to shoot anything, Runo. It was set up to beam people to Crystal Tower where they'd be reconstructed in their original form. Well, I don't like the look of it. If it was as amazing as it looks, the accident wouldn't have happened in the first place, of course. I suppose that's true, yes. But nothing ever goes according to plan, does it? Um, okay, some balloons. So those are people carrying balloons, dangling silently in the skies over London. I always thought the day would come when humans would discover how to fly, but I never imagined it would involve them being suspended from colorful floating tamari handballs. I'm sure it must feel amazing being up there amongst the clouds. Let's take a ride together, Runo, please. If I'm being perfectly honest, I would like to try it. But without a cost iron guarantee that the thing won't plummet to the ground, I'm too scared. Oh well, in that case, I should tell you what Hurley said. It's physically impossible for a flying balloon to plummet to the ground, as long as it doesn't explode. Yes, call me crazy, but I think that exploding part might play on my mind a little... Yeah, maybe you shouldn't have said that part. Just said, say it's physically impossible to just plummet. Okay. Using high voltage electricity to somehow disassemble a man's body and then beam him across to the crystal tower. It's an extraordinary thing to attempt, especially in public. True. It was by far the most unusual of the experiments planned for the exhibition of mind. To be honest, I'm a bit surprised it was allowed. Carrying out something so dangerous so many, with so many spectators present, I mean. The government's doing everything it can to promote new science and technology at the moment. They're more worried about being ahead of the game than the odd spot of public safety infringements. If they can be the first to develop some new technology, it makes Britain more powerful in the future, you see. Yes, I suppose that's true, in a way. So the powers that be are placing a heavy emphasis on scientists' rights at the moment. What sort of rights? 
They're making it so that any theories the brains have remain their legal property, as it were. Right through developing it into a practical idea and even going into production. Which is the infuriating reason as coppers aren't allowed to touch this crime scene. Because the new High Fallutin Special Dispensation for Scientific Equipment Act forbids it. Ah, I see. The only people with permission to investigate here are for, from some brand new apartment, department at the yard. The Forensic Investigation Team it's called. We've been relegated to keeping guard. The Forensic Investigation Team? Any old fool can see that this heap of scrap metal was a sham to begin with. But just because it says a scientific equipment on the paperwork, we can't do a flaming thing, a flaming thing with it. Poor Gregsy. He's very head up, isn't he? Okay, so what about the special dispensation then? What's this new legal act that says, says we can't do anything? Special dispensation for scientific, scientific equipment act? I think I already mentioned that recently with a real twinkle in his eye as I remember. I'm sure he did, your ladyship. I'm sure he did. It passed especially for this great exhibition it was. All scientists have to do is present their ideas or inventions to some suits in the civil service. And if it gets rubber stamped, that's guarantee, a guarantee of rights to maintain the invention's confidentiality. What does that really mean? Think about it. Think of all the world-changing new inventions on display every day at this exhibition. Although a good half of them are a load of cobblers, if you ask me, would forward by shamish like yourself. Uh, thanks for that. Oh, I love how absurd some of the inventions here are. It's all so fun. It might be fun to you, but a member of the force has to be present at every single demonstration. Can you imagine me? Bang science, that's what I say. Oh, I don't think so. That sounds like my dream job. You'd soon think otherwise after spending a day guarding all these Shamish's bogus contraptions. But if they're all bogus, how can anyone hope to demonstrate them? There'd be no point. Yeah, well, there is a point, sadly. Sorry? Thanks to another of our gov government's bright ideas. If any theory or invention is deemed to show potential, the government hands out a research grant. The scientists get funding? Exactly. And that's what they're all after. All these shammers coming from far and wide to clog up Hyde Park. And who has to keep them all safe, eh? Who has to smile politely and welcome them? Us coppers, that's who. So you can see why I say it now, can't ya? Hang science, hang it. Oh, maybe I can see your point. I guess. But it's only for a bit, right? Like the exhibition doesn't last that long, right? Does it? Hmm. Apparently Professor Herbrain lives and works in Germany uh, and now conducting his research. That's right. Came back to Britain, especially for the Great Exhibition, as I understand it. Probably after one of the government's research grants. Hmm. Actually, we learned something else about the professor earlier today. About his time in further ed education. It turns out he was at university with someone we both know. Lord Van Zeeks. Well, what's that? That's news to me. But, but if Van Zeeks demands the prosecution, then as the accused the professor's fate is... Sealed? Because the Reaper will get him one way or another? Blind me. That man's beyond me. I don't know what goes on in this that head of his. Talking of Van Zeeks, this morning's paper ran the story of him being attacked. Read that. Oh yes, but Mr. Reaper is completely fine. Nothing to worry about. Yes, right. Glad to hear it. Still, the Reaper... Hmm. How long is that business going to keep up, I wonder? I wonder too. The victim of this case, the investor, Mr. Osman. He was another of the Reaper's victims, or so I heard. 
Lord Varric von Zeex is a top-class prosecutor, but even he can't always push the right verdict through. Sometimes justice can't win. Yes, I've heard about jurors being bribed and evidence being falsified. And that's how the notion of the Reaper of the Bailey came about, isn't it? Obviously, Scotland Yard suspected Van Zeeks initially. We all assumed he was taking matters into his own hands if he failed to seal the deal in court. Although the man himself denies that charge. Well, we've done a very thorough investigation and the conclusion we reached is that Lord Van Zeeks is in no way related to the deaths of those people outside the courtroom. There's no question in my mind. I'd stake my reputation on it, I won't. But if that's true, then how do you explain it? All those defendants couldn't just have coincidentally died if nobody killed them. I know that, but I can't explain it. It's a mystery after all, isn't it? That's the whole point of the Reaper. Professor Harbury mentioned something else. He said that at university, Lord Van Zeeks was a totally different person. Easygoing and kind? Do what? He said that it was after they both graduated that something happened to change the man. Do you have any idea what that is? Or was? No clue. Really? Look, I've got my hands full watching over this frustrating crime scene. Why don't you go and make a nuisance of yourself elsewhere, eh? Hmm, maybe it does know something. in this newspaper. We are two unwelcome blasts back to back. This one at the exhibition and the Reaper getting attacked. I know, terrible news to wake up to, wasn't it? I tried to pretend I hadn't read it and turned over for another 40 winks. Thanks to that, I was laid up and got roasted, roasted from the super. Some mornings are like that, aren't they? doesn't do anything. Well, let's go back down. Can we go back down? The buildings. I seem to remember something similar being exhibited in Japan one time. Oh, in your country, Bruno. I do wish I could go and see it. I'd present a particularly steely samurai with a present of one of Hurdy's stories I'd written especially and see if it, it, I couldn't get Hurley into a jam against some Baritsu Master Ninjas. Um, you might not find as many of those sorts of people around as you think. Oh, well that's dull. Oh, but I do know a prosecutor with a Chonmage top knot I could introduce you to. A Chonmage, really? You think I could have it, my picture taken with him, do you? Assuming he's recovered from the trim Kazuma gave him a year ago, yes. I mean, I know that that prosecutor doesn't have the top knot anymore. Uh, wait, how do we go back down? Ferris wheel? What's that gigantic thing over there? It looks like an enormous water wheel. Oh, that's a ferris wheel. There will be people riding inside those little cabins you can see. Why? Well, they rotate nice and slowly, so it's a wonderful way to see the surrounding scenery. Wait, it's turning? But it looks completely still. Yes, that's because it's turning so slowly. One complete revolution takes about half an hour. If you were mad enough to go in one, it would be more fun to whiz around fast, don't you think? I feel as though you might have just invented a new sort of ride there, we now. Yeah, I mean, the Ferris wheel is supposed to be kind of slow. Okay, so I don't... I think we have much else to do here. We 
can't actually investigate much. Let's talk to Gina again. Wait, what's this? Ah, it looks as though somebody dropped something behind the tree just here. Dropped or hit? What? Is that a crossbow? What is this? Some part of the machine that exploded? Maybe. It could have fallen from the platform above in the blast, perhaps. What's going on here? Oh, nothing. I think I'll hang on to this just in case. What's going on here? I... Oh, let's investigate. What is this? It's like a crank. Definitely looks like a crossbow. Oh, there's some sort of lever here. Ah, yeah, there you go. What the? What is this? It looks like a cross between a bow and a gun. I think it's probably used for the same thing too. It's a crossbow! This groove here must be where the arrows are loaded, I suppose. So I was right, it's a sort of bow with an automatic firing mechanism. This would be perfect for someone like me who catches his ear with the bowstring two times out of, the, out of three. In fact, if I had one of these, maybe I could have beaten Kazuma in Kyoto archery training. Maybe. Crack. Looks like you wind this around in order to draw the bowstring back and create tension. You must be able to fire arrows with a huge amount of force using this device then. In fact, I would imagine it's far more accurate and powerful than a Japanese longbow. Uh, I really had no idea what I was picking up when I spotted this at the exhibition grounds. Um, okay, nothing else. Nope. Okay. Let me present this crossbow to you. Tina, would you take a look at... Oh, where did it go? Yeah, looking for this, Soto? When did you do that? I wonder if you've got anything else to show me, eh? What do you reckon? Give that back first, please. Um... Present that. No, okay. But that's the conversation they have when I present something that... She doesn't want to talk about. I guess she doesn't want to talk about anything. Oh, wait. I can. T okay, I can talk about the armband. This armband, armband is proof, in Japan at least, that I'm a defense lawyer. And this badge is proof that I'm a detective? So you're all gonna have to start calling me Inspector Lestrade. In that case, you'll have to start calling me. well, anything but Otto. I could call you Defender Naruto if you like, but it don't really trip off the tongue. No, it doesn't have a great ring to it, does it? Um, what else am I missing here? That's where the cove ended up after his instant kinesis, or whatever you call it. Dead, of course. And yet, they're calling the experiment a success. What's this wooden scaffold there for? Coppers? Our lads set, set that up after the incident happened to get the body down, I think. But no, really. Didn't you help to erect the scaffold then? Nah, look at Judy's more my thing. Wandering around the exhibition and keeping a lookout for the fun stuff? Mind Gregson doesn't hear you saying that or he'll give you the boot. It's incredible though, isn't it? I mean, could the victim really have bridged that gap by some sort of invisible kinesis? I 
also this thing. Oh look, what's this? A ripped piece of cloth. Hmm, it's not like any fabric I've seen before. It's very thick and stiff. It looks extremely durable. It's canvas, I think, with some sort of rubber backing. And the edges appear to be a bit charred as well. Maybe that means it had something to do with the explosion. Let's make note of it while Ginny's might mid yawn. Okay, yeah. Okay. I think we've got everything. Runo, Runo, listen. What? What is it? I've been thinking. Ernie might know something, mightn't he? About what? About Mr. Reaper. About what happened to Lord Fanzix, you mean? Because it sounds like something very significant occurred after he graduated from university. Something that completely changed his life. Maybe, but I have no idea where to find Mr. Sholmes at the moment. He's in the middle of some big case, isn't he? And here, this is what you need. What's this? Some kind of entrance ticket? Madam to spells. Is this supposed to mean something to me? You don't know it? It's the most popular attraction in London at the moment. It's very close to Baker Street, actually. We could go there now if you like. No, no, we don't have time for visiting attractions today. We have a big trial tomorrow. But that's where Hurdy is. What? At, at this popular London attraction? Yes. How is it that you know where he is? Ernie told me, but he told me to keep it a secret from you, Runa. Madam to spells. I don't see how it could be related to the case we're investigating here, but then... Stranger things have happened, and when they happen, Mr. Sholmes is usually at the heart of them. Okay... Let me... Oh no, I didn't mean to present that, actually. <laughs> I meant to examine it. Looks like a layer of thick canvas with a thick rubber lining of sorts. I've never seen anything like it before. But applying Mr. Sholmes' methods, you might deduce it was part of a raincoat worn by someone who really, really didn't want to get wet. And the charring must have occurred when the person was struck by lightning. <laughs> Definitely. Lumen, what, what is the not like this for? What are you not like this thing? You cry? About... About what? Tired of blow drying your hair? Oh, right. I never blow dry because it seems like such a pain. I just let it dry. <laughs> Takes so long, yeah. I I just leave it wet and then well I try to dry it off as much as possible with the towel and then I just let it dry over time. Which I mean, it's the easiest, the laziest option. If you just let it dry, it stays wet for hours. I hate the feeling. That's fair. I don't think it takes that long, usually, for me. It depends. But, like, I had a shower this morning. My, my hair is perfectly dry. But then again, I did bike through the cold, which meant that it just, because of the wind and everything, it just dries very quickly. Huh. So this is like, um, the, the wax statue place, right? I'm assuming it's like a... a reference to that. I don't so. 
Madame Tussauds, I think it's called, right? Now you're hangy? Oh. I'm also hangy, to be honest. Even though I ate very recently as well. I do have crisps, so I'll probably have some of those later. What is this place? Look at all those terrifying scenes. Why are the people so still? Guillotines, ruthless murderers. I know what I'll be dreaming about tonight. They're all wax models, yeah, see? They're amazingly realistic, aren't they? What do you think, Reno? Shocked? Wax models? Ah! I read about the dead bodies and wax ones in the magazine about strange phenomena. Depending on how corpses are kept after death, parts of them can turn to wax, apparently. It's called a... 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 a Stop talking about creepy things like that, Reno. You're scaring me. Anyway, Oedipus here doesn't form readily, you know. It's only very specific. Huh. What now? I've, I've just remembered something else I read. Another ma magazine about strange phenomena. There was an old lady, maybe a witch, who used to pour molten wax over corpses and put them on display. None of the exhibits in here are real. They're all entirely man-made replicas. They can't be. Do you really expect me to believe that? Just look at them. Oh. There's no way anybody could make models of people that are that realistic. And there's all such gruesome scenes. Wait. What is it? Oh, no. I must be seeing things. Oh, there's a hand. Give him my hand. The big heavy curtain is in a very prominent position, isn't it? I have a nasty feeling there's going to be something truly terrifying behind it. Oh yes, that's the famous Dispel's special exhibit. It depicts one of England's most notorious killers. Do you want to pay the extra fee and have a look? Pay more money? To be even more terrified? Well, let me think about that for a moment. It was only a suggestion. Is this an arm? It looks like an arm, doesn't it? Maybe one of the waxwork models has fallen over? You don't think it could be the work of one of the mass murderers in here, do you? Bruno, stop staring, scaring me. Is it a wax arm or a real one? Come on, you're always pointing at fingers of your in yours in oh, court. Poke that arm now and see how it feels. Objection. Objection. Okay. Well, let me go there. It's it's the great detective, Mr. Herlock Sholmes. Mr. Sholmes has his own wax statue in here, really? Well, he is world famous after all. It's an uncanny resemblance, isn't it? Makes my skin crawl to look at it. I know. Well, but... But look, Runa, you can kick this hurdy and he doesn't move a muscle. No, he... Can't go around kicking the exhibit, Iris. <laughs> Wait. It it just moved, I'm sure. And not just a little bit either. Mm, really? Did it? And look closely. There are beads of sweat on the face of this waxwork model. It's not wax, it's just... Murdoch being weird once again. Shall we move on, Iris? Over there, look, there's a great murder scene to enjoy. Much more. <laughs> there we go. My dear fellows, I take exception to your recoiling in such a manner. As if you've seen something truly abhorrent. Mr. Sholmes, 
I knew it. Iris, what possessed you? I strictly forbade you from divulging my temporary waxwork, waxwork secret to Mr. Norihodo. Temporary waxwork? What do you mean? And that kick. Could you not have exercised a little more restraint? You winded, winded me. But Runa has something he needs to ask you. Uh, a question. And I thought you'd probably be getting bored too. So here we are. Hmm. Well, I can't deny that your timing was impeccable. A mere two minutes, a mere two minutes more being stationary like that, and my great brain, upon which all my success has been built, would have turned to wax. Thank goodness we arrived in time. Indeed, in many ways, the pair of you just saved the world from an unimaginable loss. Oh, Hernie, you do like to talk nonsense, don't you? I could know something, it's true, about Lord Van Zeeks and what happened in the past to change him. Now that you're here, let's take our time. How can I be of assistance? For your in luck, I'm suddenly quite taken with the idea of conversing. Oh, well, actually, I'm in quite a hurry. And if my eyes don't deceive me, I believe something is afoot within the walls of this very museum. A most fascinating case, if I'm not mistaken. Really? Moreover, I have a strong suspicion that it's related to the matter about which you've come to me now. But how could it be? Lay, hello. I hope you're well. We shall speak again presently, my dear fellow, but for now I must return to my work. What? Back to being a temporary waxwork exhibit? Okay. Ora, hello. I hope you're well too. What is this place? Madame de Spells came to London from France three years ago, I understand. Since she opened this little waxwork museum last year, it's enjoyed great popularity in London. There are museums like this in Japan too, but these displays are something else. I mean, they aren't made from actual real people, are they? The extreme realism of these waxwork, waxwork models is a particular secret of the Dispels family, they say. They earned renown during the French Revolution for wax waxworks of victims of the guillotine. Ugh, that sounds grim. You got two hours of sleep? Oh no. You got me here all day, not necessarily conscious. Well, that's okay. I hope you get some rest during the day. That seems awful. Oh, nice lay. Getting a new streak going, I see. <laughs> I'm looking forward to D&D tomorrow. I need to do prep work still, at least a little bit. The gruesome scenes were, the, were portrayed with such realism in the expressions of the faces of the condemned. Apparently, the sculptors would make the models directly from the corpses, right there at the site of the executions. At the it really turns my stomach. That's just one of several legends about the Dispels family. Whether there's any truth in it, I can't, can't say. But anyway, this museum houses models of famous people from all over the globe. Nevertheless, the most popular area of the museum by quite some margin is this House of Horrors. House of Horrors? Of course, visitors num visitor numbers are dwindling now as a result of the Great Exhibition, but people usually flock here to see the exhibits of some of London's most vile criminals, criminals at their gruesome work. Naturally, most of the miscreants portrayed here were sent to the gallows, though they're even stiffer now than the models of them. <laughs> Have you heard of poor taste? My dear fellow, the public live for poor taste. They yearn to be shocked. So the hideous exhibits in here are... They're all portrayals of real events that actually took place. Is it just me or did the temperature in here just seem to drop? Anyway, I advise you not to think too deeply about what you see here. Oh 
is back to being waxwork. Why are you being a temporary waxwork? Exactly what you see. I'm part of the exhibits here, catching these criminals in the act. Catching them? Every half hour, I home in on a different killer in one of the displays and adopt a new pose to ensnare him. When members of the public come for a closer look, I offer them my hand to shake. For a shilling, I'll happily allow them to take a photograph with us. Us? Does he mean him and the waxwork murderers? But why, Mr. Sherms? My dear fellow, isn't it obvious? For the money. He really warded me there. Very fitting for the House of Horrors. As it stands, I may struggle to pay this month's rent. And I have the ravenous Iris to consider. Ravenous? Oh, Hernie, I'm so hungry. Oh. Push comes to shove, I shall have to ask you to do your bit, Mr. Narahuddle. What's he threatening to rope me in that into now? So, with that in mind, how about a photograph? As a special treat, you may have your pick of the murderers and scoundrels in here. The choice is yours. Maybe some other time. Hmm. Remember, Mr. Norahodo, ignore me at your peril. Back to being waxwork again. About my question, I keep yawning. I didn't sleep terribly well myself. But at least it was more than two hours, I guess. Mm. Well, what is it you'd like to ask me then? Um, actually, it's... It's about Lord Van Zeeks. Ah, our friend Mr. Reaper. How did you find him? Well, I trust... And so I filled Mr. Sholmes in about everything I'd learned. About Lord Van Zeeks, about Professor Harebrain and about the strange coincidence that they had been at university together. So I'm wondering what it was that happened to make Lord Van Zeeks such a different person. I was sure that you'd know, Ferdy. You said there was something going on here in this exhibit hall before. That something was afoot. And that you believed it was related to what I wanted to ask you about. Um, Mr. Sholmes? He suddenly climbed up. Oh, it seems we've reached the unavoidable. Greetings. Oh, uh, hello. Where did she appear from? And what's she wearing? Could she look any more mysterious? I mean, that's the idea I, I've made. I hope you are appreciating my museum. Sorry, have we... Mr. Sholmes, do you know this? Oh, again. My apologies. I am Asmeralda to spells. This is my museum of waxwork. What? You? You're the? You're the Madame to spells? Yes, sir. Though only twenty-six years young, I might add. Is that significant somehow? I'm a Madame in name only. It adds a certain je ne sais quoi. Right. Firstly, I must apologize for my waxworks, or rather, one wax waxwork in particular. That'll be Mr. Sholmes, then. I was led to believe he was a great detective, but he seems unable to settle. Next time you move from your designated exhibit, I will be. It, there will be toil and trouble. Oh god. <laughs> Trolls, hello. Stats aren't great. But hugs to you as well. All the hugs. I hope you're looking forward to tomorrow as well. With D&D &D again. He sounds deadly serious. That's a problem. How am I supposed to ask Mr. Sholmes about Lord Van Zeeks now? Let's not forget what Hurley said before. About something being afoot. Right here in the museum, I mean. Yes, I know, but... 
I'm so curious. I want to know what's happening here. Haven't we got enough on our plate already? Oh, nice trolls. Did you make all these wax works, Madame S to spells? I did. I am the third generation of wax workers artisans, you know. Gosh. It was my grandmother who began the tradition in my family. Her fortunes were checkered, living through the turbulent times of the French Revolution as she did. Though that is, when she acquired the savoir faire that leads to this astonishing lifelikeness. All these waxworks really do look as though they're alive. In fact, they look more alive than Hurley. <laughs> what you see exhibited here represents the most atrocious of London's criminal past. All the waxworks were created in the presence of the real people on which they are modelled. In the hours Im immediately following their executions. That is the secret of the extraordinary lifelikeness. That sounds terrifying. All walks of life have similar challenges, I'm sure. To carry out one's trade par excellence, one must go to extraordinary lengths. My exhibits are a reflection of society. I create only that which the public wishes to see. Ugh, why couldn't the public have wished for something less horrifying? Do not fear. Sorry. This room is the only one in the museum with such a macabre team theme. I do hope you'll explore. There are models of famous singers, actors, politicians. Something for every taste, I hope. This Irish who dragged me straight in here, come to think of it. Sorry, perhaps I should have eased you into things. Let's talk about her. Uh, what's the situation with that? Ah, uh, my temporary waxwork model. He approached me some days ago, you see, with a business proposal. Oh, what sort of proposal? My dear madame, what these sparse exhibits need is, a, is the addition of a world-famous great detective. Or words to that effect. Ah. Uh, Naturally, I am well aware that Mr. Sholmes is widely known in London as a talented detective. It's a great detective, actually. He's very specific about it. Yes, the creme de la creme. So I was keen to come to some arrangement with him, of course. But sadly, we were unable to agree terms. Let me guess, someone wanted to charge an exorbitant price for his services. For a mere 500 pounds, I will dive into your cauldron of wax this very moment. Or, where's that effect? Mr. Shumps might have overdone it slightly with the sales pitch. Regrettably, the museum has a shortage of funds at the moment due to unforeseen circumstances. So we came to the current arrangements instead. Surely he doesn't really need to do what he's doing though, does he? I would think not, but he was very insistent. I have a 50 shilling problem that must be resolved by this by the morning. Or words to that effect. It's the pawnbroker, that's what it is. He must have something to redeem. Is the consulting detective work not going so well? I guess not. So what is it? Could I ask you something? The answer? I'm just curious. Is there anything going on in the museum at the moment? Some kind of incident, perhaps? Whoever suggested such a thing to you? Uh, well, it was... Your temporary wax work over there who mentioned it to me a little. Oh. He disappeared. A wax model is a work of art, not some tawdry object for trade. Ah. There you are. Viewing the exhibit again when you should be working? 
Do you wish to be melted down? My dear Madame Tuspel, save your reprimands. They're of more pressing concerns. The wax can wait. It's our ideas about your current problem we must throw into the melting pot instead. Personally, I would advise you not to involve the police. Why ever not? She's turned as white as a sheep. Because you have nothing at your disposal. You have at your disposal a great detective, whose services you may employ for a mere 50 shillings. Though please be aware that I prefer- No, I insist upon payment in advance. Very well. Let us see if the great detective is able to live up to his name, shall we? Before I engage my analytical processes, I must ask you to clarify something. What, pray, is behind the curtain? And that is the Tispel special exhibit. There's an extra charge to it to see it. Ah, the special exhibit in the House of Horrors. It must have picked a special killer then, I presume. Would you be so kind as to draw back the curtain, I wonder? Ah, absolutely absolute not. There's nothing amiss behind there. Nothing amiss, madame. What about the arm protruding ominously from under the curtain? Ah. I strongly encourage you to allow me to see what lies beyond before the situation worsens. Yes, very well. I will draw back the curtains, but only a succumb. Oh. Hmm. 139? I must confess, I peeked behind the curtain earlier. The Dispel's special exhibit is a very bleak graveyard scene indeed. And yet, somewhat surprisingly, the waxwork killer one would expect is nowhere to be seen. What does strike one, however? Is the portly gentleman lying peacefully on his back on the floor? Well, well, then perhaps Mr. Shones, that man on the floor, is the ruthless killer himself. I'm afraid not, my dear fellow. He's perfectly or a perfectly ordinary London gentleman, not even of waxwork, in fact. What? As skillfully made as those waxworks are, they are always distinguishable from real humans. So, allow me to present my two conclusions. The first is that a sizable business transaction has been taking place in this special exhibit. Why, why would you say that? And the second is that the aforementioned transaction is linked to a serious crime. Ah. She looks as pale as candle wax. I... I don't understand. So, Madame Trispels, as you've agreed to my fee, you shall now have the pleasure of seeing this famously great detective at temporary exhibit at work. Okay, here we go. Topic 1. Waxworks Faint. Where did it go? To begin with, we must ask ourselves what exactly is afoot here in this museum. The answer is revealed by the bundle of banknotes protruding so helpfully from the bag. In my estimation, some £200. That, that is all my own money. So what does this large sum of money reveal? Ah, not as much as the involuntary glance you cast, it would seem, Mother to Spells. Yes, the answer lies where your eyes now fall. The significance of the 200 pounds is revealed by that public notice. No, it's not. Waxwork for sale? Your business has hit hard times, it would seem. In short, you sold the infamous killer, the centerpiece of your special exhibit, for the sum of 200 pounds. No. Now, let us explore the next curiosity with which we are presented. 
who is the portly gentleman stretched out so peacefully on the floor. It would appear the man has suffered a severe shock, the cause of which is clearly known to you. I have. Unfortunately, madam, keeping secrets does not appear to be your forte. What dealt the man such a shocking blow was, of course, the 200 pounds. What? It would appear that you're twisted. you twisted this gentleman around your little finger most effectively. What are you suggesting? He rashly agreed to purchase the waxwork for the sum of 200 pounds. Only when he came to hand the money over did it occur to him what an extortionate amount he was paying, but the money was no longer in his hands. And the results, the scene we see before us, he collapsed in shock. I don't think that's what happened at all. Yes, the killer in this, spe in this special exhibit fetched a killer price. We can only pray that the gentleman's dreams are not plagued with regret. I mean, it is a large sum of money, but why would he pay it and then faint? <laughs> the question that arises then is what has become of the waxwork that changed hands? Let us consider that problem for a moment. You, you cannot possibly. What immediately strikes me about this conundrum is the young man standing over there. Who is this fellow? To find the answer, we need only observe his neckerchief. What? Such as is worn by policemen as a secret sign to follow members of the force that a crime is being perpetrated. Yes, this young man is an undercover policeman currently investigating this museum. I know him well, in fact. It's Sergeant Don Clay. What are you talking about? The man's quite a celebrity. He received triple accolades at last year's policing awards. That... Next, we turn our attention to the old man sat before him with a particularly unsightly visage. I've been watching him closely and he hasn't moved a muscle, almost, in fact, as if he were a waxwork. Uh, but, but you... Your reaction only confirms my suspicions, madame. I noticed it once, of course. Observe. The telltale sign that instantly proves whether or not this old man is a waxwork is the obvious price tag. Corruptions? A tragically low price, you might say. But perhaps the growing rate for aging waxworks riddled with cracks. And yet you sold it to the portly gentleman for an exorbitant 200 pounds. The sort of plucky behaviour that's sure to attract the attention of Scotland Yard, isn't that so, madam? I think he's got it the wrong way around. I'm pretty sure this guy is a statue and the other one is not. But whatever. Herlock is kind of weird sometimes. I do not... Yes, the waxwork you sold has already been seized by the police and remains in their custody as we speak. The old man must be reunited with his grave in his special exhibit and not a moment too soon. Um, yeah, there's a lot wrong with that, Herlock. There's a lot wrong with that. I'm gonna have to correct a bunch. She's ready with the wax. I see I've stunned you all into silence. You have, Herney, you have. And you've obviously upset this young lady in the process. Her cauldron, cauldron looks awfully hot. Uh, um... If I could just bring up one point, Mr. Shrums. Ah, the notorious Norihoto one point. I'm all ears, my dear fellow. According to your deduction, then, the special exhibit featured this old policeman. So that would mean that he's the particularly ruthless murderer, wouldn't it? The killer policeman, Ottermont. Sorry? It was a mysterious series of murders that rattled the capital only last year. The police rushed to the scene every time, only to find the culprit had disappeared into the ether. And it turned out the culprit was a policeman himself, a senior officer by the name of Ottermall. Do you mean that's 
Who the sinister looking old man there is supposed to be? Indeed. It's a particularly grim face, is it not? Unforgettable, in fact. Yes, I remember that odious countenance only too well. But is 200 pounds a lot of money for a wax model? It would be enough to afford one of the latest steam carriage carriages, if that puts things in perspective. So, it's quite a lot then. Is there anything else you wish to add? Before I melt you down, the bubbling wax is looking more and more ominous. Uh, the smell of all that molten wax is starting to worry me. Mr. Shums did more or less just accuse her to her face, so I think I might have to call on your assistance here, Iris, if that's alright. To make some minor corrections to the great detective's great deductions. Of course it's alright. We'll soon set things straight. Let's get started then, shall we? Just what I was waiting to hear, my dear fellow. So, Madame to spells, in accordance with our agreement, you shall now have the pleasure of seeing this famously great detective and temporary exhibit at work. Course correction. Okay. Okay, so we just go through with the... All of that stuff, the banknotes, what does the large amount of money reveal? And then he says her glance goes to that sign, which is not true. She definitely looked in this direction, that's true. But I'm not sure she'd sell any of her waxworks, even for 200 pounds. Oh? She must pour her heart and soul into making them, don't you think? Over and above the wax. If it were me, I wouldn't sell them for anything. For that much money, I would. But it sounds like that makes me a bad person. Well, anyway, I wonder if the 200 pounds could have some other significance. Let's follow that furtive glance again and see if anything else that explains it exists. Okay. Ah. Well, there's the 200 pound thing. What is this? What's that note doing pinned on the wall there? Oh yes, let's see. Dear Madame to Spells, we've taken the prisoner from this room. The price for a safe return is 200 pounds. Have the money ready by noon on 20 the 23rd of October. What? This, this is, it's just like the sort of thing that's left behind when someone is kidnapped. Yes, it's a ransom note. Exactly. Easy. The significance of the 200 pounds is revealed by that ransom note. Quite so, and we must congratulate these criminals on their inventiveness, abducting a waxwork. Ah, 200 pounds is no small ransom fee, yet you clearly intend to pay it. The modeling question has special importance, so I put together all the money I have. In summary, then, the 200 pounds you have in your handbag is ransom money. Now, let us explore the next curiosity with which we are presented. Who is the portly gentleman stretched out so peacefully across the floor? It's a manner of shock. Keeping secrets is not really to be a forte. The 200 pounds, yeah, that's not true. If the waxwork was kidnapped, where does that leave us in terms of who the man is? You could just ask him when he comes round. I think the point of this exercise is to understand the beauty of the deduction process, Iris. Yes, you're right. Hurley's trying so hard, we mustn't let him down. Well, there's little doubt that he suffered a shock, that much seems clear. But in that case, what's Madame, Madame to Spells trying to hide? That's weird. <laughs> That's not her hand. 
This is just Madame Tispel's right hand, isn't it? Yes, it must be. I can clearly see your left hand after all. Oh, but wait a minute. This is a left hand as well, look. Don't say such creepy things, Iris, please. And it seems very stiff too. In fact, it's really hard. Y you mean made of wax? Wax for hands. Take that! Did she slap him with the waxwork hand? <laughs> what dealt the man such a shocking blow was, of course, the waxwork hand. Indeed, with a solid waxwork limb, one could deliver a very substantial blow. How, how could you... The hand protruding from the bottom of your cape. It ought to be a right hand, but closer inspection reveals that in fact it's a left hand. Ah. And somewhat masculine as well. In other words, it does not belong to you, madam. It is the hand of a waxwork model. Ah. I mean, it was more of a shriek thing. Oh, look. Some of the visitors to my museum can be troublesome. They meddle with the exhibits and cause damage. So you mean that arm... Yes. This gentleman saw fit to try to remove it as a souvenir. Hmm. No small keepsake. Sake. Like taking a whole branch of a cherry tree when you can go few the blossoms. I'm afraid I had to teach the man a lesson. You confronted the man and tried to take the arm back. And the results? The scene we see before us. He was knocked unconscious. A point we may need to revisit later, but for the time being we have our conclusion. Yes, the killer in this special exhibit has been kidnapped. Okay. Right, so where is it? Who is this fellow? We only observe his neckerchief. According to Mr. Sholmes, the yellow neckerchief is assigned to other policemen that some crime is underway. A way of communicating with his colleagues without revealing his identity, yes. It's a secret that's closely guarded by Scotland Yard. That Mr. Sholmes didn't hesitate to give away. Well, uncovering secrets is any true detective's nature, of course. Right. Anyway, judging from Madame Tuspel's reaction to Mr. Shum's introduction, I think perhaps we might not have identified the man quite correctly. Oh, it's the one that... yeah, okay. The arm got taken off of. What the... The man has a stub sticking out of his shoulder where his arm should be. Ah, well that settles that then. Right, this isn't a real person at all. His entire arm's been ripped off from the shoulder down. Arm's been forced. That ties in with what we just found out. Take that! Who is this fellow? To find the answer, we can only observe his shoulder stuff. No such boneless human walks this earth, of that I can assure you. In other words, the man standing here, the young Sergeant John Clay, is in fact, defying all odds, a waxwork model. I seem to remember that it was you who concluded he was a real person in the first place, Mr. Sholmes. He has become quite a celebrity in London, being the winner of no less than three policing awards last year. I simply had to make a model of the man. Naturally. What other explanation could there be? And it was this detective's arm that was pulled off by the man on the floor in the special exhibit, wasn't it? Next, we turn our attention to the old man set before him with a particularly unsightly visage. I've been watching closely and he hasn't moved a muscle. It's as if he were a wax work. The reaction only confirms my suspicions. Blah. A killer policeman called Ottomo, was it? Was he well known? He was all over the papers last year, but I can't say I know what he looks like. 
It's a very low price, though. Threepence isn't much money. Much money. Only enough for a few measly hours in gas. Oh, of gas in Mr. Garrett's delightful lodgings, in fact. So this is a special killer taken from the special exhibit, is it? The waxwork that somebody stole from the museum and tried to ransom for 200 pounds. Is this cross the old killer policeman Ottermall, really? Perhaps we should have a good look around again and see if another idea crops up. Well, what about his scarf thing? And oh, he's twitching. Look at this. Old man tapping his foot like crazy. Seems to be fast asleep though. He's not tapping his foot consciously then? So you mean... It must be a twitch. Never mind that. The point is waxworks don't tap their feet. Or a twitch. And look at his arm too. We've seen a scarf like that somewhere else around here, haven't we? Take that! There we go. Telltale sign that instantly proves whether or not this old man is a waxwork is the obvious twitch. Even the most realistic waxworks do not exhibit a twitch. In other words, the splendid old man is in fact a genuine member of Scotland Yard. Slight shift in your choice of objectives then. And there you have it. Well, Madame to spells. Well, what? It was me who contacted the police and demanded that someone come in the first place. He is clearly fatigued. He is sound asleep. But then, what's this tag about showing a price of three pence? No doubt the price tag of the muffler which the old Bobby purchased recently at a local market. And I presume you've observed the scarf tied around his arm. Does that not strike you, Mr. Narahodo? Yes, the secret sign used by detectives to show that some criminal activity is currently underway. Of course, because as you know, there has been just such a criminal activity happening here. As you deduced from the very beginning, detective. So it would seem that we finally arrive at the truth. Finally. The waxwork of the especially ruthless killer from the special exhibit has been kidnapped. And Scott and Jord are already investigating. But the model's whereabouts remain a mystery. Thus concludes Herlock Sholmes' great deduction of this horrifying puzzle. Well... I feel like answering the question of where is the, the thing with it's still a mystery is not a great deduction, but sure. All sorts of people visit my museum here. Men and women, young and old. Sometimes they drop in just for a short time on their way back from the pub. I welcome them all. But if anyone tries to damage my exhibits, I do not take it lightly. Anyway, Your great deduction was even more enchanting than I had been that to believe. It was a pleasure, my dear madam. I'm gratified that you enjoyed the spectacle. And as for your rough customer, I've no doubt he'll regain consciousness shortly and return home. What concerns me more is the waxwork from the special display, if it was indeed genuinely abducted. Yes, tragically it was. Then I would ask you to recount to us the events surrounding the stolen waxwork. In as much detail as possible, would you please? Very well. But after I have told you what I know, I must insist that you return to your work. The talents of a great detective could be put to better use, I feel, but as you wish. Okay. Oh, oops. I already asked that. Skip through quickly. God, 
I do wish there was a skip button. <laughs> Tell us more about the stolen waxworks, please. It was some days, days ago now, when I came in here one morning. I immediately noticed that the waxwork was missing from the special exhibit here. It is your most prominent display, so that's why the curtains were closed. And I found the ransom note in its place. The culprit must have broken in during the night and taken it then. He said this waxwork that was stolen. It was a model of some horrible criminal, I suppose. Of a particularly horrible criminal, in fact. The killer who left a more profound scar on society than any other, I would say. The Professor. Not a name I've heard of. So, Mr. Norihodo, it seems the circle is complete. Sorry? The Professor case happened at around the time I was born, didn't it? Indeed it did, Iris. Ten years ago, a series of murders that rocked the capital. Ten years ago? Yes, at exactly the time that Barok von Zieks graduated from university, in fact. What? Surely he's not saying... So the big event that changed Mr. Reaper's life... As you've surmised, it was the Professor case. Who was this Professor then? Who indeed? It was a series of gruesome murders that had all of London gripped in terror a decade ago. After five victims were killed, the man was arrested and put to death. And now he's immortalized here in wax for all Londoners to admire and enjoy. Though, of course, he happens to be absent at present on the account of the abdu abduction. Hmm. But I don't understand. How is all this related to Lord Van Zeeks? You must first understand, my dear fellow, why it is that the, the professor earned such infamy. It was due to the victims he chose. Some of Whitehall's finest. What do you mean, Herney? Those murdered by the professor were some of the highest members of the British ar aristocracy. Members of the nobility, even royalty. It sent shockwaves through the country's administration. Members of the... Wait, of course. What Professor Herbrain said. Lord Van Zeeks is from a family with noble blood. Oh gosh. It was the fifth victim that led to the professor's arrest. The last of the killer's prey was a young noble by the name of Clint Van Zeeks. No, I don't believe it. Van Zeeks? I'm sure you can piece together the rest of for yourself. In the wake of his older brother's murder, the young Barok pursued a career as prosecutor and eventually became the reaper we know today. I had no idea Lord Van Zeek had such a tragic past. Well, I'm afraid that's all I can say on the matter. For the time being, at least. After all, I have work to do. As a waxwork exhibit. Well, off he goes. I'm afraid I shall have to excuse myself as well. Oh, yes, of course. It's been a pleasure, thank you. Okay. Well, that was interesting. None of the predicted scenarios I've been analyzing involved you coming to visit me here. Wait, what? Oh. It's been too long. It really has. I'm delighted to see you, Barok. It's been ten years, and here we are, meeting in a prison of all places. I can't forgive myself for what happened to Mr. Asman, I just can't. I still can't believe it could happen. Tomorrow the court will decide. 
Yes. I have a young eastern man acting for my defense. He seems reliable enough, though. It was an accident, a terrible accident. He, he assures me he can prove it. I must warn you. Oh, I know, I know. I've heard already. You're going to be prosecuted, aren't you? Yes. Since I returned to England, I've heard lots of stories. Barok, are you really... What? Never mind. I know that you have my best interests at heart. My friend is on trial. I wouldn't entrust it to anybody else. Of course, I fully understand. Thank you, Barok. Until tomorrow, then. I'll see you in court. Oh. He still says he's his friend. Maybe Van Zeeks has a heart after all. Who knew? Who could have known? Oh, it's time for court. I can't believe it's been six months since I was last allowed to work in court. Now here I am, back at Old Bailey. Ah, Mr. Narahodo. Good morning, Professor Herbrain. I, I don't understand. It doesn't make any sense. The atmospheric pressure in here is off the charts. I've never felt anything like it. It's, it's crushing me. I feel it every time I'm here. That gravity. Well, this is Britain's highest court. But are you telling me it's fitted with some kind of device that can actually control air pressure? Uh, well. I think it's probably all in the mind. Uh, yes, well, you won't let me down, will you, Mr. Narahodo? I'm counting on you in today's trial to save my life. To save the secret of my super high voltage instantaneous kinesis machine from being made public. Yes, I understand. I know what I have to do. I have to establish that the explosion two days ago was nothing more than an unfortunate accident. Well, I am sure there's nothing to worry about, really. Justice will prevail. My commiserations, Mr. Narahodo. We appear to have been lumbered with the most tiresome case here. Mr. Sharms, I didn't expect to see you here. And that was very mean, Reno. Leaving me alone at home with Ernie? It took me at least an hour to wake him. Oh. Uh, oh. Uh, is it... Are you... Oh, look, Sholmes. Indeed, sir. I am here. Oh, look, Sholmes. Oh, I've heard all about your exploits, even whilst living in Germany. Ah, uh, yes. Rand's magazine is on sale in Germany, too. This month's installment was sublime. Your deduction in the Adventures of Silver Blaze was wonderful. Ah, yes, a memorable case indeed. It concerned a snake, I seem to recall. No, that was the speckled band. Well, thank you for coming. I do appreciate your support. I'm sorry dis to disappoint you, my dear fellow, but I'm afraid I can't stay. Oh. I have urgent business at, business at Madame de Spells. You mean your waxwork job? No, no. The waxwork abduction, of course. Madame has engaged my services. Ah, so you're trying to get to the bottom of that ransom note, are you? The week's wages depend on it, as does the safe return of the waxwork, naturally. As such, I intend to give it my undivided attention. Oh, well, never mind then. I understand. Of course, with my skills of observation and reasoning, resolving the matter will be as easy as proverbial pie. I shall return forthwith. For until I solve the case, I shall have no money to afford a pie of any description. Oh, then you must absolutely give it your full attention, Ernie. Quite, Iris, quite. But life is riddled with irony, you know. 
Whenever I give something my full attention, I have a quite insatiable desire for pie. One of the universe's intractable mysteries, you might say. Oh, yes, quite. Definitely. Absolutely. I totally understand. Is someone a little starstruck? I wish you the very best of luck, Professor Herbray. Oh, <laughs> why, thank you. Before I depart, Mr. Norohodo, a word in your ear, if you please. What's this about? As you have remarkably little grounding in science, I feel I ought to inform you. As compelling as this super high voltage instantaneous kinesis hypothesis may be, a practical implementation such as was attempted by the professor at the Great Exhibition is quite impossible. But, but the professor said the demonstration was a success. Yes, it would appear that he fervently believes that. Believes it was. I read the Professor Bunny Brain's paper about it too, Bruno, and I have to say, I'm sure it can't be done. It could barely be done theoretically, let alone practically. So he's completely barking up the wrong tree. But how could an experiment that had no possibility, possibility of succeeding in fact succeed? That's contradictory. And it's that contradiction that will be at the heart of the trial, I've no doubt. What's that supposed to mean? Now, I must hurry along. I wish you the best of luck, my dear fellow. See you later, Hurdy. There he goes. Bye-bye. Well, it looks like you're on your own today, Bruno. But chin up, you can do it. Oh, what about you, Iris? Uh, no, I'm afraid I can't help. I have something I need to do. I see. <laughs> it's going to be a big surprise for you when you find out what it is. Ah, that sounds ominous. Council for the defense and the defendant. Court is about to be in session. Make your way to the courtroom at once. Okay. We have to go. An experiment that the laws of science say can't possibly succeed. And a scientist who's convinced that it did. That's the riddle you have to unlock here, Rinosuke. That's the key to this case. Easy enough, right? No problem. Oh, we've got some new people on the jury. Nice. In the name of Her Majesty the Queen, I hereby declare this court to be in session. We are sitting today for the public trial of Professor Albert Herbring. I now call upon the counsels for the prosecution and defense to declare their willingness to proceed. The prosecution is ready. The defense is... The defense is ready, my lord. I'm six months out of practice, and what's more... I am without Cesaro-san today. Ugh. Is it just my imagination, or does the air in here feel even more oppressive than usual? So, I must say I recollect the victim in, uh, I recollect the victim of this case all too well, Mr. Odi Asman. Mr. Asman was well known as a financier, though that was merely a front for his diverse criminal activities. It was only a month ago that the man appeared in court, prosecuted by you, Lord Van Zeeks. But the jury unanimously found him not guilty. Because every member of the jury had been bribed by the sound of it. These powerful London criminals are prepared to go to extreme lengths to keep their freedom. But two days ago, on tw the 21st of October, Mr. Asman met his end. The work of the Reaper, was it? If that is how your lordship would describe divine retribution, but the fact remains that Mr. Asman's death was a direct result of the actions of the accused, Professor Hairbrain. Very well then. Now, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you have been selected at random to represent the will of the people. All the six of you are ready to fulfill your societal duty. I'm most gratified to have been selected to carry out this important civic duty, my lord. To have a man's fate in the palm of one's hand. Oh gosh, oh god, it sends shivers down my spine. Science experiments, magic, conjuring tricks, courtroom trials, all are nothing more than performances. 
only spurious scholar that defiles the reputation of science deserves to hang. Um, we have to listen to what's said on both sides of the fence and, um, then settle on one. That's it, isn't it? Oh, and he's just sleeping. Oh. Wasn't like this in my day. Wasn't like this at all. That's... That's... The police killer Ottomo look alike. Again. And he's as exhausted as ever, it seems. Now, as I'm sure you're all aware, the incident we are here to judge today tragically took place at the Great Exhibition, shortly after its opening. Though the death toll could have been far worse, with the exception of the victim no one was killed. Nevertheless, the dream of the signs being exhibited rapidly turned into a nightmare for the spectators. A tragic turn of events, and as such the eyes of all of London, no, the whole world, would be on this trial. It is our duty to reach a swift and just conclusion, I feel. So, your opening statement, please, Lord Van Zeeks. At the heart of this incident is technology never before demonstrated anywhere in the world. One of science's latest developments, I take it. The government is keen to capitalize on the Great Exhibition to improve Britain's technological advantage. Uh, the technology being demonstrated by the accused was described as super high voltage instantaneous kinesis. Good lord. It's designed to disassemble human subjects using extremely high voltage electricity and beam them instantly to another location where they are subsequently reassembled. Is such a thing even within the realms of possibility? Well, I don't believe it, that's for sure. Disassembling people with electricity, my goodness, how shocking. Ha, the whole idea is absurd. The hypothesis would never stand up to scrutiny. So, I believe you're an ex fellow, a fellow of the Royal Society, are you not? An expert in your field. I am, and my word on the matter can be considered final. Instantaneous kinesis is poppycock. So this expert and Mr. Sholmes are in agreement. It's impossible. What is the prosecution's view on the matter? The prosecution would assert that the accused's instantaneous kinesis demonstration was a success. What? What rot? Order, order. The professor's hypothesis is currently under investigation by the British government. If it is deemed to have merit, a substantial research grant would be made available. The accused made use of the invention built on his new hypothesis to take Mr. Asman's life. In order to be the sole benefactor of the grant. But, but... This disastrous demonstration was no accident. It was carefully designed from the outset to end the life of the victim. Thank you, Lord Van Zeeks. The prosecution's stance is clear. But you will now bring forth witnesses to substantiate your claims. I do wonder why he's doing this, because it is his friend. He's prosecuting. I guess he's going to spar with Norihodo and then hopefully find out the truth. I guess that's his plan. Still go in as hard as he normally does. Gladly, my lord. Bailiff, show the first witnesses to the stand. Oh, there they are. Witnesses, state your names and occupations for the court. Yes, sir. Uh, Tobias Gregson, Detective Inspector at Scotland Yard's Homicide Division. I was on duty at the demonstration on the day in question and in charge of the following investigation. Albert Herbring, scientist. 
You were born in England, but have been carrying out research in Germany in recent years, correct? Mm, yes, yes, that's right. After graduating from university here in Britain, I went to work in Germany and made an amazing discovery. Which is what brought me back. I had to demonstrate my incredible hypothesis at the Great Exhibition. What you demonstrated was incredible, alright. An incredible explosion. But the science, the science was a success. The instantaneous kinesis worked. Everyone saw it. They must have done. Yes, that was the terrible accident, but... The demonstration of my hypothesis was a success. Well, that much is undeniable, as shown in this photograph taken by the forensic investigation team. Oh. This doesn't look like a man who died in an explosion. Like, instantly. That doesn't look like a guy who died in an explosion. Right? This looks like a man who was shot in the heart or something. Hmm. This was taken inside the Crystal Tower, I take it. The centerpiece of the exhibition, no less. That's right, my lord. Seems the victim rammed straight into it. Rammed into it, huh? Hmm, I see. Very well. Submit the photograph as evidence. As the court heard, the victim of the incident was Mr. Odie Aston. Let me actually look at this again. Uh, yeah, stab wounds. Do we have like a medical report as well? Nothing else that I, I see as suspicious. Besides these shards, I guess, and then stab one with some something in his pocket, but that might not be any interest. There have been a number of allegations made against the man, but putting him aside for the time being, he was the man who financed the research for the experiment and the demonstration itself. I see. To summarize the situation. The defendant is accused of taking the life of the man who funded his work. Would that be correct? Exactly. But couldn't it be that the explosion was caused by some malfunction in the apparatus used for the demonstration? That's right. That must be it. My splendid machine. My poor splendid machine. You saw it yesterday, didn't you? You can't even examine the records thanks to the Special Dim Dispensation for Scientific Equipment Act. What? The wreckage? The wreckage? But that be the case, how can the facts be established? How can it possibly be determined whether this was an accident or a deliberate and malicious act? Extremely simply, my lord. I beg your pardon? Isn't that right, witness? What? Sorry? Me? No, your neighbor. Yes, sir, it was murder, plain and simple. Anyone could state that with complete certainty. What? How can he possibly think that? Thank you, Inspector. I think we had better proceed to formal testimony. You will explain to the court on what grounds you claim this experiment to have been a front for murder. Okay. corpse that went crashing through Crystal Tower had a broken neck. I, I made a minor miscalculation in the angle of the beam projection, that's all, that was my mistake. But the post-mortem examination revealed another injury, a fatal wound. There was a lesion in his chest where he'd clearly been stabbed by something sharp right in the heart. So the victim was killed before he went anywhere, and this fella's the only one who could have done it. An extraordinary business. In addition to suffering a broken neck, the victim was stabbed in the heart. Information I would really like to have heard from someone other than the judge. The coroner says death could, uh, would have been all but instant from a wound like that. You could say, in fact, that the victim was killed twice by the accused. 
No, no, and no, that couldn't be further from the truth. I have here the experiment plan document that was submitted to the security team. The victim stood himself inside something called the birdcage, ready to be beamed instantly. To the second level of the crystal tower, about 25 yards away. The experiment did not go according to plan, however. As the machine was put into operation, there was a large explosion. The blast caused the beam transmitter to point higher than intended. Accordingly, the kinesis resulted in the birdcage materializing in mid-air. From where it subsequently fell, crashing through the glass of the crystal tower's large round window. My word, one assumes the victim's neck was broken upon impact with the tower then. I I'm so sorry, I didn't mean for this to happen, the machine was just too powerful. But honestly, really, I swear, it was just an accident, a terrible accident. Unfortunately, that excuse cannot save you. No, not considering the sharp murder weapon that pierced the victim's heart. Murder weapon? What are you saying? This is the autopsy report submitted by the coroner. The prosecution would like it entered into the court record. Your request is granted, counsel. His neck was broken from the impact of a violent fall and was stabbed in the chest with a sharp object. I was there in person, you know, I saw the whole ludicrous performance. And the only other person on the stage was mis with Mr. Asman was that disgraceful excuse for a scientist. And really, by all accounts, it must have been him. Ah, hard to think otherwise, really. Very well. Counsel for the defense, proceed with the cross-examination, please. Oh, yes, my lord. I need to focus here. It's been a while. Okay, it's not a long examination, luckily. Hold it! Start off with some hold its. Are you suggesting that's because he fell from a considerable height? Exactly. Which highlights something else about this whole rum business. What's that? The fact that the instantaneous kinesis itself was a success. Ah. After the explosion, the cage with the fellow inside suddenly appeared out of nowhere in midair. Still, so, although the experiment ended in disaster, the so-called instantaneous kinesis did actually occur. Remind us, Professor, what was the cause of the fatal disaster? Hold it! So the angle of the projection is critical, is it? And you calculated it yourself, personally? Absolutely. The calculation is far too complicated for anyone but me to carry out. Only you got it wrong, didn't you? Yes, that's right. That's the point. The calculation is so complicated, even I can make a mistake. Do people fall for that brazen confidence? I should try it. I, I took into account the subject's height and weight. It's the wind direction, the ambient temperature. I considered every possible variable, so I just don't understand how this could have happened. Obviously, then, you had to include the weight of the clothes Mr. Asman was wearing at the time, I suppose. Ah. Crackling comets. The answer should have been three. How much for safety first? The three must be for safety third. Um, let me actually look at this. Cody Asman, 47, British, 21st of October, around 2.20pm. Hammerage of a wound to the chest that pierced the heart inflicted by a sharp implement. Um, broken vertebrae, most likely resulting from impact after sunfall from considerable height. Okay. Hold it! Interesting. 
Another fatal injury, you say? That doesn't make any sense. Didn't think I'd have to spell it out, but here we go. Just because there were two fatal wounds doesn't mean I'm saying the victim had two lives to lose, does it? Two rights. Obviously, at first we thought the bloke could die due to the spine snapping in half as well. But you're saying that's not the case? You got your answer once I finish my fish and chips. If you don't keep button in every few seconds. But we all know it's a bottomless bag. It's true. The victim plummeted 30 feet into a glass tower. It would be reasonable to assume that's the cause of death. That as the cause of death. It was a red herring, wasn't it? There's a lesion in his chest. Hold it! The defense knew nothing of this crucial information. The prosecution received this report from a forensic investigation team only this morning. That was the first we knew of it as well. I can only apologize for the impossibility of informing the defense. Sarcastic and insincere, thanks. So what was the nature of this sharp object? Among the accused tools the, that were in use at the demonstration, one is of particular interest. This. That's the screwdriver we found. Interesting. Ah, <laughs> oh, there it is. There he is. My trusty little companion, Andrew. Andrew? Of course. Ah, do you know each other already? He's one of my dear friends, like all my tools. I've named them all, you know. We're one big happy family. Well, that doesn't make you sound crazy at all, Mr. Hairbrain. Andrew is my flathead screwdriver, of course. His brother Michael is a crosshead. Well, it would appear that your beloved Andrew has a red stain on his shank. Ah, uh, that... that isn't... It's blood, beyond all reasonable doubt. No. That's not all. The long, sharp shape of this Andrew fellow is completely consistent with the victim's wound. What? What? Order, order. The court will enter this friend of the defendant as evidence. Oh no. Damn it, Andrew. Why'd you have to go and do this? This is blood. Mr. Asmund's, no doubt. This is the problem with looking at murder weapons. I've seen this unusually shaped handle before. It's the same screwdriver that was lodged in the grill on the floor of the Kinesis machine. It could be important information, so you should definitely make note of it. Looking through the grill. Grounds the F for saying that. Huh. You really need me to ask. There were only two people on that public experimentation stage in front of the whole crowd. The victim, Mr. Odie Asman, and the accused Professor Hairbrain. And we know for certain that the, that before the experiment the victim was alive. That's right, I saw him with my own eyes. Furthermore, following the explosion and kinesis, nobody went anywhere near the body. In other words, only someone else on stage Great with the victim Scott. could have possibly done it. Oh. Excuse me. Professor Hairbrain, do you have some information that may be relevant here? Professor. Ah, sorry. Sorry. I was just calculating the optimum coefficient of electrolysis to, co to separate molecules in the human body. And the witness stand is the best place for that? 
It seemed as though you might have something to say about Inspector Gregson's lost, lost remark. Ah, ha ah, ha ah, 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 yes, yes, that's right, of course. Uh, he just said that nobody else could have done it, didn't he? Yeah, that's right. Who else could have stabbed the victim, eh? I don't know, but there's no way that I could possibly have stabbed Mr. Asman, as you say. Her? Explain, please, Professor. Of course, this cold-hearted policeman may not be aware, I suppose. But humans are warm-blooded mammals, with blood running continuously through their veins. I had heard. And surely, you see, if I had plunged something the size of Andrew into the man's chest, the whole stage would have been a bloodbath. No, a blood swimming pool. The thousands of Londoners were watching me at the time. And yet no, not one of them claims to have seen a swimming pool of blood. Well, no, I suppose not. You see, not one. Hmm, true. Didn't see anything like that. Well done, Professor. That was a great counter-argument. Order, order. Pray forgive the discourtesy if I shave, save a drop from my hallowed chalice to accompany my old friends at a Ducey. Ducey? Yeah. Here's to you, Albert. Oh. You're too kind, Barak, but I'm really not a patch on you. No, you're not. No? You've neglected to mention one crucial possibility. I have. A particular situation in which very little bleeding would result from a stab wound. Ah, of course. Inspector, enlighten the court, please. Yes, sir. Where are they going with this? Very well. You will amend your formal testimony now, Inspector Gregson. The weapon the victim was stabbed with must have been left in his body whilst he was beaming through the air. That's impossible, though, because it was found in the machine. Damn it. Hello. Welcome. Hold it. I hope you're doing well. Why would you think that, Inspector? With any wound, it's only when you pull the weapon out that profuse bleeding occurs. Whilst it's still lodged in the body, it acts as a stopper of sorts, for want of a better word. You don't need a medical degree to be aware of this fact. It's common knowledge for any investigator. If you ask me, this bloke masked what he was doing from view with, uh, with his body before stabbing Asman in the chest. Then he beamed the victim off the stage with his fancy device, the screwdriver still where he planted it. Well, if that was true though, it would have still been in the picture. Okay, let's let's go through that again and send it send it. Let me actually save first because I might as well. Just in case. Objection. Wait, what? How is the picture with him not having a screwdriver sticking out from his chest not evidence that it wasn't still in his chest Objection. I guess we'll do the screwdriver then because mm. it's not really evidence I would say because we can be like well we found it here right but that's not evidence really mm. You say that while the weapon remains in the body, there's very little bleeding. Is that unequivocal? Look, there was no blood on the experimentation stage, even though that's where the fellow was stabbed. 
The only explanation for that is if the screwdriver was still in his body, stopping any heavy bleeding. It's common medical knowledge, my learned friend, even on your side of the world. Yes, but about the screwdriver... The thing is, we actually saw it at the scene ourselves, on the experimentation stage. What? It was on the floor by the wreckage of the machine, poking through a metal grill. I went to pick it up, but the detective here stopped me. Isn't that right, Inspector Gregson? Uh, well, um, now that you come to mention it, yes. Inspector, are we to understand that you permitted the defense counsel to investigate? That you contravened the Special in Dispensation for Scientific, Scientific Equipment Act? Uh, uh, no, not, not at all, I wouldn't do that. I just let him look, nothing more. I was very clear he wasn't to touch a thing. Yes, that's true. The screwdriver was in plain sight, on the stage. But it shouldn't have been, though, should it? What are you, you gotta get? If this tool had still been in the victim's body when the victim was beamed away by the machine, then it shouldn't have still been on the stage. Wow. That's right. It should have been beamed across the crystal, to the crystal tower with Mr. Asman, and been found still lodged in the victim's chest. Ugh. Order, order. How do you explain this, Inspector? I... well, uh, I don't... It looks as though everything that the victim had on his person moved with him when he was beamed. If the screwdriver was still in his chest when the instantaneous kinesis occurred, obviously that should have been beamed to the destination as well. Ooh. This is a strange situation. Even though people are saying that this instantaneous kinesis is a scientific impossibility, we're still basing arguments on the assumption that it did actually take place. Alright, time to tighten the screws here. My lord, if the prosecution is unable to explain this inconsistency in its argument, we can only conclude that the testimony given in support cannot be relied on. Upon, rather. Lord Van Zeeks is found. Do you have something to say, witness? Yes, I knew it. It be bears out. The equations hold. Mr. Narihodo, don't worry. Uh, about what? Without delving into the details, there's no inconsistency. What? Even if Andrew had been lodged in Mr. Asman's chest, my trusty tool wouldn't have moved. Andrew remaining on the stage is consistent with my calculations. Um, what? what? <laughs> yeah, that's about the reaction I expected. Oh my god, 20 stream streak. I'm at nice. Congrats. Oh, James, hello. I didn't even see you there. How are you doing? It would seem your illusions have been shattered. Clearly we should hear the accused's explanation. Or should I say, this brilliant scientist's explanation. Hmm. Just when I'd found an inconsistency in the prosecution's argument. Scientists. Very well. The defendant will testify again. Provide us with a scientific explanation as to why the inconsistency asserted by the defense fails to hold. In the name of Apollo, I will, my lord. Mm. Okay. What does he have to say? And to be clear, I'm still at the stage of gathering data in my research. My hypothesis states that Kinesis cannot transport metal, though, and the metal weapon would have stayed put. In other words, the point just raised by Mr. Narahoda isn't an inconsistency at all. 
Mr. Asman was the patron of my research. Without him, my work wouldn't have been possible. Now I have my now I have a duty to protect this incredible machine that we built together. Right. So now I have the problem of like, oh, metal doesn't get transported, but that was the only inconsistency inconsistency I had. It's not great. Okay. What do we do now? So the true the thrust of your testimony, Professor, is that based upon this hypothesis, metal objects cannot be moved by this method of instantaneous kinesis. In other words, in other words, since the screwdriver is made of metal, even if it remained lodged in the victim's chest, its subsequent discovery on the stage, despite the victim being found elsewhere, is not an inconsistency. And therefore... And therefore, Professor Albert Herbrain could still have been the killer. My great hypothesis holds, you see. <laughs> yeah, you could. You implicated yourself, Herbrain. Good job. I mean, at least he's truthful, I guess. Even if his head is on the line here. We, we had to make the cage used to contain the subject from wood for that very reason. I was not addressing you, witness. Uh, um, Professor Hairbrain? Yes. Whose side are you on here? I don't take sides, Mr. Narahodo. No, no, no. Uh, my only interest lies in upholding my hypothesis. I am a scientist, after all. Is he working for us or against us? It's very hard to tell. I mean, he just said he's not taking sides. He's just... Science. Let's see how you cross-examine this testimony, my Nipponese friend. Yes, fire away, Mr. Narahodo. Oh god. Hold it! Okay. And yet your retort to my argument wasn't lacking in confidence in any way. No scientist can find the truth without first finding self-belief. Those were the words of a certain scientist I hold in the highest of esteem. But you realize that disproving my argument puts you in a very precarious position, don't you? No scientist should strive to protect himself more than he strives to protect the truth. More words of the same great scientist, you know. Words that are causing me a lot of trouble. Who is the scientist? I'm afraid I couldn't tell you, Mr. Narahodo. Uh, but as soon as I remember the magnificent genius's name, you'll be the first to know. It might be worth keeping the names of your idols to mind. You're wasting your breath, my learned friend. This scatterbrain even forgets my name at times. So Lord Van Zeex really did have a friend once, but I didn't notice hell freezing over. Transport metal. Your hypothesis states it, so this isn't proven then. No, no, of course not. It's merely a hypothesis, but a good one, based upon thousands of calculations. But it is widely known that metals can't be decomposed by electrolysis. Yes, of course, so I am right. My hypothesis is clearly correct. What is it about incriminating himself that makes this man so happy? It's the whole reason that the birdcage is made out of wood, you see. The birdcage? Yes, that's what what I call the sea of Tusak cage in which Mr. Asman was placed for the kinesis. Ah, the jail cell in which the victim was detained. It does indeed seem to be made of timber of sorts. Oh, thank you, not to the to refer to it as an instrument of incarceration, your lordship. In short, any weapon lodged in the victim when he was beamed away by instantaneous kinesis would have been left behind on the stage if it was made of metal, correct? Yes, that's it. Yes, yes, yes. It all fits perfectly with the mathematical model. But the ultimate conclusion, then? Is that the defendant alone had the opportunity to inflict a fatal injury on the victim, is it not? 
Ah. Oh, indeed. Someone beat me out of this nightmare. Yeah. Hold it! The person I'm defending keeps working against me. <laughs> you seem to be pleased by that. Yes, another example of my hypothesis holding true. But I sense some sarcasm, Sonar Hodo. Are you not pleased? No. I knew it. At the end of the day, I'm the one responsible for Mr. Asman losing his life. The advancement of science is no excuse, I know that. No, you're quite right. Tell the court, did you have a close relationship with Mr. Asman? Oh, well, not really, I mean, I'd only met him two or three times. And we only ever discussed my hypothesis and the project. And the research grant, of course. Asman was the patron of my research. Without him, my work wouldn't have been possible. How did you come to know him in the first place? A year ago now, I, a small provincial science journal published a little paper about my work. That's very small. That's a scientific journal. Good gracious, I should need new spectacles. I might have had an extraordinary hypothesis and great promise, but at the time I had no money. I had to eat tiny little meals at a tiny little cafe and drink watered-down water out of a tiny little glass. But Mr. Asman read the paper and came to visit me at my tiny little laboratory. And offered you money to help fund your work. Exactly. That's exactly what happened. I handled the theoretical side of things and Mr. Asman provided me with an engineer for the pract practical. And the three of us produced a fantastic machine together. The machine that you brought to the Great Exhibition to demonstrate. And we, we had to apply it to the government for some sort of inspection to be allowed to exhibit, I think. I didn't understand all that side of things. Mr. Asman took care of all of it. He was a wonderful man, really. I owe him everything. Okay. But he's dead. Hold it! Check the machine we built together. When you say that you built the machine together, does that mean that you were involved in its construction? Yes. Well, not exactly. I'm not good with the practical side of machines myself, so the physical construction was done by an engineer. Little remains of your creation now, though, following the explosion. Repair will no doubt be impossible. Yes, yes, I realize that. But still... If, if someone were to gather all the broken parts, they would, could discover the secret of my hypothesis. If Mr. Asman and I toiled over that machine for so long, we put our hearts and souls into it. I have to protect our work. So what's left of the machine must be kept safe. That's only fair, because what happened was an accident. That's the extent of the testimony, then. Thank goodness for that. I don't want him doing any more damage. He's already basically proven that he could have been culprit. But it seems as though all he really cares about is defending his hypothesis. Still, I wonder. What if his hypothesis is just fund fundamentally flawed? Uh, okay, so what do we actually have to prove anything here? Transport metal, how is the metal work from the state port? Point raised by Mr. Road is not consistent. Uh, okay. I. The heck? I actually don't know what to do here. Like, 
Like, I already brushed them on everything. Just had to hand my work with a definitely possible. Now I have the duty to protect this incredible machine that we built together. It's not a work that you've saved puts. There's nothing else I can investigate about this, right? Not really. I actually don't have anything that I like. This works here, you know? Like, he's still gathering data. I can't really present anything there. Like, what's this it states that Kinesis cannot transport metal, though? So, I feel like this is what I need to disprove. Or like... I don't know. There's no inconsistency at all. With Asma was the creator of my work. I rejected to protect the incredible machine that we built together. I feel like it must be on this that I pre present something. I'm gonna present the screwdriver, so, but it's not gonna work. No. I I don't know. I guess the picture, yeah. Wait. Why the picture? <laughs> I'm, I'm, okay, what? Oh, it's, yep, it's the glasses. Right, there's a metal that, like, um the thing hanging from it and the the part with, between the glass i didn't even notice that <laughs> i gotta say it's the only thing i could imagine though professor hairbrain you say that according to your hypothesis nothing made of metal can be beamed by instantaneous kinesis using the machine you made is that right yes that's right spot on exactly correct in that case, I'd ask you to have a look at this photograph that was taken at the scene. In particular, I'd like you to pay attention to the victim's face. You can clearly see that Mr. Asmund is wearing a pair of spectacles with a metal rim. What? Metal? No. Metal can't... That's not... Metal? No. You already established that the proposed murder weapon, the screwdriver, was found on the stage. However, if your hypothesis correctly predicted that outcome, it should also have predicted that the metal-rimmed spectacles would be found in the same place. Ah, my hypothesis! My hypothesis! Professor Hairbrain, this isn't easy for me to say, but your hypothesis is clearly flawed. Ah. <laughs> Order, order. Council, what is the implication of this? If, on the day in question, the alleged instantaneous kinesis never actually took place, then it's entirely possible that the victim was killed somewhere other than on the stage. And in that case, someone other than the defendant could have been the culprit. But, but my hypothesis, my hypothesis is sound. I proved it that day. The experiment was a success. The experiment was proof of all my work. If I could say something here, in my capacity as a fellow of the Re Royal Society. Yes, juror number four, go ahead. As a matter of science, there's one thing I simply cannot abide. And that is a fraud who pretends to be a fellow man of science. What? Wait, great Scott. Are you suggesting my science is suspect? 
it's just been disproved of this in front of all of us. In other words, the whole demonstration was a complete nonsense from start to finish. Believe me, my fellow jurors, when I tell you that this man is a heel, a bounder, and a fraud. I say the wreckage of that machine should be stripped down and thoroughly examined. No, never. That machine is the essence of my entire hypothesis. It's protected by the Special Dispensation for Scientific Equip Equipment Act. What the devil is that blastodact all about, eh? He made up such a daft rule. Who made up such a daft rule? I don't like the way this seems to be going. Uh, what's the best way for me to help the professor? Um, wait and see. I, I kind of want to just wait and see. Maybe I should watch and wait for the time being. My feeling is that the machine requires a thorough examination. But what about this special dispensation that's been mentioned? Oh gosh, this is all too much. If it's determined that the machine itself was a murder weapon, I think you'll find that the act won't apply. Of course it was a murder weapon. Can't anyone could see that as plain as day. We're all in agreement, are we? That the machine should be stripped. If I don't see do something though. Yoda, good afternoon. Welcome, welcome. I hope you're doing well. Professor Herbrain has yet to perfect his invention. That would seem to be the case, yes. But even so... Even so, what? Going to such trouble and expense to create a fake machine to display in public. He would have absolutely no reason to do such a thing. He had an obvious reason to do exactly that. For the research grant money. Ah. The government was foolish enough to have deemed the man's ridiculous notion plausible. He and his conspirators would have received a handsome sum indeed. Conspirators? What would be the value of such a grant? Ten pounds? You're an order of magnitude out, madam. Five hundred pounds a year. Oh, oh. You couldn't advance someone that much for years? Society's noticed an increase in bogus public demonstrations in the field of science recently. There are plenty of scientists arguing with each other to get the largest slice of the funding cake. People's greed is plenty motive enough for murder, I assure you. No, 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 I haven't deceived anyone. Least of all the government. My hypothesis is sound, the science is sound. Please, you must believe Objection. me. No matter how unbelievable this hypothesis may seem to you, ladies and gentlemen, the fact remains that the victim was transported instantly to the Crystal Tower. Which means that the experiment was a success. Ah, the Baroque. And therefore, the only person who could possibly have committed this murder is the accused. God, we're talking in circles. Ah, Baroque. Where is this heading? I have no idea. My lord, if I may. Yes, Lord Van Zeeks. The prosecution would like to summon new witnesses to the stand. New witnesses? What would be the nature of their involvement? They were spectators of the demonstration at the exhibition, who were occupying special seats. Eyewitnesses? Very well, the court grants the prosecution's request. I should very much like to hear from eyewitnesses to the incident. The prosecution's stance is clear. The experiment was no prestige. The accused killed the financier victim there on the public stage before the very eyes of the spectators. Now, my learned friend... Oh, yes? It's time for you to make your own stance clear. There's clearly a flaw in the professor's hypothesis. I can definitely see that. But where does that leave me? We shall take a short recess now, during which time the prosecution will prepare its new witnesses to take the stand. As you wish, my lord.
Good. In that case, court is adjourned for 20 minutes. Okay. Cool. I think waiting and seeing was fine. I don't think I needed to present anything. I didn't really see an urgency there, so... Mr. Narihodo. Then what on earth were you playing at just now? Or rather... What on earth were you playing at all along? My hypothesis, my amazing hypothesis. You've been picking holes in it from the start. Oh, sorry about that. But you promised me. You, you said you'd prove that dreaded explosion was an accident, not murder. You said you'd keep my precious invention from falling into anyone else's hands. But all you've done so far is try to undermine me. Yes, I did make you a promise, you're right. I said that I'd believe in you and fight for your freedom to the very end. But I also told you I was no scientist. I don't understand your hypothesis. The fact is, there's an undeniable flaw in your logic, isn't there? Ah, but if I just run through some equations... Yes, you see, it's because my work is incomplete. Perhaps it is. Nevertheless, a man died as a consequence, didn't he? Oh. Oh no. You're right. You're so right. It's all my fault. And I have no right to blame you for my failures. I'm a disaster, not just a scientist, but as a... Not as a sci... Not just as a scientist, but as a human being. Well, that might be a little over the top. And while we are on the subject, what about Barok? He's being awful. Claiming his old university friend to be a murderer, you mean? He's a disaster, not just as a prosecutor, but as a human being. Oh, but no, wait. He's the Reaper, isn't he? Perhaps he's not classified as Homo sapiens anymore. Glad that's cleared up. I cannot double check something with you. Oh, uh, yes, what? The machine and demonstration you prepared. They were based entirely on your hypothesis, I presume. There was no trickery involved? I drew the plan for the machine with my very own hands. Every line was painstakingly drawn with the firm belief that the science is that science is the only future. So yes, it's true that my hypothesis hasn't reached maturity yet, but please, Mr. Narahodo, you must believe in it. Alright, Professor, I understand. Council defendant. The prosecution's witnesses are ready to take the stand. Court is about to be in session again. Make your way into the courtroom, please. All hinges on that demonstration. If the professor's hypothesis is as sound as he claims, it leaves him as the only person who could possibly have killed the victim. But on the other hand, Mr. Shams is adamant. Mm. A practical implementation, such as was attempted by the professor at the Great Exhibition, is quite impossible. So really, what should I be trying to prove here? That it was more of a show? That there was something weird going on? That while the experiment was supposed to do something, it did something else. Like the machine was not made by the scientist himself, so we can't trust it, really. Like, why are we not talking about the engineer who actually constructed the damn thing? If the scientist was not involved in creating the, the machine, then how can he be accused of the crime, really? In the name of Her Majesty the Queen, I hereby reconvene the proceedings of this court. Councils for the defense and prosecution, are you ready for the new witnesses to testify? Prosecution is ready, my lord. As is the defense, my lord. So, Lord Van Zeeks, I believe these next witnesses saw the demonstration on the day in question with their own eyes. 
Indeed they did. And as luck would have it, one of them is a police detective. So the testimony we are about to hear can be considered highly reliable. Perfect. Detective, detective of all people. The prosecution stance remains unchanged. Though it had ended in tragedy, the demonstration on the day in question was scientifically sound. And consequently, the sole person with the opportunity to have committed this act of murder is the only other individual. Oh, I keep yachting. To have been present on the stage at the time, the accused. Thank you, counsel. The prosecution's position is clear. Bring forth your witnesses now. Bailiff, show the witnesses in. The witnesses whose proximity to the incident on the day in question will clarify the truth unequivocally. Oh. Oh, it's Tina. Witnesses, state your names and occupations for the court to hear. My name is Balthazar Luna. I am the impresario of all the hot air balloons in the vicinity of the experimental stage. My name is Wil Wilhelm Gottsreich Sigismund Olmsteen. I have come to see the great exhibition all the way from my home in Bohemia. Okay. I am very rich. Okay, <laughs> great. <laughs> Good to know. I don't know if you need to tell us that, but sure. Inspector Gina Lestrade, Scotland Yard. I'm a great detective, even though Luke Sherman's a great. I was on security duty at the ex exhibition and I got to go up in one of them balloons. It was amazing. Gina? Again? But she did mention that she'd seen the disaster from up in the balloon, actually, didn't she? And she clearly loved every minute of it. There were three balloons flying near the public experiment station stage when the incident occurred. Two of the witnesses were in such one such balloon at the time and saw an ev events of unfold from the skies above. You make it sound like they were in the clouds. It was only an altitude of circa 60 feet, very low. Well, you can't see nothing if you fly too high, can you? 60 feet, about 18 meters then? Thank you for your introductions. Now you will give your formal testimony for the court. Kindly describe exactly what you witnessed, especially those of you who had a vantage point above the stage. Okay. It was an incident terrible. Ter terrible. I am only grateful that my balloons were not damaged. There's this huge bang from the stage and then the next second another bang in the sky beside us. And from amidst the smoke, a cage appeared out of nowhere. The cage fell from the sky like a stone and crashed into the crystal tower. I didn't get a good look inside the cage, but no one went near it after it crashed into the tower. A most extraordinary collective account, I must say. Could I just clarify something? There's a detail in the witness's testimony that I've not heard any mention of until now. Specifically that there were two explosions. More precisely, two explosions in two separate places, yes. When the demonstration began, the balloon carrying the two witnesses was around here. There were other balloons in the air nearby at the time, carrying other passengers as well, to be clear. Then, as power was supplied to the machine for the demonstration, the first explosion occurred. The so-called beard cage that contained the victim disappeared from the stage and a moment later... The second explosion occurred directly adjacent to the balloon carrying the witnesses. The bird cage appeared at the site of the explosion, subsequently to plummet down into the crystal tower. I was very surprised. Suddenly, a cage appeared before my eyes with a person inside. 
The blast was so hot, but I didn't want to miss a thing, so I kept my eyes wide. Oh, another balloon, of course. Yeah, yeah. I still have lots of money. <laughs> he has to specify that he has a lot of money. You know, gotta make sure. Precisely, who is this curious infant? I am told he is a young noble of Bohemian royalty. Apparently, he disguised himself in order to steal unnoticed into the Great Exhibition. Yeah, I am here in London on a sightseeing trip with my elementary school. You will have the benefit of a child's point of view in the testimony. Do we really need that? When I remove my mask, this is what I look like. Ah, yes, I see a delightful face, I'm sure. What's with the hat wound, though? Yeah, everybody says so. Great disguise, then. The point is, the testimony of these witnesses further substantiates the facts for the court record. Uh, for the court. Namely, that despite ending in an explosion, instantaneous kinesis was successfully demonstrated. And furthermore, that until the arrival of the police, no one approached the crystal tower where the victim fell. Therefore, only the accused, who was with Mr. Asman on the stage, could possibly have committed the murder. Yes, thank you, counsel. The prosecution's views on the matter are quite clear. So, the defense is cross-examination now, please. Yes, my lord. Okay. It wasn't instant, Teddy, but... Hold it! There were three balloons flying above the experimentation stage at the, sta at the time, I understand. See, si, see, si, all three of them, but my Bellissimi, bon <laughs> Bellissimi Bonbini. They are very popular, Signor. Some people will take pay ten pounds for one ride. Ten pounds? That's more than my annual stipend. Twenty pounds a month, that is my pocket money. Well, of all the luck. I got up there for free, I did. Played the old I work for Her Majesty's police card, you know? Detectives of all the luck. If they're so popular, why would you only be operating such a small number of balloons now? Because I have to be... I have too m if I have too many in disguise, they could crash into each other. The operators for the balloons were decided by lots, which each with each operator manning a particular area. See. Si. And the zone above public experimentation stage is the most profitable. The other impresarios, they hate me. Thank you, witness. I think the court has a clear picture of the arrangements. Okay. Hold it! Two bangs. So he actually saw the accident happen from up in the air. Yep. Ain't it amazing what the detective gets to do, eh? I'm telling you, Oda, being a lawyer is a mugs game. You should join the force and we can go flying together. You know me so well. Yes, well, anyway. Uh, could you tell us exactly what you saw, do you think? Everything. We saw everything because we were up above it at all. Um, that dodgy cove climbing into the cage and that dodgy professor pulling all the levers. And that's when it happened. That's when there was that massive bang and the cage disappeared just like that. You were describing the moment of the subject's body. The, the subject's body was decomposed by the electricity, I believe. I didn't know what to make of it, but then there was another bang right in the air. I looked around and there was a huge great fireball right next to us in the sky. And there was nothing there before. Excuse me! Um, uh, Master Gods, does your memory of the day differ? My teacher at elementary school said that when you meet someone for the first time, you should always use their full name. Ah, uh, yes. Um, what was it again? Wilhelm Gottskreich Sigismund Olmstein. Uh, just the four names then. Uh, the point is, do you have something to say? Something to add in response to Detective Gene Lestrade's last remark, perhaps? Oi, get it right, Odo. It's Inspector Lestrade. 
Why does everyone have a problem with how I address them? But that is not what I saw. Oh? Yeah, there was a second explosion and it was right beside our balloon. That is true. But I am sure... Which is what I said in it. One minute there was nothing there. The next a massive explosion. My teacher at elementary school said that someone... When someone else is speaking, if you are rude enough to interrupt, you will have the most awful life imaginable. Are all Bohemians brought up to be so full of joy? Oh. Another balloon, of course. Well, this guy is getting rich just from being here. Just before the second explosion happened next to a balloon, I clearly witnessed a green balloon flying in the sky. A green balloon? Uh, you what? I never saw nothing like that. Well, I did. I saw it. And you can't say I didn't. I will complain at, to the consul. I will cry and scream. My testimony is the truth. I am a bohemian prince. You cannot say it's a lie that is not allowed. Playing the bleeding royalty card, are you? Typical. Says the orphan who likes to remind people she works for Her Majesty's police. In that case, young man, I must ask that you amend your formal testimony. In the interest of cordial nation, national relations uh, between Great Britain and Bohemia. God. It was not the sky that exploded, it was a green balloon that was next to us at the time. Hold it! Okay, a green balloon, you say? Are you sure about that? Of course I am sure. I am a proud bohemian prince. All these questions are making me boring. I think you mean bored. Ah, English is very annoying. The language of my countrymen is far superior. I guess so, it's very wrong to lie. Lie? Flying balloons never explode. For the same reason the planets never explode, it is logical. Please tell me that doesn't mean logical. If you insult me, you insult all of Bohemia. I'm gonna die. I will have the army come and shoot all of your stupid balloons out of the sky. All of them. Okay then. <laughs> Here you are, your highness. If only all international incidents were so easily resolved. Now that peaceful relations have been restored here in the courtroom, perhaps we could return to the testimony. Did you also see the moment that the cage materialized, Mr. Luna? No, no, I did not see the explosion myself, however... The cage, it fell from the sky like a stone and crashed into the Holy! crystal tower. Okay... Did you see that actually happen? Eh, yeah, no. In reality, I did not. I saw after it hit the tower. There was a grand confusion around the stage. I ran to see what had happened. I was terrorized by the idea that one of my balloons had crashed. I suppose they are his livelihood. But when I looked up to the sky, all my precious balloons were still there. I saw it, though. I saw it slam into the tower, after all. I'm a detective now. Tell us what you saw, Inspector Lestrade. That's what I like to hear. Hold it! I then got a look, good look inside the cage. Okay. Was it you who gave the order to keep people away? Eh? Use your head, Otto. How could it have been me? I was up in the balloon, weren't I? Right. So, because I weren't available, it was the boss who had to leg it over there? He was getting shoved and kicked all over by the panicking spectators as he tried to seal up the scene. It was a real sight to behold, I can tell you. Amazing. Poor Inspector Gregson. So anyway, I couldn't see the cage that well because of all the smoke. And I didn't really want to see, to be honest. I was scared out of my wits. Keep it together, Inspector. Okay. The prosecution really is asserting that the demonstration was genuine. What if it was actually some kind of switch around trick instead? That would mean that the victim was never actually on the stage in the first place. 
The two explosions would have thrown everybody in wa watching into a panic for sure. I think I need to find out more about what exactly people saw at the time. Yeah, so the the green balloon is a big one. Um, Objection! Wait, is it not? No, wait, okay. It wasn't an objection, it was more like... This is part of the balloon, <laughs> you know? Maybe I should save it. Uh, the green balloon that was next to ours. Do we have anything that... Only grateful that my balloons were not damaged. Okay, let me Objection. do that. I knew the cloth had to be important. Mm. It's the moon in your testimony. You said that all three of your of the balloons you had operating at the time were undamaged. See, si, that is correct. If they had been caught in the Esplonius, Esplonius, it would have been terrible. I wonder. You might know what this is. Ah, I think it may be... See, part of a balloon. A burnt off piece of the fabric of the envelope. Sorry? The envelope? Pardon. That is the large round part of the balloon which becomes filled with hot air. It is made from very thick fabric lined with rubber. I do not want it to rip when you are in the sky. Just as I thought. This piece of cloth was found near the experimentation stage. In other words, as Mr. Gotts testified, Master Gotts, the green balloon did indeed explode that day. Uh. If all the balloons in the sky above the experimentation stage belong to you, Mr. Luna, then your statement that they were all undamaged clearly contradicts the evidence. No. The balloon exploded that day. Why didn't the man say so? Maybe everyone on board was killed. No, I was just spent ten old pounds for the experiments. How awful. Seems to me like those things crash 50% of the time. The instantaneous kinesis did occur, but after the explosion on the stage, the point of materialization shifted to a location occupied by a balloon. Causing the balloon to explode. Yes, eminently plausible. An unfortunate trap. Traffic accident, as it were, but it changes nothing about the person and facts. This I cannot accept. Why not, Mr. Luna? You are suggesting that I am lying. That person's died in a balloon incident. No need to get fired up, Mr. Luna. The victim was the sole fatality that day. That's right, and I prove it. But as our Luna is not a liar. There was no such balloon in the sky. It is non possible. Possible. I'm saying it's impossible. Why? This court has more important matters to discuss than the number of balloons that were operating that day. I. Objection! But we can't ignore the fact that nobody appears to have known anything about this other balloon until now. My lord. The defense calls for further testimony from Mr. Luna. I concur. There's clearly more to the truth here than meets the eye. It's imperative that we clear up the issue of this phantom balloon, I feel. 
Witness, you will give supplementary testimony about the balloons you were operating at the exhibition. Oh, cannot see. Okay. Here we go again. Let me, uh... Actually, no. I'll save later. As I said, Balthazar Luna is no liar. Every balloon I had in the sky landed safely. All three of my balloons were carrying passenger. passengers. If they fell to the ground in an explosion, what a catastrophe. When you can't get away from from the fact that a burnt up but that a burnt up piece of cloth was found at the scene, can you coughing? <laughs> I had to figure the voice out again. The cop was at the yard reckoned it was probably some debris thrown from the explosion on the stage. Mr. Pedo Ragazzo is mistaken. My balloons have the red and blue zigzag stripes anyway. Okay. Hmm. So your assertion is that the balloon this child saw was not one belonging to you. See, si, exactamente. If he haven't even saw a balloon in the first place, I do not like the sound of it. It is very bad for business. I have a good mind to sue the land of Bohemia. If you attack us, we will fight back. It will be war. All out war. Well. Another balloon though. Nice. What happened to all out war? Well, we got a balloon. So, war is off. Easy. Mr. Luna certainly doesn't appear to be lying, but that doesn't change the fact that the testimony and evidence are contradictory here. If the defense is unable to find fault with the witness's statements, the court must consider them the truth. Think long and hard on that, my learned friend. The situation has clearly changed now. I have to get to the bottom of what happened here, no matter what it takes. Counsel, you may now cross-examine the witnesses. Witness, because it's only one. No, actually, there's more, but it's mainly one. As I said, Belsa's are known as new life. Okay. You couldn't just have forgotten one, maybe. But if there's only three, surely not. Signor. I might not notice if I was given 100 lentils and one was missing. But we are talking about three enormous balloons. Do you believe I could make a mistake about something so grand and expensive? I took the liberty of having Inspector Gregson check this gentleman's warehouse. I have the report here. It clearly says a total of three balloons. It would appear no mistake has been made then. Surely Miss Lestrade could have been sent for such a menial task. What? Me? I'll tell you what I told the boss. East End kids like me can only count up to two. Obviously that ain't true, but the boss brought it in brought it and said I he'd have to go himself in that case. Oh my god. What a way to get out of it. Oh well, yeah, I can't I can't count over two. Whoops. Guess it, I can't do the work. Hold it! it would be quite a catastrophe if they fell to the ground for any reason, I think. On that note, Mr. Luna, tell me. What is it that keeps these balloons in the sky? Are you an idiot? Sorry? That is like asking, why does a candle burn bright? It burns bright because it burns bright. And the balloon flies because it flies. What else? Uh, that must be Italian for I don't know. There are two types of flying balloons, hot air balloons and gas balloons. Hot air balloons work on the principle of hot air being less dense than cold air, whereas gas balloons derive their lift by using a gas that is lighter than air. See, and my balloons are filled with the magic gas, I believe. Hydrogen. Lighter than air, but highly explosive. Good lord. I do not permit smoking of the cigarettes in any of my balloons. The magic gas does not like fire. Even a small spark of static electricity could cause the entire balloon to explode. 
What is the matter with you, Signor? All that comes out of your mouth is a splunie, or splunie. I tell you, my balloons are perfectly safe. They have to be, or I cannot eat. None of my balloons exploded that day, I'm completely sure. But if you still say that is what happened, you must show me proof. Alright, so Miss Luna had three, three balloons in the air that day. If none of them were damaged, then what was the one that exploded? And that is the question here, isn't it? I was surprised to find the piece of fabric still at the scene, actually. Didn't you search the area surrounding the stage for clues? Nah, I'm not into picking stuff up the off the ground, me. Always works out way better, diving into people's pockets instead. So much for the new career path. Mind you, the boss was on his hands and knees picking up all kinds of rubbish from the floor. Thing is, though, the cage went crashing into the crystal tower, didn't it? So that's where most of the investigating was going on. Even so, I would have thought someone from Scotland Yard would have gathered it up as evidence. Cora, listen to ya. You stumble across a bit of balloon and suddenly you're the best investigator in the world. Pardon? Well, you ain't got a badge, have ya? Like this one? I could arrest you with, it, with this if I wanted to. I wouldn't put it past her. Come to think of it. There was talk of some scorching on the ground at the meeting we had about the investigation. Okay. Hold it! Interesting. There was considerable damage to the stage and surrounding area, wasn't there? Yeah, some of the coves were what were watching the experiment were caught in the blast and injured. Good job the old contraption didn't kill over, eh? I hadn't even considered that. It seems there was a great panic after the incident occurred. Nevertheless, the police shouldn't have missed a torn piece of the envelope from the balloon. Inspector Gretchen can expect repercussions. Likewise, like me swiping all, <laughs> swiping all this fish and chips, eh? The man's sole pleasure. None of this matters. That scrap of balloon envelope means nothing. Niente. This torpedo ragazzo is mistaken. My balloons have the red and blue zigzag stripes anyway. You mean the color is wrong? See, si, senor. I don't have any green balloons in my warehouse. And yet, a piece of green cloth was found at the scene, and it's unmistakably from a balloon. Well, well, I do not know how that can be. For the sake of argument, let's say that a green balloon did explode above the stage. I couldn't therefore conclude that it happened on the day in question. Why not? There have been recreational balloon flights over Hyde Park operating from before the Great Exhibition. One could have exploded on some earlier date, unfortunate as I'm sure you'd agree. You, you believe it may have been from some earlier balloon act accident that predates the exhibition? Si, exactamente. As the signor said, it's not far from... It's not from one of my balloons. Clearly this little ragazzo from Bohemia is mistaken about what he saw. Excuse me! No, he's not mistaken. Something wrong, Master Goss. It's Master William Hot Gottschalk Sigismund Ormstein! It was on the tip of my tongue. Yeah, something is very wrong. I know what I saw. There was a green balloon there. I swear it. I swear all over Bohemia. You can speak as much bad language as you like, but it changes nothing. If you do not have evidence, ragazzo, then I must tell your parents to punish you, eh? Perhaps we'll let the judge decide when it comes to punishments. Evidence? What is this evidence? Give a simple example, young man. A photograph, for instance. Some tangible proof of what you claim. Well, why didn't you say so sooner? I have the photograph here. Good gracious. What? I had not been up in a balloon for a little while, so I was very excited. I took lots and lots of photographs. Of the Crystal Tower, of the Bohemian exhibit, of the streets of London, of the hot, hot eel cellar, the balloon. 
And the instantaneous kinesis experiment? Did you take a picture of that? Yeah, fun picture. Really? We did take one. That's all I wanted was a ride in a balloon. I was not interested in boring experiments. Never mind that. Can you show us the photograph? Of course. And then you will see. You will see that I am not lying. That I really did see a green balloon. That's a great photo. Well, the problem is you can't see that it's green in it because it's, you know, grayscale, but... Well, I see you are all too shocked to speak. Yes, I think shocked is indeed the word, young man. Yeah, perhaps you cannot see that it was a green balloon from this photograph, but... But... But that is not my fault. That is the fault of the stupid person who made that camera. Uh, that is one very bohemian sounding cry. Uh, is that the bohemian cry? Very well, the court will accept this photograph as evidence. It's not my fault. It's the fault of the person who made the camera. Well, never mind. I'm sure you have plenty of wonderful sepia memories to take home with you. In any case, when exactly did you take that photograph? Well, it was on the day of the biggest explosion. Don't say. When I pressed the shutter release, there was this very loud bang, and the hot wind rushed over my face. So that means... This photograph was taken a split second before the explosion occurred? Well, if you ask me, this black and white photograph changes nothing. I could not give the flying fig. Lovely language you've picked up. As I thought, Miss Loon's testimony just doesn't quite add up. The young bohemian boy in claims to have seen another fourth balloon, but Mr. Loon vehemently denies the possibility. And it's hard to imagine the man in charge could be mistaken about the number that were in the air. So there's no one in there. And you can see, what is this, right? There's a streak here. So something is firing at the balloon. You can see the guy over there. The experimentation is happening. All three of my balloons were carrying passengers. Objection. Unfortunately, the photograph Mr. Master Gods took can't tell us the color of the balloon, but it can tell us something else, something crucially important. What? It shows that the pictured balloon wasn't carrying any passengers. Oh, my goodness, you're right. But surely all the balloons would have been carrying passengers. There would be no sense in it otherwise. See, they are for pleasure. For seeing the view, my, my balloons only fly with passengers. Which tells us that the pictured balloon isn't one of them. And when the incident occurred that day, there was a fourth balloon in the skies above the experimentation stage. The mysterious green balloon. I know nothing, niente. I can only tell you one thing. If this balloon was not carrying passengers, then it was not one of mine. Objection! There are illegal tradesmen everywhere you care to look. Clearly one such entrepreneur decided to capitalize on the opportunity presented by the Great Exhibition and managed to operate balloon flights on Mr. Loon's patch without him realizing. See, see. 
The competizione, they're trying to steal my, steal my profits. I did not notice because of the experimental that went wrong on the stage. This fourth balloon exploded at the very same moment Mr. Asmund was beamed from the stage below. Right? So them scraps that fell to the ground after and left them scorch marks? They didn't come from the stage at all? Was bits of the balloon raining down? Because no one was in it, it didn't get no attention. Mysterious fourth balloon carrying no passengers, silently floating over the experimentation Objection. stage. Photograph shows us nothing more. Straight balloon carrying no one operated by some rogue trader. Clearly it has nothing to do with the case. Mm, its relevance does salute me, I must say. Court has seen sufficient evidence and heard ample testimony already. The prosecution calls for this trial to be concluded. Really? Have we really got to the truth yet? No, I can't let this opportunity slip away. The jurors' mind are, minds are already made up, but not in our favour. What else can this photograph tell us? There's more. Objection! Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, wait. Please don't give your decisions yet. The photograph from Master Gods may well be hiding one more vital clue. What's that? A vital clue? Objection! We're well past the point of mere possibilities. It's time for the definitives now. So tell the court. What exactly does this alleged clue in the photograph prove? The cause of the explosion. We can reasonably assume that the pictured balloon was destroyed in the searing heat of the explosion. Yeah, that's right, yeah. It was not my fault. Evidently. Because the birdcage from the Kinesis machine materialized in the sky where it had been flying. And the balloon, being filled with flammable, flammable hydrogen, instantly and explosively ignited. No, that's not what happened. What? It would appear that this photograph requires closer examination. Counsel for the defense, you will highlight the location of this alleged clue in the photograph for the court. Of course, my lord. I thought it was obvious, but sure. Take that! The timing of this photograph can only be described as miraculous. If you look, you'll notice there's a bright white line that appears to point directly at the balloon. Most likely a ray of light caught incidentally on film. I'm afraid I can see nothing of the sort. If you look with the magnifying glass, my lord, it becomes clear what the nature of this bright line really is. Goodness, what is that? Undeniably, some flash of light, yes. Oh, golly, do, do you think it might be lightning? But it couldn't have been a finer day. I believe you may be looking at fire. Bolt of fire and straight for the balloon like an arrow. Indeed, even to my aging eyes, it would appear to be a flame of some sort. My word, are, are you suggesting this flame struck the hydrogen gas that filled the balloon? Objection! That's absurd. The balloon would have been 60 feet above the ground at the time. No flame could possibly have reached such a height. Objection! Actually, it's my opinion that a particular piece of evidence found at the scene reveals how, it, how that is exactly what did happen. I mean, also saying no flame can reach that height when... Well, for one, firearms exist, and two, bows and arrows exist. Arrows that can be lit on fire. It's possible, you know? If such ex evidence exists, Council, then for goodness sake, present it, man. Take that! This was found hidden at the foot of a small ornamental tree near the scene. Good lord, is that a crossbow? An arrow dipped in oil and set alight could have been shot from this weapon. 
sending a flaming arrow straight into the hydrogen-filled balloon. Are you suggesting that crossbow was used to deliberately... Blimey, you're right. The streak of light in the photo looks just like an arrow, doesn't it? Then the explosion of the balloon, it was... Very likely the result of a flaming arrow from this crossbow igniting the hydrogen gas inside it. No. Order, order. Council, this is an extraordinary supposition. If the aim was to cause the balloon to explode, the shooter could have used a gun, of course. However, there is an obvious reason why that would have been out of the question. The noise of the discharge, of course. That's right. By using a crossbow, the projectile could be fired at the balloon silently, well, mostly silently. Well, yeah, if someone had shot a gun in the exhibition ground, it would, would have caused a real panic. But with the big explosion in it, there was a very big panic anyway, no? I don't like this. I should be pleased to have found a plausible new explanation for all this, but something feels Objection. wrong. Do you understand the implications of what you're saying, my Nibonese friend? If a flaming arrow did indeed hit the balloon, then obviously it would have exploded. If the birdcage appeared from the clouds of smoke that ensued... Oh, wait a minute. What are you really saying here? I don't get it. Was was the birdcage beamed up into the sky after all, or, or what? My goodness me. Ah, now we understand. That's what that sinking feeling is about. I think there's a good chance that the birdcage was actually concealed inside the balloon all along. What? Did, did I hear just hear you correctly, Council? There's no going back now. The horse is bolted. Let's assume, as I said, that the birdcage was hidden inside the green balloon from the start. On stage, when the experiment was started, birdcage in the instantaneous kinesis machine disappeared in a cloud of smoke. At that moment, the flaming arrow was fired from the ground, causing the green balloon to explode and drawing the attention of the spectators to the sky above their heads. From amid the smoke, the hidden birdcage then appeared to fall down and crash into the crystal tower. I think you'll all agree it's entirely plausible. That was what I've just described as the real truth behind this myster mi miraculous experiment carried out that day. This, this, I, good grief. Objection! This is ludicrous. What you've described is no science experiment. It's, it's child's play. A contemptible display of stage magic. Both Mr. Sholmes and Iris said that the experiment was a scientific impossibility. In which case, this is the only way to explain what happened that day. And in any case, the victim's body was found inside the birdcage in the crystal tower. If the instantaneous kinesis didn't take place, how do you explain that? Uh, um... If I may put in a word, as a man of magic myself. Such apparent discrepancies can easily be explained by the si some simple deception. Juror number three. All that would be needed is a doppelganger, someone who looked very similar to the victim, Mr. Asman. And having this other man appear on the stage in front of the show as a body double. Ah oh, yes, of course. So in fact... Mr. Asman must have been inside the birdcage that was concealed inside the balloon right from the start. Objection! That balloon would have been filled with hydrogen. Anything hidden inside it would have been scattered to the four winds when it exploded. No one would ever have embarked on such a risky venture. Not necessarily. The explosive force of the balloon gas would very much depend upon the mixture ratio. Fear number four. Flying balloons are rarely filled with pure hydrogen, but a mixture of other gases such as helium as well. Helium on its own doesn't explode, but by controlling the gas mixture ratio, the explosive force can be altered. The mixture ratio? Obviously, the victim's body would have suffered some burns that would be unavoidable. 
but not to such an extent as to render this whole obscene charade impossible. So everything that happened can be explained, logically and scientifically. The explosion that engulfed the stage at the start of the experiment was no accident. It was all part of an elaborate deception, to make it appear that instantaneous kinesis had occurred. Well, goodness me. And if we accept that this is what happened, it means that the victim, Mr. Asman, was never present on the public experimentation stage to begin with. Hmm. In short, he couldn't have been killed by the defendant, who was on stage in full view the entire time. Got him. This will be very hard for the prosecution to counter. Lord Van Zeeks can't credibly maintain that Professor Hairbrain is a suspect now. Mr. Narahodo, I appreciate your efforts. Thank you. Professor? But you can't stop now. Just keep your mouth shut, please. Sorry? What's all this about, Mr. Hairbrain? I, Albert Hairbrain, hereby confess that it, that it was... It was me who stabbed Mr. Odie Asman. Oh no. Really? You're going down with the ship on this? You're like, oh no. I don't want it to be disproven, so I'm just gonna confess to my to the crime, even though it wasn't oh god, it's very bright. Now. I just realized how bright this was. <laughs> we'll just turn it off for now. It was me who stabbed Mr. Odie Asman. Yes, it was me, my faithful friend and partner, Andrew the Screwdriver. What? What are you doing? Order, order. Defendant, explain this sudden confession. Professor Hairbrain, what are you talking about? It's what I've said all along. I must protect my hypothesis and my precious machine. You stand there and claim it was all a trick, an elaborate prank, but where is your proof? No, you'd have to examine the machine if you wanted to prove it, but then it would all be over. My beautiful hypothesis would be laid bare. I mean, the indignity of it. It's clear that you drew the plans for the experiment, but you didn't actually build it. It's quite conceivable that you were duped, Professor. If you just let me, I can prove. Arok. Yes. I'll corroborate. I'll do whatever you say. I swear it. So, so please. Ensure the Special Dispensation for Scientific Equipment Act is adhered to and protect my creation. Oh my god. This guy. Uh, pray forgive the discourtesy of filling my hello chalice at this critical juncture. Here's to my learned Nipponese friend. What? And his upcoming attempt to clarify the defense's position in the light of the accused's co confession. Do you intend to formally assert that the experiment was nothing more than a conjur conjuring trick? Because the moment you do, the Special Dispensation for Scientific Equipment Act that protects the professor's invention will cease to apply. The prosecution will then demand a rigorous examination of the machinery involved in order to establish the truth. However, if you acknowledge that the machine is genuine and instrumental in the victim's murder, any chance of investigating will be crushed, and the confidentiality of the professor's hypothesis preserved. Well, counsel, what is the defense's official position on the matter? Well, Professor Hairbrain, my client, actually asked of me was to prove that the explosion on stage was an accident and protect the secrecy of his hypothesis. But there's no way to do that without implying the professor's guilt. 
Do I protect my client's life by asserting his in innocence, or do I uphold my client's request but see him condemned? Either way, I can't avoid betraying his trust. You've been silent long enough. Isn't talking your trade, my learned friend? Or has all knowledge of English escaped your confused Nipponese's mi Nipponese mind? Mr. Naruto. No escape here. I have to make a choice. But it's an impossible one. I have to give up on something, but what? Well... I'm gonna save. Mm. Conjuring trick. Ah. Uh. No, I can't say it. My client placed his face in me. I can't just let him down. What must I give up on? Not the question you have to ask yourself here. It's what can I protect? Hello again, Mr. Narhodo. It's been far too long. Oh no, we're hallucinating now. Susato-san. But what are you... Oh, we got thrown. Ah, my first Susato takedown in six months. There will be time to talk later, Mr. Narahodo. For now, you must concentrate at the task on the task at hand. Which is working out not what I have to give up on, but what I can protect. Professor Hairbrain. Ah, yes. Yesterday you told me that science is the pursuit of truth. Well, my job is to pursue the truth too. Yes, of course. And personally, I believe that you didn't stab Mr. Asman. I think you've come to realize something yourself too, haven't you? That your experiment and the machine you built with the victim are questionable. The truth behind that is what we must both pursue now. Wow. So, you finally opened your eyes. What? And as for you, Albert, can't ignore this any longer. Uh, having heard my learned friend's assertion, don't you have something to say? Baroque. Lord Van Zeeks. Gosh, I've never heard him speak that way before. In truth, there's one thing. Something I've remembered that's of relevance. What? On the day it happened, just before I began the experiment, I saw a man near the stage. A man holding that crossbow. I beg your pardon. Professor, did the man have any distinguishing features? What did he look like? Uh, tall? Taller than me and... Uh, Thin, thinner than me, with straight hairs, straighter and whiter than mine. Let me see, one less lens than me too, a monocle, a rather stylish black monocle. But one thing in particular will help to positively identify the man. You see, I know him very well. Well, he's the engineer who built my invention. What? He built the machine? That's right. Mr. Asman introduced him to me a year ago. He's he's a man by the name of Enoch Drabber. Enoch Drabber? Does this name mean something? Members of the jury seem flustered. Not the name any scientist wishes to hear. The man's about an abomination. Not the name any conjurer wishes to hear either. Who on earth is he? I'm afraid this isn't the first tale of this nature that I've heard in scientific circles in connection with that name. There's talk of other flamboyant experiments that turn out to be nothing but stage trickery in the end. Obviously, the rascal is after the government's research grant money. 
Even when magicians are in need of money, I have heard of them resorting to this underhand tactics. Some acquaintances of mine with experience of such things have mentioned Enoch Driver's name before. The man is both an engineer and a magician. Yes, we're dealing with an unparalleled confidence trickster here. That's Enoch Driver for you. Okay. So there's a whole nother thing. This is far from over, isn't it? Oh my god. Why are, why are they so complicated? And long. <laughs> so it's true then. My invention, my great machine, it was just a grand illusion. Considering what we've just heard about Mr. Drabber's character, I'm sorry to say that sounds increasingly likely. Even though no one else believed it, I wanted to. I wanted to believe that machine would function exactly as my hypothesis predicted. Which is why we're so opposed to it being investigated, I presume. I knew that if the machine was examined in detail, its construction would give away my hypothesis. Obviously, I didn't want that to happen. But at the same time... I knew that if it was found to be nothing more than a trick, than a work of deception, then everything I'd work towards, all my research, all my dreams, my whole life would be over. I was terrified at the prospect. So you really had no idea then, did you? About the true nature of the machine that was built, and the true nature of Mr. Drabble. I never questioned anything. I didn't want to question it. It's entirely possible that Mr. Asman and Mr. Drabber were working together to use you as a means of fraudulently acquiring the research grant money. Hmm. When I announced my invention to the crowds that day, it was the finest moment of my career. I pulled all the levers and turned all the dials in exactly the way Drever had described. When the smoke suddenly started billowing out, I panicked. I didn't know what was happening. But I really don't know how the whole illusion was made to work. I don't know anything anymore. Aww. Poor guy. Let me confirm one final point with you, Professor. Do you now consent to the prosecution submitting the necessary paperwork to release your invention from the protection afforded by the Special Dispensation for Scientific Equipment Act? Yes, please go ahead. I'm very sorry. It would appear that we shall have to suspend proceedings for the remainder of the day. Lord Van Zeeks. My lord. The court has newly been made aware of another party whose involvement in this matter is critical. Yes, Mr. Trevor. Gather information about the man if possible. I should like him served with a subpoena. With pleasure, my lord. Now, counsel for the defense. Uh, yes, my lord. When we reconvene, I shall be looking for one thing and one thing alone from you. Evidence that the defendant is innocent of the crime for which he is pre presently stands accused. I understand. Good. In that case, this court is adjourned until tomorrow morning. Evidence that he's innocent, huh? Interesting. I thought you needed evidence to convict a man. Not the other way around. Mr. Norohodo. Ah, yes. I'm. 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 I'm so sorry. I was wrong. You were right. I tricked you. Trust me, I dragged you into my mess. Oh, how did, did it ever come to this? I'm so, so, so sorry. Did you really have no idea, Professor? About what Mr. Drabber was really up to, I mean. About what he was really constructing. Naturally. 
That machine was the embodiment of my hypothesis for my hopes and dreams. I had complete faith in it. Alright, in that case I won't say any more. Now sadly the murder accusation against you still stands. So we must do as, as much investigation as we can before the trial resumes tomorrow. Well, thank you for doing so much for me. I mean, of course. And Cesaro is back. I'm so sorry for arriving late this morning, Miss Naruhado. Arriving late? Didn't you receive my postcard? I wanted to let you know when I'd arrive. Postcard? What postcard? I hid it from you, Bruno, so it would be a surprise. Well, did it work? I was surprised alright, especially when she threw me to the ground. Oh dear, I'm so sorry. I, I was just so happy to see you again that it sort of slipped out. Maybe we could stick to a more traditional display of emotion in the future? Susie's train was late into London, Victoria this morning, you see. But we made the coachman really rip the horses hard so she didn't miss the whole trial. I was watching from the gallery for a while, but in the end, I'm afraid I couldn't contain myself. Well, I'm glad you didn't. Oh, having you at my side in court gives me the strength I need to win. So, I'm uh, delighted to see you back in London. Oh, you're too kind, Mr. Narahodo. I'm delighted to be here. I hope I can continue to be of service to you. Uh, of course, so... What's brought you back? Did Professor Mikotoba not protest? Let's save all that conversation for when we're back at home, shall we? You know, I've made one of my most special blends ever for this special occasion. Oh, Iris, how wonderful, I can't fade. Nice. Suzato's back. It's hard to describe how happy that made me feel at the time, but despite my elation, our tale was about to take yet another extraordinary turn. Another one? Not another one. It's too many extraordinary turns all the time. All the confusion. Oh, this room, it's been too long. It hasn't changed in the slightest though. And it's been some six months, hasn't it? That's a long time for things to say so familiar. I didn't know when you might return, and I wanted everything to be as you'd left it. But it has been some six months, it's true. So is your father alright, Susie? What happened? My father? Yes, Professor Mikotoba. I mean, it was half a year ago, but that's why you went back to Japan. Because of the telegram you received saying he'd fallen ill with a high fever for some unknown reason. That's right. So I was surprised to learn you'd be coming back so soon. Surprised, but happy. I think I wrote about it in my letter to you, that it was all a trick. My father is in fine health, and I'm obviously very relieved about that. Well, we're all delighted to have you back. It was quite by accident that I've been able to return to Europe, actually. It's because of a very grand conference called the International Forensic Science Symposium. The International Forensic... That's the same symposium Lord Stronghard mentioned. Anyway, I've arrived safe and sound and all that's mattered. All that matters is that I'm here now. After all, I haven't yet fulfilled my promise to you, Iris. Oh. You must tell us everything that happened while you were back in Japan. Yes, of course, I shall. And there's one other thing. Something you wrote in your letter that particularly grabbed my attention. About, you know who, Kazuma. I, I know, I'll tell you all that I can. Okay. When I first arrived back in Japan, I really thought I'd never be allowed to return to Britain. But curiously, after that awful trial at the Supreme Court, Father's mood changed entirely. That awful trial? 
Oh yes, for the murder of Giselle Brandt. Oh, you dressed as a man then, didn't you, Susie? Oh, well, yes. Since women are forbidden in the courtroom, I had no choice. Wow, amazing. I wish I'd seen it, don't you, Bruno? Um, yes, I suppose so. I want to play at being a lawyer now. I could wear a false moustache, maybe. I don't think any moustache could hide the fact that you're a ten-year-old, Iris. There's something else I've been wanting to ask you, Mrs. Addo. It's about the real reason why Professor Mikotova summoned you back to Japan. You said in your letter it was something to do with the convict's loot we found in Mr. Natsume's lodgings. That's right, the very large dog collar we found with the bee emblem on it. It seems Mr. Natsume included a drawing of the collar in the report he submitted about his time in Britain. I understand that when father saw the report, he turned as white as a sheep. Why would that be then? Father came to Britain himself, of course, to study. It was some time ago now, but he stayed for six years. I can only imagine that something must have happened during that time. But if he refuses to tell me what it was, then I intend to find the answers, answers for myself. And I've decided that I, for one, won't keep any more secrets. Oh, Susie. That's a very meaningful look Susado-san is giving Iris there. Lord Strongheart mentioned something about that symposium too. I think he said that investigative authorities from 40 different countries would attend. Yes, and from Japan, my father and Judge Jigoku have been invited. It's something of an honor, I believe. Well, Professor Migitaba is the leading expert in forensic medicine in our country, after all. But who's the other person you mentioned? A judge, did you say? Yes, His Excellency. Judge Shashiro Jigoku. You've met him, Miss Sonora. Last year in the Supreme Court. You can't possibly have forgotten. Yeah, it's a judge. A terrible trial of yours when you were acu accused of murder. Ah, yes. I try to think of that as a positive turning point in my life these days. What was that judge? If I'm perfectly honest, I'd be happy never to see that man's face again in my life. Oh, well, anyway, as father was invited to the symposium, he agreed to me returning to Britain too. He won't actually arrive until next month, but, well, I couldn't wait. So I pleaded with him, and in the end he agreed to me going out, going on ahead. Yes, about the symposium. It seems as though Lord Strongheart has put in an awful lot of work to make it happen. It's obviously very important. I believe it is, yes. As I understand it, Lord Strongheart organized the entire event himself. I think he's hoping that by achieving exceptional results, he'll get the job of Attorney General. The most senior position in the British justice system. He's hoping to use his power to create the world's finest policing institution. That's what the father said, anyway. Apparently it's Lord Strongheart's life lifelong ambition. Does Professor Mikitoba know Lord Strongheart personally, then? Actually, Lord Strongheart gave me a long speech about this very subject only yesterday. But I sort of lost the will to live early on and didn't really listen to much of it. How trying for you. It was very trying. Giselle Bratz. The woman whose unforgivable actions ended in me being wrongly accused of a crime I didn't commit. The murder of Dr. John H. Wilson. Yes, Giselle Brett. That's a name I won't forget for as long as I live. The extraordinary thing is, though, it seems it's a name we should all forget. Sorry? Since the incident, our government's intelligence services have been investigating Miss Brett. But it turns out that an English woman by the name of Giselle Brett didn't actually exist. Didn't exist? But how can that be? It was a pseudonym. Her real name was Shin. And she wasn't a visiting student either. That was a front. Wait, wasn't Shin one of the names on the list we found from the Morse code? A front? Who, who on earth was she then? Miss A. Shin. Her name is literally all our intelligence services have been 
able to assert about it. Nobody knows why or even how she came to be in Japan. It's a complete mystery, but, but that makes no sense. It's no easy task to be adept, accepted as a foreign student anywhere. What could the woman have been up to? I am afraid I really don't know. The only thing we can be sure of is that she had some business in our country that we don't yet understand. Uh, okay. And now she's been killed, while all the questions surrounding her existence remain unanswered. I'm afraid so. Where is Shin? Who on earth was she? And why do I feel as though I've heard that name before somewhere? Well, because we have. <laughs> What, have you forgotten already? It's only been six months, jeez. <laughs> After my friend Ray's trial, the reporter who actually killed Miss Brad said something very strange. I know the truth. I know you had a hand in what went on. In that visiting student's fate. Nobody here in Japan knows anything about it. They don't know that the guy never made it to England, that he died on that steamship, and that he'll never... Obviously, I couldn't ask him to elaborate at the time, but later I visited the man in his prison cell and asked him what he was going to say about Cosmo somehow. What did you learn? After he died on the voyage to Great Britain, his body should have been unladen at the port of Hong Kong and passed into the care of the consulate staff there. Should have been. Well, it turns out that his body never arrived. It just disappeared. What? Cosmo's body vanished? Our government tried to cover the fact up, it seems. They erected a grave on the cliffs by our hometown. Except Cosmo-sama isn't there. Professor Mikitoba know about this? Yes, it would seem that he did, but he didn't tell me. They're still investigating what happened to Kazuma-sama's body as we speak. Uh, I just don't believe it. What is this acute feeling of apprehension I have all of a sudden? That is very strange. Thinking back now, some of the things that happened on the SS Burya were definitely strange. I mean, after he died, we never saw his body again, did we? Could it be that he actually he's actually alive? Stop it, Mr. Naruto. It's too much to bear. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. Just thinking about the possibility pains me. So very much. Cast your mind back for a moment, Mr. Naruto. When Kazuma Sama was discovered, Mr. Sholmes was there, wasn't he? And he definitely examined the body. I remember it clearly. Ah, you're you're right. So if Kazuma hadn't actually been dead at all, it would mean that Mr. Sholmes had lied to us. But there's no reason why he would possibly have done such a thing. I suppose that's true, yes. The idea that he might still be alive somewhere. He wants to fill me with hope, but I can't let it. Because if it turned out not to be true, then I'd be back at the bottom of that awful pit of despair again. I'm terrified of what that might do to me. Oh, Mrs. Addo. I know she's given the idea the thought it deserves. It's the sort of son we're talking about after all. So I probably shouldn't push it now. Well... I can't move. So what else do we do then? There's nothing else to talk about. It must be about a year now, a year ago now. I wrote a really long story based on some of my father's old notes. It's about one of Hurley's great, greatest exploits. I called it the Hound of the Baskervilles. But then Mr. Sholmes forbade you from publishing it. 
and put the manuscript somewhere nobody could get their hands on it. So nobody knows anything about it, apart from Hurdy and I. But for some reason, you knew the title of it, didn't you, Susie? Oh, it sounds so exciting, The Hound of the Baskervilles. I should love to read it. And you wouldn't tell me how you'd come to know it. Yes, but I made you a promise that I would explain one day, didn't I? I think it's time. Oh. Okay. I'm only sorry I've had to keep it for you from you for so long, Iris. It was completely by accident that I came to know the title of your manuscript. It was a short while before we left Japan. I was cleaning father's study and I saw something on his writing desk. A large box of papers. There was a label affixed to the box that was written in English. It read, The Hound of the Baskervilles. What? My Baskerville story? Of course, I had no idea what it was at the time, but father came in and... Susato, what are you doing? Oh, father. Did you look at those papers? No, I simply read the label, that's all. Well, put it out of your mind. Sorry? Forget that you ever saw it, and certainly don't tell anybody else about this. You understand? Why is everyone so adamant about, like, names of things and everything just keep being kept under rugs and not being told to others? Secrets are such a pain. Why is everyone always so secretive? Hmm. What was Iris's manuscript doing in Japan? I have no idea. But when I heard Iris mention the word Baskerville that day, the title just slipped out. I would never have guessed. But there was an unpublished account of one of Mr. Sholmes's exploits. When I returned to Japan, I asked father to explain, but he refused to answer any of my questions, and there was no sign of the big box in his office. That's really all I know about it. I have no doubt that father has a very good reason for being so secretive about it, but still... I made up my mind to explain myself to both of you. Well, thank you for being so honest, Susie. Okay. So, Mr. Norihodo, I'm ready to start investigating if you are. I've committed every detail about the case to memory. And Iris has told me about the disturbing hap happenings at the Waxwork Museum as well. So you're fully abreast of the situation already, Mrs. Sato. I'd expected nothing less, to be honest. I would think our first port of call should be to investigate Mr. Grabber, the engineer responsible for building the elaborate machine that was used to effect this extraordinary trick. Yes, a conjurer of sorts, by the sound of it. Well known in the fields of science and magic. Then we need to go and arrest him. Well, yes. He must know the truth behind this case, so I agree. We really need to find the man. Hmm, that sounds like it's a case of tracking someone down. Which is the, a job for the police, or a great detective. Are we supposed to guess who she might be thinking of? We don't have much time, so we need to get started straight away, I think. Good idea. Well, best of luck then. Oh. You're not coming today? I'm going to Brixton Road shortly for the herb market. But let me know later how you got on, okay? Won't you? That was a little abrupt. The pull of the herb market must be strong. Very strong. Can't go there. Mm. Let's 
talk first. Do you know? I honestly thought I might never have the opportunity to return to Great Britain. And certainly not so soon. It's funny. For the past six months, I haven't been able to work in court. Meanwhile, you've been raising a storm in the Supreme Court of Judicature back in Japan. Please, Mr. Narihodo, I may have been dressed as a man, but it was a very reserved performance. So what your father said in his letter about the Ryotaro takedown is reserved? Well, anyway, I am back here in this great capital now, and ready to assist you again. In any way I can. Thank you, Mrs. Zada. It's my pleasure, Mr. Narihodo. Okay, well, that didn't explain what to do at all. I guess we just go to... Madame to Spells. Oh my, no wonder it's called the House of Horrors. I'd like to turn on my heels and go straight home if I had a confectionery. Being scared makes you crave sweets? I can understand that. I was looking forward to a reunion after six months away, but... There's no signs of Mr. Sholmes anywhere. That's strange. I should be here investigating the abduction of the Wax waxwork. Oh well, I suppose we'll just have to come again later. side of the curtain you just know it's going to be terrifying don't you the sign says it's madame to spell special exhibit it seems you have to pay extra to go inside i know can you believe that pay more money as if we haven't been scared enough already it's not my doing mr narihodo the room the old policeman isn't here now obviously i still can't believe you just happened to be on the jury though I'd understood that London has a population of 6 million people, and yet you do seem to run into the same people disproportionately often, don't you? This is true. Just Jack the Ripper? This one's posture reveals his weakness. Sorry? Killer stands leaves him wide open to attack. I'm quite sure I could see him off. With a Suzado takedown, then a Suzado squash, and then finally a Suzado smash. Right. And if that doesn't render the culprit unconscious, a Suzado slam should finish him. Uh, Suzado slam? Oh, I'm sorry, it's rather hard to explain. Leave yourself open slightly and I'll demonstrate. Absolutely not. Does it not say who this is? Ah, there's a stepladder there, look. Oh, yes, a stepladder. I think perhaps we should let the proprietors know that someone left it out. The stepladder, I mean. Is something wrong? Why do I feel as though I just managed to sidestep an argument? I don't know. Very strange. Please do not touch the statues. You know what, fine. I'm, I'm just gonna move. Experimentation stage. Ah, oh, Gina. It's a doggo. I had no idea there were so many people in the world. I know what you mean. It's really packed here today. It feels as though it's taken us two hours just to make our way through the crowds at this point to this point as it i shook my brain down so i didn't really notice to be honest i do wish i had your absence of mind sometimes mr narvaro there you are i had a feeling you lot would show your mugs before long oh no never mind it wasn't gina it was gregson oh inspector gregson i see you your hard at work as usual Warm greetings to you. I do hope you've been keeping well since last we met. What's with all the ceremony? We just saw each other in court this morning. Not you, sunshine, the gentlewoman so loyally at your side. Oh. Why, thank you, Inspector. How good of you to notice. 
He might be a bit rough around the edges, but he's still a proper Englishman at heart, I suppose. As you've probably guessed, we were hoping to investigate the scene some more. Right, well, that's the young trainee's domain. Oi, get over here, Gina. Oh, go go. She seems to be busy playing with a puppy. Probably giving it a traditional East End training. Gina, she's a poli police officer now. Amazing, isn't it? Let her play, yeah. Let her have the doggo. I, but I want to play with the doggo too, Aura. Because we want to see more of the doggo. He's a good kid, actually. Heart's in the right place, anyway. He's got the detection bug, if you ask me. Yep, I think she'll follow in my footsteps nicely. What do you mean? I'm being transferred. It's time for me to say Toulouse to London. Oh. Really? That's a bit sudden, isn't it? I had no idea. Where are you going to be posted then? I'll come to see how you're getting along. Ah, not likely. But you're welcome to try. If you don't mind a trip to France, that is. Oh no. Going to France. So long as the good pub gets playtime, yes. You call it a graveyard? Nice. Graveyard? Very good. I mean, I see it. I see. Very, uh, very apt. Seeing a doggo, catching a doggo, makes sense. To France? I'll be working in the Paris police prefecture. Should be right up my alley. But, but France, it's an entirely different country. I don't understand. Why would you be sent there? That's the way the other work world works, sunshine. Now don't go poking your nose in where it's not wanted. I'm intending to take the kid with me when I go. What? You're taking Gina to Paris? Well, I can't leave her here in London. Who knows what become of her? I suppose he's worried she'd slip back into slipping her hands into people's pockets and purses. I don't think he's worried about a pickpocketing, Mr. Norihodo. I think he's worried about the Reaper. Oh, of course. So that's playing at Inspector Gregson's mind too, is it? Anyway, I haven't mentioned any of this to Gina. So don't go babbling, you hear me? No, of course not. I've got to keep that diving diva safe and sound. Until all this is over, at least. Oi, did you just call me a bloomin' di diving diva again? So you heard that, did you? Right, well, any questions about the scene, you can put them to my capable detective diva here. Alright, you heard the boss. Inspector Lestrade's taken the is in charge here now. I suppose I'd better keep my word and not mention anything about Paris. It's, uh, Gina, you've got a new dog, have you? Oh, isn't he great? Toby's his name? It's a good name. Oh, how delightful. He's absolutely adorable. Yes, the dog does seem lovely. But it's the not-so-lovely Inspector Gregson that's playing on my mind, to be honest. Oh, where's the dog? I want to see more of the dog. Where'd he go? Toby is now Grievart's name, nice. I mean, I, this investigating the scene, talking about the trial, or talking about the dog, I feel like dog is most important, right? Where did you find that little mud then, Gina? Wow, don't call it a mud. Oi, don't be so flaming rude, Otto. Like a reaction, don't you think? He ain't no mud, all right. Toby's, how did they put it? Oh yeah, a bona fide detective. Aw, detective doggo. Nice. Sorry? 
I've given him a proper title and everything. It's Chief Inspector Toby to you. More senior than Inspector Gregson, is he? Oh, so he's a police dog, is he? The police recruits dogs now? I've heard that they're, they're already being used officially in Germany as part of the city policing. They're used for chasing at criminals and such like. They have a wonderful sense of smell after all. I have a fairly good sense of smell, smell myself as it happens. I can tell undergarments that have been freshly laundered from undergarments that haven't. Right. I don't think... I don't think that's that accident, really. Um... <clears throat> It's nothing compared to this fellow, though. Really? According to what the boss said, once Toby's here got a good whiff of your drawers, he could chase the scent to the other side of the world. Oh my god. What? T to the other side of the world? You mean he can swim? Mr. Narhodo, I think you may have missed the point by rather wide margin. I just can't believe this little dog has such an incredible skill. I'm telling you, Odo, there's going to be more and more dogs doing their bit for the police in the future. Oh, really? That's just for the best, right? Dogs are great. Yes, I agree. Right, one of these days they'll be barking orders at us, lot, not the other way around. Oh dear. Sorry, Gina. I don't think I agree with your vision quite that much. Well, anyway, whatever you think about that, Toby's he Toby here is Britain's first police dog. I found him down the east end the other day. Someone had just chucked him out on the street. There you go, I knew she'd lifted him from somewhere. Oh, Tina, you're such a kind-hearted soul, aren't you? The children and the animals. Oh. Um, Gina. We were actually hoping that we could investigate the scene again. Yeah, alright. If it's around here, you can do what you like. Oh, that's alright, is it? I'm gonna be playing with my new friend here. Nice. Got our priorities straight, that's for sure. Investigate crime scene or play with Doggo? Of course, play with Doggo is, is always first. Oof. Work. The machine that exploded must be at the top of those stairs, I presume. I haven't actually seen it yet, so if you don't mind. Sorry you can't go up there, Suze. Oh. It's like I told Odo yesterday. Even I ain't allowed near that rack. What's it called again? The reason we ain't supposed to touch it? The special... Special Dispensation for Scientific Equipment Act. Is that what you were thinking of? That's the one. That's why only them lot are allowed to investigate it. What do they call it again? The forensic something? The forensic investigation team. Is that what you were thinking of? That's the one, yeah. But isn't it the case that the special dispensation has been lifted? I think so. Don't really get it to be truthful with you. I'm still supposed to get permission from some big wig or, or other, as far as I know. What was his name again? Lord Strange something? I'm not sure that's quite right, Gina. I think you mean Lord, Lord Strongheart, perhaps. That's the one, yeah. Apparently he's always watching the time or something. But without Lord Strongheart's express permission, we can't investigate on the stage. Okay. It was great, weren't it? I had the right laugh, it was a new new one on me that, you know, being in court and not spending the whole time worrying about, I'm about to find out, he found out. You did keep an awful lot of secrets in all your previous court appearances, didn't you? Yeah, and all those made things hard for me every single time and all. Just doing my job, Gina. But watching someone else get it in the neck is a lot of fun, actually. It was amazing when you showed that dodgy professor's dodgy experiment was a total fix. The dodgy professor, as you put it, Gina, is Mr. Narhodo's client. 
Yes, I'm starting to wish he wasn't, though. Who's the boss I feel sorry for? Sent off to do the impossible? What do you mean? He's supposed to arrest that other cove, ain't he? And in time for tomorrow and all? You know the dodgy engineer? What's his name again? Mr. Drabber. Enoch Drabber. That's the one, yeah? So the police are looking for this mysterious man with the black monocle. I guess they would be. It's putting too much on the boss, if you ask me. It's give he says it's, it's giving him a gut take. Oh dear. But I do wonder if that isn't actually from all the fried food. Possibly, but... Maybe not. Who knows? So, Scotland Yard are trying to track down Mr. Enoch Drapper. I wonder if they've had any luck. He's really funny looking. Got two eyes that don't match. Stole a glimpse of a picture of him earlier. I mean, I didn't actually pinch it or nothing. The old devil's got it. Sorry, who? You know, the Scowling Reaper was always glugging down glasses of the blood rag plunk. Ah, Lord Van Zeeks. He's always added in for me, that cove. Don't know what she's always scowling about, mind. Probably, probably would have been a pretty good boss as it goes. You'd rather be the Reaper's apprentice than a detective's trainee. The way I see it, if the choice is between a chip gizzling detective and a chalice guggling demigod, you're equally badly off with both. I suppose you're right. I hadn't thought of it like that. Glad we've put that one to bed. <laughs> anyway, the point is, everyone at the yard's dead set on finding the fishy engineer, but there don't seem to be no clues to go on, so they're stuck. There's nothing that can lead us to Drabber at all. Yeah, that seems unlikely. Here's the scorching on the ground that you mentioned. Yes, and there's what's left of the green balloon's envelope. All clear evidence of the balloon that exploded on the day, day of the incident. Poor Professor Hairbrain. I do feel sorry for him that his dreams have been shattered like this. Someone's well and truly burst his bubble as it were. <laughs> Ouch, I'm a bad person. Yeah, that, I mean, that was a pretty bad thing to say, to be honest. Mm. And the bird cage, cage crashed in the most prominent position possible. It's the guts giving us a warning, if you ask me. Man must travel under his own steam and not cut corners with instantaneous kinesis. But imagine what might have happened if the birdcage had landed in a slightly different location. The death toll could have been far worse. So I think perhaps it was a blessing in disguise. Well, the gods are benevolent, obviously. I did say it was just a warning. Man must travel under his own steam, or next time birdcages will rain down on all of you. Your faith is much stronger than I realized. Well, how much do you- how do you think I'd pass the entrance exam for you, my university? It wasn't by studying alone. I mean, I feel like studying was the main part of it, though. Oh, who's that? Who's that standing beside Lord Strongheart? I wonder... I've never seen her before. Mm. Ah, the young champion of the court. You had some success this morning, I understand. And you've thrown the entire government into disarray as a result. Oh. You mean because of Professor Herbrain's experiment? Sham science being demonstrated at London's Great Exhibition. The country's been made to look foolish. And now politicians are scrabbling to respond. Lord Van Zeeks is in Whitehall as we speak, giving an emergency briefing. Oh dear, I am. Um, didn't mean to cause any trouble. None of this is your responsibility. The government is entirely to blame for having been taken in. The special dispensation that prevents investigation at the scene will be annulled later today. 
Once that happens, my forensic investigation team will move in and deal with that scrap metal in no time. It's scrap metal now, is it? Until later, then, Lord Strongheart. Yes, thank you. Who was that? Can we ask him? Um, who was that? Okay, we, we ask immediately. That was Dr. Courtney Sith, Scotland Yard's esteemed chief coroner. Oh, that's the name on the, on the report. On the autopsy report. The coroner, yeah. She's leading the forensic investigation team's handling of this case. She was just delivering her report about the victim, in fact. Oh, I see. I guess I'm a green. Your boss, literally. Definitely. <laughs> I hope you're doing well. Following the outcome of the trial earlier, I asked the coroner's office to reevaluate its findings. I don't have time to tell you what she concluded. If you want to know, you'll have to ask her directly. You can find her in the forensics laboratory. Oh, right. Now, what were you here to see me about? I can give you 7 minutes and 39 seconds of my time. But he's not running quite so spectacularly late anymore. Okay, let's talk about the team. What exactly is the forensic investigation team that you mentioned before? The British Empire's police force must become the most exemplary in the world. For that to happen, it's imperative that we embrace forensic science and everything it has to offer. I first created the forensic investigation team a year ago now, unofficially of course, to pave the way. Goodness, a year ago? At next month's symposium, I intend to present the results of their work to the world. Once I do that, the House of Lords will be powerless to oppose the creation of a full-scale forensic division. And once that happens, the position of Attorney General will be mine, and criminals will suffer dearly. What do you mean? For too long, those scoundrels have made a mockery of our legal system with false evidence and bribes. But London scum is about to be rounded up and burned to the fires of hell. I intend to see to it, personally. By creating the finest police force the world has ever, ever known, to protect our honor and our future. Look at those eyes. It means every word. Dr. Sires is an extremely reliable coroner. When I officially establish the forensic division at Scotland Yard, she will run it as my right-hand woman. Now then, speaking of the symposium, Ms. Mikotoba. Oh, yes, my lord. Your father should be on the high seas as we speak, making his way here to represent the Empire of Japan. Yes, that's right. I understand he will arrive at the beginning of next month. Are you acquainted, Lord Strongheart? With Professor Mikotoba, I mean. It was many years ago now, yes. But yes, I remember Dr. Mikotoba very well. Okay. Glad you caught this point of the game. The story is a riot and a half from this case onwards. I can imagine there's a lot of weird stuff going on and it's all leading towards something and I don't know what quite yet. Like, what is everything leading towards? We'll find out together. My memory serves, it was some 15 years ago now that your father came to Britain as a visiting student. It was the year I was born, so yes, 16 years ago in fact. Mikotoba was a young practitioner of forensic science, and Jigoku accompanied him as a young promising judge. The punctiliousness and politeness of the Japanese at the time impressed us greatly. Punctilicious. Punctilicious. I can't even talk, say that word. God. Punctiliciousness. What? It's a weird word, but sure. Punctuality is like what he means, I ima imagine, but. 
Not that I wish to imply impoliteness or carelessness on your part in any way. I don't think that you were. Dr. Mikotova studied forensics at one of London's largest hospitals. St. Sinners, if I'm not mistaken. If the site was also there then, as it happens. Then, Dr. Sight knows my father, does she? She was a young medical assistant at the time, so I doubt their paths cross regularly. But I've no doubt they knew each other superficially. After all, Dr. Mikotova was here studying his subject for some six years in total. Six years? That's a long time to be studying abroad, isn't it? I lived with my grandmother in those years. So he left his newly born daughter behind and went overseas for six whole years? It was a rather turbulent time at home. Oh. Perhaps father wanted a reason to get away. What do you mean? Why? Well, clearly something was going on at the time. Let's not talk about it too much right now. I wanted to ask you about Lord Van Zeeks, actually. I heard that his older brother was killed some years ago by a mass murderer known as, known as the Professor, who targeted nobles and royalty, is that right? You Japanese are a thorough lot. You've done your research well. Yes. And you could say it was that very incident that gave rise to the Reaper. What? Why? When his brother, Clint Van Zeeks, was murdered, it was just after young Barrack had graduated from the University of London and became a prosecutor. When obvious criminals who managed to evade conviction in court started disappearing, rumours quickly spread throughout the capital. Londoners started to say that whenever, wherever Barrack Van Zeeks went, the ghost of his dead brother wasn't far behind. Oh my word, so Lord Van, so Lord Van Zeeks isn't the Reaper, it's the ghost of his brother? Ever since that time, he became a very aloof figure in London's legal circles. Oh yes, Lord Strongheart. Go ahead. It's about Professor Harebrain's experimental machine. We'd like your permission to exp examine the remains if possible. Are you well versed in science? Not in the slightest. In fact, you could say I was barely aware of the subject at all until recently. Well, the special dispensation legally preventing investigation of the machine is currently being annulled. Within a few hours, Dr. Sy's team of forensic experts will begin their own investigation. But I suppose until then, there's no harm in you looking at the wreckage. As long as you touch nothing. Thank you. Being able to look at it is better than nothing. And I'll be able to see it too. Your time is up. You'll have to excuse me now, I'm afraid. My next engagement calls. We are extremely sorry to have troubled you when you are so busy, my lord. I have important matters to attend to in preparation for the symposium, you understand? Yeah. It's fine. Imagine getting fresh out of the stress of this law school and then your brother is murdered. Yeah, that is pretty bad. Quite bad. And then people start dying after, even after they're acquitted in every case that you prosecute. And then your brother's ghost gets blamed, which is even weirder, I feel like. Anyway, forensics lab. I believe this is it, Dr. Sy's laboratory. That chemical smell really assaults the nose, and there's plenty of uh, plenty to assault the eyes in here too. It looks as though the doctor isn't here, but we're here now, so we may as well do some sightseeing, don't you think? What a seasoned tourist you've become, Mrs. Addo. We could just have a little look around, being careful not to upset any restless souls. I mean, I guess we can look around. Yep. 
You're zero percent surprised that he's not a very warm guy. Well, yeah, considering all that, yeah, makes complete sense that he isn't very open and, well, generally cold around others. A table and a set of sharp tools. When you consider each in isolation, it all looks quite innocent. So why is it that when you put them side by side, they seem so horribly disturbing? It might be best not to ponder it too deeply. Seeing the large tome that's open on the desk does make me wonder, though. How can anybody concentrate on bookwork with this acrid odor of chemicals in the air? You'd either have to have cast iron constitution or a really terrible sense of smell. What's in the jars? Suppose they're fruit liquors or something. Mm, I doubt it. Or like the pickled ume bushy, bushy plums we make at home. No. Ah, father had jars like that in his laboratory as well. I expect the human organs in the preserving solution. Probably as examples of some rare medical condition. Mrs. Cesado, there are some things in the world that it's perfectly fine never to know about, ever. Oh. So as I said, I'm pretty sure they're fruit liquors or umeboshi, aren't they? Of course. <laughs> God. He really doesn't like the idea, does he? It's not that bad. He's coping. Copium. So much copium. Oh, look at this. Well, the magnificent display case. The cherry wood has been polished to a high sheen and the intricate carving is a joy to behold. Western cabinet makers really are very skilled, aren't they? You have nothing to say about the skeleton inside, Mr. Norahodo. Mrs. Zato, can't you tell that I'm trying very hard to avoid talking about the terrifying contents of the case? It's how I cope. <laughs> He's just coping. So much coping. I'll be sure to remember that from now on. <laughs> He's like, ah, yes, the cabinet. This is exquisite craftsmanship. It's so good. He literally said it, yeah. He's coping. Look at all the bottles on the shelves in these cabinets. What an assortment of chemicals. These ones here are labeled highly toxic. Ugh, that's worrying, because there's also things that look like salt and pepper shakers in there. Oh yes, and they actually say salt and pepper on them. The doctor probably spends a lot of time in this room, I suppose. Perhaps she has meals here sometimes. Life goes on, even when you're surrounded by death. Well, as long as you don't grab the wrong thing, I guess, right? Oops, I accidentally put deadly toxins in my food instead of salt. <laughs> Guess I'll die. Look at this big thick book here. It appears to be an accounting ledger. It's a record of the forensic investigation team spending, I think. Oh, what is it? It's clear that the team purchases various, various equipment and supplies on a monthly basis, but... Well, one entry seems rather strange. In what way? They're buying 500 scalpels every month. Five... 500? They must be working really hard on dissecting corpses. I don't know. Judicial autop autopsies are only carried out in certain special circumstances. And scalpel blades can be sharpened too. It does seem a bit strange. You're right. 500 scalpels a month. What could they possibly be using all of them for? Yeah, what, that's... how many scalpels a day? That's like... what, 14 a day? How the hell do you use 14 scalpels a day? What are you doing? Ah. Sorry, we um we had something we wanted to ask you, but you weren't here, so... So you thought you'd slip around? 
That's acceptable to the, you people from the east, is it? Well, what do you want? Uh, um, Lord Strongheart told us, you see, that it was you who examined the victim's body. Uh, Mr. Asmund's body, I mean. So we came to ask you about your findings, on Lord Strongheart's advice. Very well. If the Lord Chief Justice has given you his consent, I'll tell you what our investigation revealed. But when we're done, you must leave immediately. Okay. That sounds fine. So, we want to know what the forensic investigation team determined from its examination of the scene. Uh, the victim, Mr. Odie Asman, who disappeared from the experimentation stage amidst an explosion, and the Mr. Asman, who appeared moments later partway up the Crystal Tower, were without question one and the same person. That is the team's conclusion. But that can't be right. If it was an elaborate trick, we can only speculate about how it was carried out. Let's see, if two people who looked very similar to each other were involved, they could have made it appear as if one single person had switched places, couldn't they? Very true, but sadly in this instance that was not the case. The man who disappeared and the man who sub subsequently reappeared was the same person. The fingerprints at the scene make that quite evident. Ah, fingerprints. They're not yet officially recognized as forensic evidence in the British justice system, but one day they will be used as an investigative aid as a matter of course. Oh my, but that would mean that the instantaneous kinesis actually took place. So, where does that leave us? My team was tasked with investigating, not drawing conclusions. Fair. Instantaneous kinesis is possible, and yet the body did move from one place to the other. This hasn't cleared anything up at all. It's made the whole thing even more of a mystery. Oh. Uh. Okay. <laughs> Mama, what is this? Uh, where did she spring from? And did she just call the doctor Mama? This is a lawyer, dear. Oh. Um, hello. Nice to meet you. Pleased to meet you. I'm a defense lawyer. Rinosuke Nara. Mama? Yes. Can I cut this one up? What? Ah. Uh, I've never seen inside an Eastern person before. I want to know what it looks like. Of course you can't. It's a live specimen, as you can very well see. Mm hmm. Boring. Well then. <laughs> Someone needs to touch grass, yeah. I, I think I just had a near-death experience. Oh dear, Mr. Narihoto, you're as pale as a corpse. And let's leave before I'm mistaken for one. Yeah, we probably want to leave. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna leave. I'm just gonna leave. Um, back to ex experimentation stage. Oi, that's off limits up there. Try to sneak past me again and I'll stuff your gob full of the boss's fish and, and chips. Yes, please, I love fish and chips. Wait, I have permission though. I have permission. Ah, okay. We need to talk first. <laughs> um, Gina, we were actually hoping that we could investigate the scene again. Yeah, alright. If it's around here, you can do what you like. Oh, that's all right, is it? I'm gonna be playing with my f new friend here. Oh, that go. The machine that exploded must be at the top of these stairs, I presume. Blah. 
can't go up there. Even I am allowed near that rack. Special dispensation for scientists. Yeah, th this is the same conversation. But we have permission. Right. Actually, we've just recently been to see Lord Strongheart. Why, why did we have to do the entire conversation again? Just to get the same... To the new part, you know? Seems a bit excessive to have to do that again. Hmm. We've just been to see Lord Strongheart. Eh? You what? You've met him? Last time the boss was called to go and see him. He waited for three hours at the cop's office and came back sniveling. Tragic. Well, Lord Strongheart has given us permission to examine the scene as long as we don't touch anything. Dialogue tree is a bit, a bit wonky. I don't know how the issue got through with the final game. Yeah, I don't know. Some parts are so, like... like it just makes the game longer, you know? Like, people saying the same thing twice and things like that. It's a bit of a shame, because otherwise it's a great story and game, but it can be a bit lengthy because of that. Oh yeah? Honestly. Alright then, go ahead. But if it turns out you're lying, it'll be the boss who gets it. He'll never eat another chip again in his life. So, you're still saying all this is above board, are you? I'm sure everything will be fine. That really would be tragic. Needs more flags for the dialogue and for the examination of evidence. Yeah. Because otherwise they keep being like, well, I don't know why this is the case. And it's like, well, you do though. We literally just did this. <laughs> It's happened multiple times. And it's like, are you stupid? <laughs> are you stupid, Narahodo? Did you forget what happened five minutes ago? Alright then, then, then them the stairs, off you go. Ah, oh, thank you, Gina. Okay, there we go. Now we can go. Oh my, so this is the machine. That was used to deceive people into thinking instantaneous kinesis had taken place. Yes, that's right. Or rather, it was the machine. It's a little worse for wear at the moment. And what extraordinary lengths Professor Hairbrain went to in order to obtain the research grant? No, 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 the professor was tricked as well. He didn't know anything about it. Yes, of course. It it is amazing though, isn't it? The scale of the whole affair is so very British. You're right about that. You'd never see such a grand deception in Japan, that's for sure. Oh look, is that... Lord Van Zeek? Okay. Why is the... Why is the birdcage here? That was in the tower, wasn't it? Lord Van Zeeks. So, I think we're more or less done here, aren't we? Let's, shall we, Mrs. Otto? Already? He is the Reaper, remember? We do well to keep our distance, I think. But we have permission to be here, from the top. We're perfectly well allowed to investigate this machine, as long as we don't touch anything. From the top? Do you mean Lord Strongheart? Exactly. So we can stay here and share, stare at this wreckage for as long as we like. She could have been at the center of the explosion here and it wouldn't have bent her steel wheel. I mean, I want to talk to him, actually. Uh, least approachable man in the world, winner 10 years in a row. Be strong, Narihodo. Your country and your assistants stand firm behind you. Um... Lord Van Zeeks?
What? Um, well... Beautiful weather we're having, isn't it? I thought I was making it quite clear that I didn't want to be disturbed. Apparently, Nepanese are unequipped to read the signs. Oh, I read them. I read them all right. So, what are you doing here? Entry to this area is prohibited. Uh, well, the thing is... Lord Chief Justice Strongheart granted us permission to investigate. On the condition that we didn't disturb anything. And yet, you've managed to disturb me. Ah. Uh, never mind. State your business, then. Come to think of it, there are quite a few things I'd like to ask Lord Winsix about. Not least of all, uh, of which is that awful case, even though it's nothing to do with this. Ask away, Mr. Narahodo. You won't know unless you try. Oh, God. So about your, uh, your dead brother, uh... <laughs> let's, uh, let's start talking about Enoch first and not immediately go into, like, the deep end. Are the police trying to locate the engineer, Mr. Drabber, already? Surely that goes without saying. We're very keen to see him found as well. The trouble is, we don't have much to go on aside from the description of the man we heard in court earlier. Which, according to Professor Hirebrain, was of a tall, thin gentleman who has straight white hair and wears a black monocle. So I was just wondering. I mean, I realize it's probably not possible, but... We'd very much appreciate any more clues you can give us. Wow, Cesaro-san really knows how to take the bull by the horns. <clears throat> Fine, why not? I have a photograph of the man here from an investigation ten years ago. Oh. Though it appears he already had a black monocle at the time. Fancy. <laughs> I think you, you... Did you mean to do Pokemon aura? Were you doing the like up arrow thing to get your message? I mean, you could also just be what, what the fucking again. That's also fine, but yeah. <laughs> it's like, did you mean this guy? Like, uh, so surprised by him, his appearance, you know? Yeah. He looks very fancy, though. It appears he had a, he already had that black monocle at the time. What? Uh, oh, nothing. I, I was just surprised that you shared that with us. We all need the man's testimony in court tomorrow, which means we have to do everything we possibly can to track him down in the short time available. So why wouldn't I show you the photograph? That is true. What is the bad Lord Van Zeeks? Sometimes I just can't work him out at all. So he has like a plus on his collar, or not collar, like a, like pins. Don't know what that means. Not as big of an asshole as you could have been a word, yeah. I mean, he's good at heart, I want to say. Okay, this is gonna be interesting. Um. Oh god, immediately name dropping Ryanosuke. Oh no. <laughs> so, Clint. Clint. <laughs> right? You know the name, right? <laughs> uh. Oh god. <laughs> the worst possible way to begin the inquiry, yeah. Was the name of your older brother, I understand, Lord Van Zeeks. 
You Nipponese. I always have to be a god whenever you're around. <laughs> so, you've been investigating me, have you? Oh, no, no, it's not like that. Well, alright, it's a bit like that. My older brother was also a prosecutor. He was the pride of the Van Zeek's family. But tragically, a vicious killer took him from us. The professor, you mean. <laughs> Is something funny? That's the extent of what you've discovered, is it? I shouldn't be surprised. Sorry, there's more to it then. Lackluster work is very much your trademark, isn't it? Ugh, you're too kind. Are you going to tar all Nipponese with the same brush next? So, tell me, what's your interest in that historic incident? As it happens, Lord Van Zeeks, there's a rather curious case that's come to our attention. Are you aware of the Madame Tuspel's Museum of Waxwork by any chance? I am, naturally. I believe that since last month I feature in one of the displays there, for public school. Of course, the infamous Reaper of the Bailey would have to be exhibited, I, wouldn't he? Sorry, what's our court score? True. He's never won a case against us, so, you know. Well, the particular waxwork has been stolen from the place and held for ransom. A particular waxwork, which... Wait, you mean... Yes, it's the professor. Mr. Sholmes is investigating the case as we speak. I was unaware of that. He's turned as white as a sheet. Oh. Hello there. Ah, the file I requested for the trial tomorrow. Thank you. Oh, Susato hasn't seen him, right? Okay, yeah. <laughs> Are you alright? Who is this man, Mr. Norohodo? Lord Van Zeke's apprentice, apparently. But I'm not the only one. Cesado-san can see it too. Um, Lord Van Zeeks, may we speak with your apprentice for a moment? With him? Why? Oh. Kazuma-sama. Well, got his attention at least, but that might just be because we're screaming. But that mm, doesn't explain much, if it is. Because, no. I don't believe it. Your, your posture, your presence can only be... It's you, isn't it, Kazuma-sama? I felt something strange the very first time I encountered this cloaked, fi cloaked figure, as if I knew him somehow. Can it... can it really be you, Kazuma? But if that's the case, then what the heck happened? I mean, we know his body vanished, but... How the hell is he then... An apprentice over here? And why is he not talking to us at all? Has he got memory loss? Is he... What's going on? Oh, indeed. Yeah, it's probably gonna be explained much later, but... Or at least... Maybe not much later, but... It will definitely be explained, at least somewhat. Wait, wait. Too late. What's going on here? What is your interest in my apprentice exactly? You act as if you know the man or something. Well, um... Since when has he been in your care? 
I don't recall you having an apprentice before I left Britain six months ago. Lord Strongheart introduced him to me about three months ago now. His instructions to mentor him as a prosecutor. But he didn't tell you why, did he? The man appears to be suffering from amnesia. Yeah, okay. So kind of what I thought. Because he seemed to recognize the name, but then he doesn't do anything else. So, like, if he recognized us, he would have acted very differently. Mm. He's forgotten every de last detail about himself. He has amnesia. Tomorrow, he will appear in court at my side. What? He used to serve as my judicial assistant on Lord Strongheart's orders. You'll be in court with us. Now then, unless I'm much mistaken, I believe this conversation has run its course. Oh, uh, yes. Um, thank you. I definitely saw a reaction there. When Cesado san called out like that, it really seemed to hit a nerve. When she called out Kazuma-sama. Well, I mean, there's not much we can do about that now. Let's actually examine things. He's about to cry again. I mean, we don't want to give her hope, you know, that he's alive. But at the same time, like, what if it is him? Then, then how? What? What does that mean? Like, why would? Because the what's it called? The God, I've forgotten his name already. Um, Strongheart. Lord Strongheart would know him, right? So why would he assign him as a prosecutor? Um, like maybe to help him recover his memory? I don't, I don't know. It's, it's weird. This wasn't here yesterday. Really? But if I'm not mistaken, it's the cage in which the victim was standing before he was apparently beamed through the air. That's right. A birdcage. According to what Professor Airbrain said in court, it's made of wood. Or more precisely, Japanese cypress, I think. And despite having been in an explosion and then falling from a great height, it's relatively unharmed. What wonderfully durable construction, wouldn't you, you, wouldn't you say, Mr. Narahodo? I'd understood that the forensic investigation team had taken it away yesterday to examine it. I suppose they must have brought it back here when they finished their work. But sadly, not with the body inside it. No, that's right. I know we were given strict instructions not to touch anything, but still. This is too important a piece of evidence to overlook. We might need it for the trial. So we just put it in our pockets. Is that right? How does that even work? Hmm. But all the damage is here. Interestingly enough. Look here, Mr. Sato. Ah yes, the wood's cracked and broken a little. I suppose because it fell from such a height. Yes, from the height at which the balloon was flying down into the crystal tower below. A fall of about 30 feet or 9 meters. Leaving the man inside tragically dead. Okay. Anything else? Not really. Okay. Ace Attorney investigation section. Steal from the crime scene. Steal from the crime scene. Steal from the crime scene. Yeah, exactly. terrible explosion it must have been. Even the steel girders have buckled and twisted in the blast. What they call the birdcage was right in the middle of it all, just here. But look, Mr. Narahodo, that metal grill on the floor. 
looks as though it's designed to open. It does, doesn't it? If the floor had opened at the precise moment the explosion occurred, the birdcage could have dropped through and disappeared from sight. I don't think there's any doubt that this was a very elaborate hoax, is there? You'd already met that masked man, hadn't you, Mr. Narhoto? Yes, yesterday, in fact, at Lord Van Zeeks's office. I see. And if, if Kazuma-sama really is still alive, it means that Mr. Sholmes lied to us. I know. I'm going to need to speak to him about that. You're going to have to leave now. The forensic investigation team are due to arrive shortly. If they find you here, it will cause problems. What sort of problems? Foreign affairs problems. Well, we could do without that. Alright, we'll be on our way. Let's go, Mrs. Adam. Of course. Okay. Okay, so do we... I guess we go to Madame to Spells and talk to the detective. Uh, I should get food soon. Is the detective here, actually? I guess not. Okay. Where is he? We could go to Shams' suite, but what if we go to prison first? Talk to Hairbrain? Oh, wow. Okay. He's been hard at work, it seems. What's he doing? He's... Oh my, the whole wall of the cell is covered in mathematical equations. And he's still writing more now. Um, Professor, sorry to interrupt. Ah, oh, Mr. Narihodo. And who is this young lady? My name is Cesado Mikotoba. I'm Mr. Narihodo's judicial assistant. It's a pleasure to meet you, Professor. Oh, if only, if only I'd met a refined young woman like you sooner. None of this would have happened. What, what do you mean? No, that's not logical. That makes no sense at all. Oh dear, I'm sorry if my presence here upsets you. I owe you an apology too, Professor. I didn't manage to deliver what I promised you I would in court this morning. Oh, no, 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 no. The whole thing, this whole miserable affair, it all happened because I've been such a complete and utter clot. Um, Professor Hairbrain? What have you been working on in your cell? Oh, <laughs> you, um, uh, you mean that? Oh dear, how embarrassing. I was suddenly struck by an idea, you see, and I simply had to write it down. The wall was all I had to hand. Oh, is it some new hypothesis? Something to surpass super high voltage instantaneous kinesis, maybe? Uh, no, actually, it is. This is my autobiography. Your autobiography? How I was diddled and fiddled by Albert Hairbrain. I found I can represent my odd fortunes with only odd numbers in an ambitious set of simultaneous equations. Me? Really? I'm going to have to pay back all the loans I took for the kinesis machine, you see. So it's going to be a new serial publication from next month. Part 1, An Odd Birth and Odd Upbringing. Crying for what now? Yeah, don't worry about it. He doesn't make a lot of sense. He can't beat the band's optimism, that's for sure. I see. Well, for now, would you mind if we talked a little more about the case? Oh, yes, of, of course. I've been working through the numbers. I was diddled. I was fiddled by the pair of them. <laughs> Can you not say diddled and fiddled all the time? By Asman, by that aloof engineer Dra Draver. We're not going to have to sit through an explanation of all these equations, are we? I hope not.
everything I believed in has been turned on its head. My research, Mr. Asman, the kinesis machine, my hypothesis is even. I'm sorry to come to this. There was really no other way. No, it's not your fault. I wanted to protect my work, but in the end there was nothing worth protecting. It was never my intention to deceive anyone. I didn't want to trick the public. No, of course you didn't. But in court this morning I realized something. Oh? If you've done something wrong without knowing it, you've still done something wrong. Logically, it makes no difference if you were aware of it or not. Ignorance is a poor excuse. The blame still lies with me. Well, at least he's... That, that's actually a very good reasoning. Like, yeah. Even if you're not aware of it, you still did something wrong. It might lessen your sentence, but... You know. Still something bad happened. Oh, Professor. He believed in me this morning, you know. Barok did. He believed in my hypothesis. Well, I think that was just a necessary factor in the prosecution establishing its case. No, no. Barok wouldn't do something like that. I'm sure he genuinely believed it. Did he? I think I understand now. Maybe don't say that one in court, yeah. Why it was that he decided to take on the prosecution in my trial, I mean. Okay. After the terrible accident happened, nobody would believe in my hypothesis anymore. Not the police, not the prosecution service, not any lawyers even. I feel like I dealt some kind of finishing blow there. So if any other prosecutor had taken the case, if it was anyone other than Barak. I'm sure the prosecution would have declared my hypothesis a complete and utter nonsense. And in that case, you would have been declared a fraud yourself, Professor. Exactly. Which would have been a fate worse than death for me. But Barak insisted that I was a proper man of science from start to finish. You think that's why he... I know him very well indeed. He is an extremely kind-hearted soul. But that extremely kind-hearted soul spent all morning trying to paint you as a murderer, didn't he? Well, admittedly, that part of the analysis appears to have some flaws in it. And what about the whole Reaper side of things? How does that fit in with the kind-hearted soul idea? But that's not him, though, you know. But do you think he set out to trick me from the very start? I'm sorry to say that does seem likely, yes. When I first met him, he introduced himself as a wealthy financier. He looked over the paper I'd written and said my work would benefit all humanity and must be pursued. He was so enthused. He was so empathetic, emphatic. But in reality, he was the mastermind of some vast criminal network, it seems. I still can't believe it. As the machine was essentially a decoration, a set decoration for some state ma stage magic. Words. It probably didn't require a large amount of investment, actually. But the scale of it, it wasn't just some small trick. It was a very elaborate feat of deception. All young scientists are full of hope about their burgeoning ideas, full of zeal, but none of us have any money. We want to do research, but we can't afford it. Many of us take on barely legal part-time work to try to earn just a few measly pennies to carry on. To go through all that, only to be taken for a complete fool, it's too rotten to believe. Van Steek's taking Albert's case and dying on the hill that he achieved teleportation because it makes an easier case for the defense is simultaneously really funny and really sweet. Oh god, yeah. It, it is interesting that he does that. Or did that, rather. Like, I like Van Zeeks a lot. As a prosecutor. It is, I agree. And that's why we have to find those responsible and bring them to justice. 
Mr. Asman is no more, of course, which leaves only the engineer. Mr. Enoch Drabber. Is he an engineer or a magician or a swindler? It, it was about a year ago when Mr. Asmund first brought Dabber to me, meet me at my laboratory. A man is willing to make an absolute fool of himself to give his friend the best shot at clearing his good name. Yeah, exactly. Well, although he did try to keep the making a fool of himself to a minimum, at least. Since then, I've met him many times to discuss details about the Kinesis machine. There's no point that you have any inkling that it was just an illusionist. Oh, uh, he definitely wasn't just an illusionist. What do you mean? He was a wealth of deep scientific knowledge. There's no question that the man's a genuine scientist. It's instantly apparent in conversation. I see. The wretched man deceived you, Professor. It's unforgivable. We must do everything we can to find him and bring him to justice. Are there any more are there no more clues you can give us to his whereabouts? I'm sorry. We only ever discussed the Canisius machine, nothing else. Hmm. Although, just once. I did visit his workshop. What workshop? Drabber's enormous fabrication laboratory, where he constructed my great machine. Well, why don't we go there to see if we can find him? <laughs> like, what the heck? Have you told this to anyone, mate? We probably should tell people. He's not going to be a bigger fool than he has to be, has a reputation, exactly. Uh, it makes sense. Why didn't you mention this before? I know Drabber's workshop? There's every chance we might find a man there. I feel like this guy just wants to be found guilty or something, because every step of the way he's said stupid things, he's done like, he's forgotten to say other things that would make him, make it easier to acquit him. You know, he's making it very hard to defend him. <laughs> He may be a scientist, but head, head is empty, uh... You've been to Drabber's place of work, then? Yes, just once, you understand. It, it was an enormous place. Plenty of room to construct the Canisius machine, you see. Where can we find it? We have to go there at once. There's a good chance we'll find Drabber there. Well, yes, definitely, I'm sure. As in, I'm sure you're not going to want to hear this. That I have absolutely no idea where the workshop is at all. I'm so sorry. I was more than half expecting that. You see, I was blindfolded in the carriage the entire way there. You blindfolded you? You wasn't taking any chances then. The place was incredible. The pinnacle of modern engineering. Even the oil he used was the very best. A special French machine oil that's impossible to obtain in Britain. Ah, the indescribable scent of that imported oil. Perfumers across the world should forget their scent formula and use that instead. What do you think, Mrs. Otto? Oil a machine for your next birthday? I've never used any kind of perfume, Mr. Narhoto, and I'm not sure I'd like to start with that. I don't suppose you know even part of the workshop's address, Professor. You don't have a business card from Mr. Drabber, for example. The man was clearly, ver clearly very cautious, Mrs. Otto. Aha! Yes, I do. He gave me his business card once. It's right here, look. Oh, let me see that. Throw etiquette to the wind, why don't you? God. Uh, every time... Like, ah, oh, I went to his workshop once. Oh, if only we could know where, his, uh, he, where he was and if you have a business card or anything. Oh, I have a business card too. Dude, just be upfront with information for once. You would love gas stations? Oh, definitely. 
Enoch Drabber, engineer. I'm afraid that's all it says. There's no address. Well, okay. Hmm. Oh well, I can't say I'm surprised. Still, this could be useful. Okay. Hmm. This dark smudge here. I think perhaps it's machine oil. Possibly. Professor Herbert mentioned something about the oil Mr. Driver uses to me. He said it was specially imported, very high quality oil that's impossible to obtain in, Brit obtain in Britain. That's right, but more importantly, that it's more fragrant than the finest perfume. So excuse me for a moment. Oh, it doesn't appear to have any scent at all. Don't worry, I expect that's just because there's such a tiny amount on here. Machine oil on there, but that's it. Hmm. Okay, well, let's go to Sholmes' suite, see if we can find him there. he's not here. Right. Just a second. Just a spam call, I think. Oh. At least I have my phone here now, so I can just turn it off if it goes on. <laughs> I left it on the table. Um. present stuff but I don't know yeah, we can't go up the stairs now Oh, oops, press it again. What am I missing here? I need to check. Do I need to just look at things? I don't know. I guess I might as well finish off what I started. What a horrifying scene. A murderer caught in the grisly acts. I know, and in case you were wondering, it's the one with the big knife that's supposed to be the killer. I don't think anybody would be in any doubt about that, surely. And did you know that according to the description, the bathtub at the back has no particular significance? What? Really? I would have thought it was meant to show that the killer also worked in a bathhouse peddling criminal wares. Aha, we have a new theory. Okay. Nope, okay. Investigating did nothing. Because that's literally the only thing we hadn't actually investigated here yet. Okay. 
Forensic Laboratory. G's here. What are you doing at the moment, Doctor? Keeping a close eye on things so no impertinent Easterners think they can look around in my office. Are there such impertinent Easterners around? How terrible. Yes, you. Doesn't mince your words, Mrs. Zotto. I think perhaps it's time we left. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Mm. Sure, we'll go over here again. Nope, nothing here. Okay, then definitely something I need to do here. Maybe. I don't know. Anything else to converse about? No. Maybe I can present him this cage. Oh, no. Okay. What about this? A picture? No. Business card. I don't know. Is there? Anything that he wants to see, <laughs> that he, that I would think he can. Oh, here, maybe the screwdriver. Professor, do you recognize this? Oh, it's Andrew, my faithful friend. How have you been? Are you all right? Nobody's mistreated you, have they? Don't worry, he's being very well looked after. I always rub him with machine oil until he's gleaming. Right. And then when I come to tighten a screw with him, he slips in my hand and I can't do it. <laughs> it's that age-old problem faced by driver files the world over, isn't it? Don't call yourself a driver file. That's... No. <laughs> don't. don't. You don't do that. <laughs> That's... Makes it sound so bad. I really wouldn't know, I'm afraid. Do not, do not let this man write a book, yeah. Oh my god. Um, yeah, I don't think there's anything else. What, what do I do? Did I miss something? I don't know. I guess we'll just examine everything. Or maybe I can present things to Gina. Maybe I do present things to Gina. I can't believe I'm seeing it at such close proximity with my eyes. You've really been looking forward to the great exhibition, haven't you, Mrs. Addo? Oh yes, when I found out that I had to return to Japan, I'm afraid I cursed my luck. But here you are, back in London, gazing up at the magnificent tower. I know. Perhaps I was wrong to curse my luck so harshly. Oh, that we already investigated. Okay, yeah. So... Okay, fine. Presents... This... This print. She keeps stealing stuff from me, of course. Oh, wait. Okay, never mind. Why is this thing again? Why is this. Wait, is this the same dialogue again? What? Game, please. Why does it. Okay. Whatever. Um, this is not good. Oh wait, oh it does. Okay, about this, Gina. 
Yeah, I'm still learning my ladders at the moment. I only know A to E. But if it ain't too much bleeding trouble. Uh, actually, Gina, it's the back of the card that's important. Huh? How come? There's just a dirty old smudge on the back, that's all. Turns out that this is a very high quality French machine oil. It has a very particular scent, apparently. You don't say. Let's have a whip then. You sure? I don't smell nothing. No, no, we didn't mean that you should smell it. The dog. The dog smells it. Oh, right. You mean Toby? Go, go. His sense of smell is so good he can track people over the oceans, can't he? Professor Hairbrain informs us that this oil is unique to Mr. Drabber's workshop. Sniff, sniff. Sniff, sniff, sniff. Bark. I think he's picked up a scent. I mean, if he follows the, uh, the scent of this oil... Toby could lead us to that dodgy coast workshop? That's right. That's exactly what we were hoping. You're still going? Yeah, I was planning to go soon, but... Doggo. So... You know. Alright then, we'll give it a go. I'll just borrow that. What? Wait, when did you... Wants a big pocket. If I can lead everyone to that drapper's workshop... I'll be the boss... Boss's boss... Boss... <laughs> I can't talk. I'll be the boss's boss before the next week. Oh yes, Gina. I'm sure you'll be promoted. But I'll, I'll definitely get food soon, Lumen. Poor Gregson. Right then, Otto. Leave it to me. Sorry? I'm gonna go get going after that dodgy engineer cove right this minute. Oh, but hang on. Someone's supposed to be in guard duty here all the time. I'm afraid we can't help. We need to get on with our investigation as well, Gina. Oh, right. Oh well, never mind. It ain't gotta be me what gets it in the neck. It'll be the boss. Poor Gregson. <laughs> Again. Ready, Toby? Get that oil sent. Got that oil sent, have ya? Come on then, boy. See you later. I do hope the scent of that oil leads them to the swindler's workshop. I hope so too. Ideally before the dog swims across the channel to France. Well, I think we're, we've done all the investigating we can here for now. If we could just determine the whereabouts of Mr. Trevor. I'm sure Gina and little Toby won't let us down. Now then, do you think we ought to try to speak with Mr. Sholmes at this point? We have things to discuss, and I'm dying to meet him again after all these months. Yes, it's quite possible we might know not something useful. That, that's right. We ought to find him at Madame de Spells. He's supposed to be working there as a temporary waxwork exhibit. He hasn't been, though. We've been there like three times. Yes, Iris told me all about his latest unusual venture. Um, but yeah, I'll leave that for another time, um, because I need to get food. It's getting crazy though, this game. It was already pretty insane, but... Uh, it feels like it's getting crazier by the minute, basically. Um... Thank you for the follow, Gossamer Green. Thank you so much. Let me see who is live currently. Next time we meet one of the best witnesses in the game. Ooh, looking forward to it. Uh, I think I'll send you over to Combat, who is playing some Lies of P. That dude. There we go. Yes. 
thank you all for watching as always i hope you had a wonderful time um it's a long one <laughs> lots of talking my uh, my voice always gets shot a little bit at the end um but it's been really good we made a bunch of progress not as much as i would have liked because the cases are getting really long um i keep expecting it to be like oh i'm nearly at the end when i'm at the end of the stream but no no not anywhere near it's not not ca one case per stream anymore because that was this at the start of it that was kind of how it was but uh not anymore i will be back tomorrow with uh we wednesday could be all kinds of stuff who knows could be more of this we'll see uh but thursday definitely more of this and um yeah and then saturday uh, more horizon zero dawn so if any of those then uh, if you want to show up of course I'd, lo I'd love to have you uh someone once described this case having final case energy makes sense yeah i thought the previous one was quite long as well um with all the extra information and stuff you get um but yeah we'll we'll see how it goes until next time have a good one Bye-bye. Bye-bye.